When did you first fall in love with the stars? I think I've always loved the stars. One of my first memory is of the moon. I remember watching the moon and I was in the car with my dad who my parents were divorced and he was driving me and my siblings to his house for the weekend. And the moon was just following me. Just had no idea why that was. Yeah. So like lo looking up at the sky and there's this glowing thing. How do you make sense of the moon that, at, at that age? At that like, age, at like age five, there's just no way you can. I think it's one of the great things about being a kid. It's just that curiosity that, that all kids have. You know, I was thinking, because there's these uh, uh, almost uh, out there ideas of, of, of that our Earth is flat, uh, floating about on the internet. And it made me think, you know, when did I first realize that the Earth is um, like this ball that's uh, flying through empty space? I mean, it's terrifying. It's uh, awe-inspiring. I don't know how to make sense of it. It's, uh, it's hard, because we live in our frame of reference here on this planet. Yeah. It's nearly impossible. None of us are lucky to go to see the curvature of Earth. I mean, do you remember when you realized, understood like the physics, like the layout of the solar system? Is, is it, was it like, did you first have to take physics to really, uh, uh, like high school physics to really take that in? I think it's hard to say. I had this book when I was a child. It was in French. I grew up in Canada where French is supposedly taught to all of us English-speaking Canadians. And it was this French book in French, but it was about the solar system. And I just love flipping through it. Yeah. It's hard to say how much, you know, you or I understand when we're kids, but it was really a great book. What about the stars? When did you first learn about the stars? I have a, like, I do have this very incredible distinctive memory. And again, it had to do with my dad. He took us camping. Now, my dad was from the UK and he was the type who you'd find wearing a tie on weekends. So camping was not in his fear, his comfort zone. <laughs> yeah. But we had a babysitter. Every summer we got a baby, we, every summer we had a babysitter. And one summer we had Tom. He was barely older than, than we were. He was 14, my brother was 12. I would have been 11 or 10 maybe. And we went camping because Tom said, camping's the thing, we should, we should try it. And I just remember, I didn't aim to see the stars, but I walked out of my tent in the middle of the night and I looked up and wow, so many stars the dark night sky and all those stars just like screaming at me. And I just couldn't believe that. Honestly, like my first thought was, this is so incredible, mind blowing. Like, why wouldn't anyone have told me this existed? <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone else see this? <laughs> have you, have you had an, ex have you had an experience like that with anything? You like, know, Yeah, I've had that. I mean, I don't know if maybe you can tell me if it's the same. Uh, I've had that with robots. Uh, there's a few robots I've met where I just fell in love with this. Like, is anyone else seeing this? Is, is anyone else seeing that here in a, in a robot is our ability to engineer some intelligent beings, intelligent beings that we could love, that could love us, that we can interact with in some rich ways that we haven't yet discovered? Like uh, almost like when you get a puppy, hey, you used to have a dog and there's this uh, immediate bond and love. Um, and on top of that ability to engineer it, it was, you know, I had to just pause and, and, and hold myself. I imagine, I don't have kids, I imagine there's a magic to that as well, where it's a co totally new experience. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the stars though, unlike kids or the puppy, it's only a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, so you felt, you weren't terrified? Like, it's just, to me, when I look at the stars, it's almost paralyzingly scary how little we know about the universe, how alone we are. I mean, somehow it feels alone. I'm not sure if it's a, it's just a matter of perspective, but it feels like, wow, there's billions of them out there and we know nothing about them. And then also immediately to me, somehow mortality comes into it. I mean, how, how did that make you feel at that time? I think as a child without articulating it, I felt that same that way. Feeling. Just like, wow, this is terrifying. What's out there? Like, what is this? What does it mean about us here? Do you think we will one day build an AI system that a human being can love and that loves that human back? Like in the movie, Her. Look, I'm, I'm a, a pragmatist. For me, AI is a, is a tool. It's like a shovel. Hmm. And the ethics of using the shovel are always um, with us, the people. And, and it has to be this way. Uh, in terms of, of, of emotions, I would hate to come into my kitchen and see that my refrigerator spoiled all my food, then have it explained to me that it fell in love with the dishwasher 
and I wasn't as nice as the dishwasher. So as a result, it neglected me. That would just be a bad experience and it would be a bad product. I would probably not recommend this refrigerator to my friends. Yeah. Um, and that's where I draw the line. I think to me, technology has to be reliable and has to be predictable. I want my car to work. I don't want to fall in love with my car. I, I, I just want it to work. Mm. I want it to complement me, not to replace me. I have very unique human properties and I want the machines to make me, turn me into a superhuman. Like I'm already a superhuman today thanks to the machines that surround me. And I'll give you examples. I can run across the Atlantic at near the speed of sound at 36,000 feet today. That's kind of amazing. I can, uh, my voice now carries me all the way to Australia um, using a smartphone uh, today. And it's not, not the speed of sound, which would take hours. It's the speed of light. My voice travels at the speed of light. <laughs> How cool is that? That makes me superhuman. Yes. I would even argue my, my flushing toilet makes me superhuman. Mm -hmm. Just think of the time before flushing toilets. And, and maybe you have a very old person in your family that you can ask about this or, or take a trip to rural India mm -hmm. to experience it. Um, it's, it's, it makes me superhuman. So to me, what technology does, it complements me. It, it, it makes me stronger. Therefore, words like love and compassion have very little, I have very little interest in this for machines. I have interest in people. You don't think, uh, first of all, beautifully put, beautifully argued, but do you think love has use in our tools, compassion? I think love is a, a beautiful human concept. And if you think of what love really is, love is a means to convey safety, to convey trust. Uh, I think trust has a, a huge need in technology as well, not just people. We want to trust our technology the same way we, tr or in a similar way we trust people. Um, in, in human interaction, standards have emerged and, and feelings, emotions have emerged, maybe genetically, maybe biologically, that are able to convey sense of trust, sense of safety, sense of passion, of love, of dedication, that, that makes the human fabric. And I'm a big slacker for love. I want to be loved, I want to be trusted, I want to be admired, all these wonderful things. And because all of us, will, we have this beautiful system, I wouldn't just blindly copy this to the machines. Here's why. When you look at, uh, say, transportation, um, you could have observed that uh, up to the end of the 19th century, almost all transportation used any number of legs, from one leg to two legs to a thousand legs. And you could have concluded that is the right way to move about the environment. Um, we made the exception of birds who use flapping wings. In fact, there are many people in aviation that flapped wings to their arms and jumped from cliffs. Most of them didn't survive. Um, then, then the interesting thing is that the technology solutions are very different. Uh, like in technology, it's really easy to build a wheel. In biology, it's super hard to build a wheel. There's very few perpetually rotating things in, in, in biology and they usually run cells, uh, 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 things. In, in, Engineering, we can build wheels. And those wheels gave rise to cars. Um, similar wheels gave rise to, to aviation. Like there's no thing that flies that wouldn't have something that rotates, uh, like a jet engine or, or helicopter blades. So the, the solutions have used very different physical laws than nature. And that's great. So for me to be too much focused on, oh, this is how nature does it, let's just replicate it. If we really believed that the solution to the agriculture revolution was a humanoid robot, we would still be waiting today. Again, beautifully. I think the idea I would have is uh, to be a bit more rigorous in uh, trying to measure the amount of love you add or subtract from the world in the second, third, fourth, fifth order effects. It's actually, I think, especially in the world of tech, quite doable. You know, you just might not like, you know, the, the shareholders may not like that kind of metric, but it's pretty easy to measure. Like, it, that's not even, uh, I'm perhaps half joking about love, uh, but we could talk about just happiness and well being, long term well being. It's pretty easy for Facebook, for YouTube, for all these companies to measure that. 
they do a lot of kinds of surveys they could do. I mean, there's very simple solutions here that you could just survey how, I mean, surveys are in some sense use, useless because they're um, a, a subset of the population. You're just trying to get a sense. It's very loose kind of understanding, but integrated deeply as part of the technology. Most of our tech is recommender systems. Most of the, sorry, not tech, uh, online interaction is driven by recommender systems that learn very little data about you and use that data based on mostly based on traces of your previous behavior to suggest future things. This is how Twitter, this is how Facebook works, this is how uh, AdSense or Google AdSense works, this is how Netflix, YouTube work and so on. And and for them to just track as opposed to engagement, how much you spend in a particular video, a particular site, is also track give you the technology to do self-report of what makes you feel good, of what makes you grow as a person, of what makes you, uh, you know, the best version of yourself. The 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 Rogan uh, idea of the hero of your own movie, and just add that little bit of information. If you you have people, you have this like happiness surveys of how you feel about the last five days. How would you report your experience? You can lay out the set of videos. This is kind of fascinating to watch. I don't know if you ever look at YouTube, the history of videos you've looked at. It's fascinating. It's very embarrassing for me. Like, it'll be like a lecture and then like a set of videos that I don't want anyone to know about, which is, which is, which will be like, uh, I don't know, maybe like five videos in a row where it looks like I watched the whole thing, which I probably did about like how to cook a steak, even though, or, or just like with the best chefs in the world cooking steaks. And I'm just like, sitting there watching it for no purpose whatsoever, wasting away my life or like funny cat videos or like legit. That, that's, that's, an, that's always a good one. And I could look back and rate which videos made me a better person and not. And I mean, on a more serious note, there's a bunch of conversations, podcasts or lectures I've watched, which made me a better person. And some of them made me a worse person. Uh, quite honestly, not for stupid reasons, like I feel dumber, but because I do have a sense that that started me on a path of um, of not being kind to other people. For example, I'll give you uh, for my own, and I'm sorry for ranting, but maybe there's some usefulness to this kind of exploration of self. When I focus on creating, on programming, on science, I become a much deeper thinker and a kinder person to others. When I listen to too many, a little bit is good, but too many podcasts or videos about how how our world is melting down or criticizing ridiculous people, the worst of the quote unquote woke, for example, all there's all these groups that are misbehaving in fascinating ways because they've been corrupted by power. The more I want, the more I watch criticism of them, the worse I become. And I'm aware of this, but I'm also aware that it, for some reason it's pleasant to watch those sometimes. And so for, for me to be able to self-report that to the YouTube algorithm, to the systems around me, and they ultimately try to optimize to make me the best person of my, uh, the best version of myself, which I personally believe would make YouTube a lot more money because I'd be much more willing to spend time on YouTube and give YouTube a lot more, um, a lot more of my money. That's a that's great for business and great for humanity because it'll make me a kinder person. It'll increase the the love quotient, the love metric, and uh, it'll make them a lot of money. I feel like everything is aligned. And so you, you should do that, not just for YouTube algorithm, but also for military strategy and for them to go to war or not. Because one externality you can think of about going to war, which I think we talked about offline, is we often go to war with kind of governments, with a, uh, with a not with the people. You have to think about the kids of countries that see a soldier and because of what they experience, their interaction with the soldier, hate is born. When you're like eight years old, six years old, you lose your dad, you lose your mom, you lose a friend, somebody close to you, that one a really powerful externality that could be reduced to love, positive and negative, is uh, 
the hate that's born when you make decisions. And that's going to take fruition. If that that little seed is going to become a tree that then leads to the kind of destruction that, that we talk about. <laughs> Uh, so, but my, in my sense, it's possible to reduce everything to a measure of how much love does this add to the world. All that to say, uh, do you have ideas of how we practically uh, build systems that 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 create a resilient society? There are a lot of good things that you shared. Where there's like fifteen different ways that we could enter this that are all interesting. So I'm trying to see which one will probably be most useful. Pick the uh the one or two things that are least ridiculous. When you were mentioning if we could see some of the second order effects or externalities that we aren't used to seeing, specifically the one of a kid being radicalized somewhere else, which engenders enmity in them towards us, which decreases our own future security. Yeah. Even if you don't care about the kid. If you care about the kid, it's a whole other thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we saw this, when Jane Fonda and others went to Vietnam and took photos and videos of what was happening, and you got to see the pictures of the kids with napalm on them, uh, that, like, the anti-war effort was bolstered by that in a way it couldn't have been without that. There's, there's a, until we can see the images, you can't have a mere neuron eff effect in the same way. And when you can, that starts to ha have a... A powerful effect. I think there's a deep principle that you're sharing there, which is that if we we can have a rivalrous intent where our in-group, whatever it is, maybe it's our political party wanting to win within the US, maybe it's our nation state wanting to win in a, a war or an economic war over resource or whatever it is, that if we don't obliterate the other people completely, they don't go away they're they're not engendered to like us more. They they didn't become less smart, so they have more enmity towards us. And whatever technologies we employed to be successful, they will now reverse engineer, make iterations on, and come back. And so you you drive an arms race, which is why you can see that the wars were over history employing more lethal weaponry, and not just the kinetic war. Um the information war and the narrative war and the economic war, right? Like it just increased capacity in all of those fronts. Um, and so what seems like a win to us on the short term might actually really produce losses in the long term. And what's even in our own best interest in the long term is probably more aligned with everyone else because we interaffect each other. And I think the thing about globalism, globalization and exponential tech and the rate at which we affect each other and the rate at which we affect the biosphere that we're all affected by is that this, this kind of proverbial spiritual idea that we're all interconnected and need to think about that in some way, that was easy for tribes to get because everyone in the tribe so clearly saw their interconnection and dependence on each other. But in terms of a global level, the the speed at which we are actually interconnected, the speed at which the harm happening to something in Wuhan affects the rest of the world or uh, a new technology developed somewhere affects the entire world or an environmental issue or a whatever, is making it to where we either actually all get, not as a spiritual idea, just even as physics, right? We all get the interconnectedness of everything and that we either all consider that and see how to make it through more effectively together or failures anywhere end up becoming decreased quality of life and failures and increased risk everywhere. Don't you think people are beginning to experience that at the individual level? So governments are resisting it. They're, they're trying to make us not empathize with each other, feel connected, but don't you think people are beginning to feel more and more connected? Like, isn't that exactly what the technology is enabling? Like social networks, we tend to criticize them, but isn't there a sense which we're experiencing, you know? When you watch those videos that are criticizing, whether it's the woke Antifa side or the QAnon Trump supporter side, does it seem like they have increased empathy for people that are outside of their ideologic camp? No, not at all. So I'm, I may be... Um, I may be conflating my own experience of the world and uh, that of uh, that of the populace. I I tend to see those videos as feeding something that's a relic of the past. They figured out that drama fuels clicks, 
but whether I'm right or wrong, I don't know, but I, I tend to sense that that is not, that hunger for drama is not fundamental to human beings, that we want to actually, that we want to understand Antifa and we want to like empathize. We want to take radical ideas and be able to empathize with them and well, synthesize it all. Okay, let's look at cultural outliers in terms of violence versus compassion. We can see that a lot of cultures have relatively lower in-group violence, bigger out-group violence, and there's some variance in them and variance at different times based on the scarcity or abundance of resource and other things. But you can look at, say, Jains, whose whole religion is around nonviolent so much so that they don't even hurt plants. They only take fruits that fall off them and stuff. Or to go to a larger population, you take Buddhists, where for the most part, with a few exceptions, for the most part across three millennia and across lots of different countries and geographies and whatever, you have 10 million people plus or minus who don't hurt bugs. The whole spectrum of genetic variance that is happening within a culture of that many people um, and head traumas and whatever, and nobody hurts bugs. And then you look at a group where the kids grew up as child soldiers in Liberia or Darfur, where to make it to adulthood, pretty much everybody's killed people hand to hand and killed people who were civilian or innocent type of people. And you say, okay, so we were very neotenous. We can be conditioned by our environment and humans can be conditioned where almost all the humans show up in these two different bell curves. It doesn't mean that the Buddhists had no violence. It doesn't mean that these people had no compassion, but the, they're very different Gaussian distributions. And so I think one of the important things that I like to do is look at the examples of the populations, what Buddhism shows regarding compassion or what Judaism shows around education, the average level of education that everybody gets because of a culture that is really working on conditioning it or, or various cultures. What are the positive deviants outside of the st statistical deviants to see what is actually possible? And then say, what are the conditioning factors? And can we condition those across a few of them simultaneously? And could we build a civilization like that? Becomes a very interesting question. So there's this kind of real politic idea that humans are violent, large groups of humans become violent, they become irrational, specifically those two things, rivalrous and violent and irrational. And so in order to minimize the total amount of violence and have some good decisions, they need ruled somehow. And that not getting that is some kind of naive utopianism that doesn't understand human nature yet. This gets back to like mimesis of desire as an inexorable thing. I think the idea of the masses is actually a kind of propaganda. Um, that is useful for the classes that control um, to popularize the idea that most people are too violent, lazy, um, undisciplined, and irrational to make good choices, and therefore their choices should be sublimated in some kind of way. I think that if we look back at these conditioning environments, we can say, okay, so the kids that go to a really fancy school and have a good developmental environment like Exeter Academy. There's still a Gaussian distribution of how well they do on any particular metric, but on average, they become senators. And the worst ones become high-end lawyers or whatever. And then I look at an inner city school with a totally different set of things, and I see a very, very differently displaced Gaussian distribution, but a very different set of conditioning factors. So then I say the masses. Well, if all those kids who were one of the parts of the masses got to go to Exeter and have that family and whatever, would they still be the masses? Um, could we actually condition more social virtue, more civic virtue, more orientation towards dialectical synthesis, more empathy, more rationality widely? Yes. Would that lead to better capacity for something like participatory governance, democracy or republic or some kind of participatory governance? Yes. Is, yes. Is it necessary for it actually? Yes. And is it good for class interests? No, not really. Uh, by the way, when you say class interests, this is the powerful leading over the, the less mm -hmm. powerful, that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Anyone that benefits from asymmetries of power doesn't necessarily benefit from decreasing those asymmetries of power and kind of increasing 
the capacity of people more widely. And um, so when we talk about power, we're talking about asymmetries in agency, influence, and control. You think that hunger for power is fundamental to human nature? I, th I think we should I th get that straight before we talk about other stuff. So like uh, this, uh, this, this pickup line that I use at a bar off, which is uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Is that true or is that just a fancy thing to say? In modern society, there's something to be said, have we changed as societies over time in terms of how much we crave power? That there is an impulse towards power that is innate in people and can be conditioned one way or the other, yes. But you can see that Buddhist society does a very different thing with it at scale. That you don't end up seeing the emergence of the same types of sociopathic behavior and particularly then creating sociopathic institutions. Um, and so it's like, is eating the foods that were rare in our evolutionary environment that give us more dopamine hit because they were rare and they're not anymore, salt, fat, sugar. Um, is there something pleasurable about, about those where humans have an orientation to overeat if they can? Well, the fact that there is that possibility doesn't mean everyone will obligately be obese and die of obesity, right? Like it's possible to have a, uh, a particular impulse and to be able to understand it, have other ones and be able to balance them. And so to say that um, power dynamics are ob are obligate in humans and we can't do anything about it is very similar to me to saying like, we could, everyone is gonna be obligately obese. Yeah, so there's some degree to which those, the control of those impulses has to do with the conditioning early in life. Yes, our and ability. the culture that creates the environment to be able to do that and then the recursion on that. Okay, so what, if we were to, uh, just bear with me, just asking for a friend, if we were to kill all humans <laughs> on earth, and then start over. <laughs> Is there ideas about how to build up? Okay, we don't have to kill it. Let's leave the humans on earth, they're fine. And go to Mars and start a new society. Is there ways to construct systems of conditioning, education, of how we live with each other that would, um, that would incentivize us properly to not seek power, not, to not construct systems that are of asymmetry of power and to create systems that are resilient to all kinds of terrorist attacks, to the, all kinds of destructions. I believe so. So is there some inklings we could, of course, you probably don't have the an all the answers, but you have insights about what that looks like. I mean, yep. is it just rigorous practice of dialectic synthesis as essentially conversations? with assholes of various flavors until they're not assholes anymore because you've become a deeply empathetic with their experience? Okay, so there's a lot of things that, that we would need to construct to come back to this. Like, what is the basis of rivalry? What? How do you bind it? How does it relate to tech? If you have a culture that is doing less rivalry, does it always lose in war to those who do war better and how do you make something on the enactment of how to get there from here um great great so what's rivalry why is, is rivalry bad or good is is so uh, is another word for rivalry competition yes i think roughly yes i think bad and good are kind of s silly concepts here good for some things bad for other things for but resilience in some contexts and others even that. Um, okay. Let me give you an example that relates back to the Facebook measuring thing you were mentioning a moment ago. First, I think what you're saying is actually aligned with the right direction and what I want to get to in a moment. Um, but it's not, the, the devil is in the details here. So I, I enjoy praise. It feeds my ego. I grow stronger. So I appreciate that. I will make sure to include uh, one piece every 15 minutes as we Thank go. Thank you. Um, so, It's easier to measure, there are problems with this argument, but there's also utility to it. So let's take it for the utility it has first. It's harder to measure happiness than it is to measure comfort. Uh, we can measure 
with technology that the shocks in a car are making the car bounce less, that the bed is um, softer and, you know, material science and those types of things. And happiness is actually hard for philosophers to define because some people find that there's certain kinds of overcoming suffering that are necessary for happiness. There's happiness that feels more like contentment and happiness that feels more like passion. Is, is passion the source of all suffering or the source of all creativity? Like the, there's deep stuff and it's mostly first person, not measurable third person stuff, even if maybe it corresponds to third person stuff to some degree. But we also see examples of some of our favorite examples is people who are in the worst environments who end up finding happiness, right? Where the third person stuff looks to be less conducive and there's some you know, Victor Frankl, Nelson Mandela, whatever. Um, but it's pretty easy to measure comfort and it's pretty universal. And I think we can see that the industrial revolution started to replace happiness with comfort quite heavily as the thing it was optimizing for. And we can see that when increased comfort is given, maybe because of the evolutionary disposition that expending extra calories when for the majority of our history, we didn't have extra calories was not a safe thing to do. Who knows why? Um, when extra comfort is given, it's very easy to take that path, even if it's not the path that supports overall well-being long-term. And um, so we can see that, you know, when you, when you look at the techno-optimist idea that we have better lives than Egyptian pharaohs and kings and whatever, what they're largely looking at is how comfortable our beds are and how comfortable the transportation systems are and things like that, in which case there's massive improvement. But we also see that in some of the nations where people have access to the most comfort, suicide and mental illness are the highest. And we also see that some of the happiest cultures are actually some of the ones that are in materially lame environments. And so there's a very interesting question here. And if I understand correctly, you do cold showers. And Joe Rogan was talking about how he needs to do some fairly intensive kind of um, struggle that is a non-comfort to actually induce being better as a person, this concept of hormesis, that it's actually stressing an adaptive system that increases its adaptive capacity. And that there's something that the happiness of a system has something to do with its adaptive capacity, its overall resilience, health, well-being, which requires a decent bit of discomfort. And yet in the in the presence of the comfort solution, it's very hard to not choose it. And then as you're choosing it regularly to actually downregulate your overall adaptive capacity. And so when we start saying, can we make tech where we're measuring for the things that it produces beyond just the measure of GDP or whatever particular measures look like the revenue generation or profit generation of my business, are all the meaningful things measurable? And what are the right measures? And what are the externalities of optimizing for that measurement set? What meaningful things aren't included in that measurement set that might have their own externalities? These are some of the questions we actually have to take seriously. Yeah, and we, I think they're answerable questions, right? Progressively better, not perfect. Right, so, I, so first of all, let me throw out happiness and comfort out of the discussion. Those seem like useless. The distinction, so I, because I said they're useful, well-being is useful, but I think I, I take it back. I'm, I knew, uh, I proposed new metrics in this uh, brainstorm session, which is, uh, so one is like personal growth, which is intellectual growth. I think we're able to make that concrete for ourselves. Like you're a better person than you were a week ago or a worse person than you were a week ago. I think we can ourselves report th that and, and, and understand what that means. It's this gray area and we try to define it, but I think we humans are pretty good at that because we have a sense, an idealistic sense of the person we might be able to become. We, we all dream of becoming a certain kind of person. And I think we have a sense of getting closer and not towards that person. Maybe this is not a great metric, fine. The other one is love actually. Fuck if you're happy or not, or you're comfortable or not. How much love do you have towards your fellow human beings? I feel like if you try to optimize that and increasing that, that's going to have, that's a good metric. How many times a day, sorry, if I can make quantify, how many times a day have you thought positively of another human being? Just put that down as a number and increase that number. 
I think the process of saying, okay, so let's not take GDP or GDP per capita as the metric we want to optimize for because GDP goes up during war and it goes up with more healthcare spending from sicker people and various things that we wouldn't say correlate to quality of life. Uh, addiction drives GDP awesomely. Um, By the way, when I said growth, I wasn't referring to G G GDP. I know. Okay. I'm, give, I'm giving an example okay. now sure. of the primary metric we use and why it's not an adequate okay. metric because yes, yes, yes. we're exploring other ones. Yeah. So the idea of saying, what would the metrics for a good civilization be? If I had to pick a set of metrics, what would the best ones be if I was going to optimize for those? Yeah. And then really try to run the thought experiment more deeply and say, okay, so what happens if we optimize for that? Try to think through the first and second and third order effects of what happens that's positive, and then also say what negative things can happen from optimizing that. What actually matters that is not included in that or in that way of defining it? Because love versus number of positive thoughts per day, I could just make a long list of names and just think, say positive thing about each one. It's all very superficial. Not include animals or the rest of life, have a, have a very shallow to total amount of it, but I'm optimizing the number and if I get some credit for the number. So the, and this is when I said the model of reality isn't reality. When you make a set of metrics, say we're going to optimize for this, whatever reality is that is not included in those metrics can be the areas where harm occurs, which is why I would say that wisdom is something like the discernment that leads to right choices beyond what metrics-based optimization would offer. Yeah. Long. If we, if we go to the Six-Day War, uh, you write about, uh, in Lionsgate, you write about the Six Day War in Israel. Uh, I think of the wars you've written about as the one we're still, in many ways, in the midst of today. Yes. So, um, what is at the core of that conflict in Israel? The, the Israeli Palestinian conflict? I mean, today it's the Israeli Palestinian conflict, but it's uh, echoes of the same conflict in that part of the world with Israel. What is, uh, in your sense, uh, the nature of that conflict? What can we learn about society and human nature from that conflict? That is one of the hottest conflicts that still goes on today. Well, when I was working on the Lionsgate about the Six Day War, I wrote in the, um, in the introduction that this was not gonna be a multi-sided story. I was taking it entirely I'm a Jew, I identify with the Israeli people. I was gonna see it entirely from their side. Yes. So that's probably not what you're asking, but <laughs> to me, the Six Day War and that whole, you know, it's, it's a piece of land that's holy to at least three religions and probably more. Yeah. And from the Jewish point of view, it's where the state of Israel, it's where David founded Jerusalem, it's all where the 12 tribes were, et cetera, et cetera, where Moses came and brought the people. So to, to me, the, the, the Six Day War was about, as I said, a return from exile, from diaspora after 2,000 years. Now, obviously, from the Palestinian point of view or the Saudi Arabian point of view or whatever, it's, it's a whole other scenario. Religion is at the core of this conflict in some ways, but religious beliefs. Religion and racial slash ethnic tribal identity. I mean, again, what is a Jew? Is a Jew somebody that believes in the religion or is it somebody of a certain race that that who, that who race arose in a certain place? Right. Same thing as a Muslim. What is a Muslim? Do they believe in, you know, Muhammad or whatever? Uh, or so, did they arise in a certain place and a certain ethnicity? Because if we landed from Mars, we couldn't tell a Jew from a Palestinian, could we? You know, right. just looking at them, right. you could easily mix them and you'd never know. And the, the the specifics of the faith is not necessarily the, the thing that defines no, the person. No, I don't think so. Yeah. So you could be, like many are, secular uh, Jew living in Israel and still have a strong bond. Definitely, definitely. To, in fact, Almost all of the Jews, the fighters that I spoke to from the Sixth Day War were secular. And it really was not, uh, you know, a religious thing with them as much as it was a national thing. 
So having spent time in Israel, uh, how's the world where military conflict is directly felt as opposed to maybe if we look at the US where it's distant and far away? How is that world different? How are the people different? It's very different, as you know, yeah. yeah. I've never and, been to Israel, actually. So oh, you haven't? I haven't felt it. Ah, well, <laughs> you should definitely go. I mean, here in the United States, where when like as an incident like Charlottesville comes up, you know, where people are chanting, Jews will not replace us, blah, blah, blah. The impulse in the Jewish community is to think of, well, how can we reach out? to the other side. You know, how can how can we either show them that we are human beings like they are and show them that we care for them, et cetera, et cetera. That's the sort of distant from war. From if you're in Israel, and you know, like if you and I were were Israeli citizens right now, you would be a fighter pilot or a tank commander or whatever. Right. You know, you would not just be, you know, working at MIT or whatever. And I would be in the army too. And so from their point of view, they say, all those people who hate us, can I curse on this? Of course. On this thing? <laughs> Fuck them, we'll kill them. We'll kill them. You know, if they dare to cross the line, and that's a whole different point of view. Right. Um, to me, it's actually a healthier point of view. You think but, so? Yeah. So there's no, so let me ask the hard question is, uh, well, maybe it's an impossible question, is how do we resolve that conflict? In Israel and in Israel or anywhere, anywhere where the instinct is to reach out in U.S. and uh, to say uh, "f you" in the in the, <sighs> in the people. Yeah, here's my here's what I think that the only way that two warring sides or two sides that are opposed to one another can ever really come together is when there's mutual respect. We we'll get just more water. Uh, oh, I got it. I got this. when there's mutual respect and. And and as and they can see each other as equals, and there's and when there's mutual fear, you know, where <laughs> where one side yeah. says we don't dare cross a line with this other side, and the other side says the same thing. I think then you can kind of reach across that thing and say, okay, we'll stay here, you stay here, we'll we'll mingle in cultural ways, and we'll have interchange, you know, winter marriage, da 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 da. But as soon as one side has no power as the Jewish people have had no power throughout the diaspora forever, right? Then it's just a human nature. You can see it in Trump and what he does to any vulnerable minority, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, and he's not alone. I'm not blaming him alone. That's human nature. So I so, do think that that idea of like, fuck you, if you cross the line, we'll kill you, is really a good way, is a, is a good place to start from. Because now you can sit down on opposite sides of the table and say, you know, what do we have in common? How can we, we want to raise our children, you want to raise your children. How can we do this in a way that's, that, that we're not hurting each other? So you kind of said that you need to arrive at a balance, some kind of balance of power. Yeah. But uh, you haven't spoken to the fact that there's deeply rooted hatred of the other. So is there no way to alleviate that hatred? Or is that, uh, I mean, what what role does love and hate I think that hate hatred can go away. I really do. I mean, if you look at even, even now that uh, I haven't seen this in person, but they say that the Saudis and the Israelis are collaborating in certain things, you know, by their mutual fear of or antagonism to Iran. Um, I do think that even really long, long, long-standing hatreds and animosities, thousands of years old, can can go away under the right circumstances. In a, on what time scale? Uh, I mean, it, That's for the, instance, uh, I don't know if this- some, like, Do people have to die? Uh, do generations have to die and pass away and new generations come up with less hate or can a single individual learn to not hate? I think a single individual can learn to not hate because it certainly doesn't seem to, over thousands of years, doesn't seem to work. You know, we keep thinking that that's going to happen. But uh, I, I think it's, we're, we're in a real spiritual realm here when you're talking about that. Yeah. You're in a realm of, you know, Buddha, Jesus, whatever, something like that, that uh, where, uh, you know, uh, a, a true change of soul mm -hmm. happens. But I do think that's possible. So right. do you think it's possible to fall in love with a robot? Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. 
do you think it's uh, possible to have a long-term committed monogamous relationship with a robot? Well, yeah, there are lots of different types of long-term committed monogamous relationships. I think monogamous implies like you're not going to see other humans in, sexually or like you basically on Facebook have to say, I'm in a relationship with this person, uh, this robot. I just don't, I, like, again, I think this is comparing robots to humans when I would rather like compare them to pets. Like you get a robot, it fulfills, you know, this loneliness that you have um, in a, maybe not the same way as a pet, maybe in a different way that is even, you know, supplemental in a different way. But, you know, I, I'm not saying that people won't, like do this, be like, oh, I want to marry my robot or I want to have like a, you know, sexual relation, monogamous relationship with my robot. Um, but I don't think that that's the main use case for them. But you think that there's still a gap between human and uh, pet. <laughs> so between uh, husband and pet, <laughs> there's, there, there's a- It's a different relationship. It's an engineering. So that that's a gap that can be closed. Through. I think it could be closed someday, but why would we close that? Like, I, I think it's so boring to think about recreating things that we already have when we could re when we could create something that's different. I know you're thinking about the people who like don't have a husband and like what could we give them? Um, yeah, but but let's. I guess what I'm getting at is um, maybe not. So like the movie Her. Yeah. Right, so a better husband. Well, maybe better in some ways. Like it's, I, I, I do think that robots are going to continue to be a different type of relationship, even if we get them like very human looking, or when, you know, the voice interactions we have with them feel very like natural and human like. I think there's still going to be differences, and there were in that movie too. Like towards the end, it yeah. kind of goes off the rails. But it's just a movie. So the, your intuition is. Uh... That that because because you kind of said two things, right? So one is why would you want to basically replicate the husband? Yeah, right. And the other is kind of implying that it's kind of hard to do. So like anytime you try, you might build something very impressive, but it'll be different. I, I guess my question is about human nature. It's like, how hard is it to uh, satisfy that role of the husband? So removing any of the sexual stuff aside is the is, is more like the mystery, the tension, the dance of relationships. You think with robots that's difficult to build. What's your intuition? I think it? that, Ooh. well, it, it also depends on are we talking about robots now in 50 years in like, indefinite amount of time where like, I'm thinking like five or, to 10 years, five or 10 years. I think that robots at best will be like a, a it's more similar to the relationship we have with our pets than relationship that we have with other people. I got it. So what do you think it takes to build a system that exhibits greater and greater levels of intelligence? Like it impresses us with its intelligence, you know, a Roomba. So you talk about anthropomorphization that doesn't, I, I think intelligence is not required. In fact, intelligence probably gets in the way sometimes, mm -hmm. like you mentioned. But what do you think it takes to create a system where we sense that it has a human level intelligence? So something that, probably something conversational, human level intelligence. How hard do you think that problem is? It'd be interesting to sort of hear your perspective not just purely, so I talked to a lot of people, oh, how hard is the conversational agents? Yeah. How hard is it to pass a Turing test? But my sense is it's it's uh, easier than just solving, it's easier than solving the pure natural language processing problem because I feel like you can cheat. Yeah. So yeah, so how, how hard is it to pass a Turing test in your view? I, well, I think, that, again, it's all about expectation management. If you set up people's expectations to think that they're communicating with, what was it, a 13-year-old boy from the Ukraine? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Then they're not going to expect perfect English. They're not going to expect perfect, you know, understanding of concepts or even, like, being on the same wavelength in terms of, like, conversation flow. So 
it's much easier to pass in that case. Do you think, you kind of alluded this too with audio, do you think it needs to have a body? I think that we definitely have, so we treat physical things with more social agency because we're very physical creatures. I think a body can be useful. Um, Does it get in the way? Is there a negative aspects like? Uh, yeah, there can be. So if you're trying to create a body that's too similar to something that people are familiar with, like I have this robot cat at home that has Romix and it's very disturbing to watch because I'm constantly assuming that it's going to move like a real cat and it doesn't because it's like a $100 piece of technology. Um, so it's very like disappointing <laughs> and it's very hard to treat it like it's alive. Um, so you can get a lot wrong with the body too, but you can also use tricks same as, you know, the expectation management of the 13 year old boy from the Ukraine. If you pick an animal that people aren't intimately familiar with, like the baby dinosaur, like the baby seal that people have never actually held in their arms, you can get away with much more because they don't have these preformed expectations. Yeah. I remember you having thinking a TED talk or something that clicked for me that, Nobody actually knows what a dinosaur looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually get away with a lot more. That was, a, that was great. Uh, do you think it needs like, uh, love and uh, consciousness and all those kinds of topics? Do they come up in psych and the knowledge base? Oh, of course. So an important part of human knowledge, in fact, it's difficult to understand human behavior and human history without understanding human emotions and why people do things and and how how emotions drive people to to do things and all all of that is extremely important in getting psych to understand things for example in coming up with scenarios so one of the applications that psych does one kind of application it does is to generate plausible scenarios of what might happen and what might happen based on that and what might happen based on that and so on. So you generate this ever-expanding sphere, if you will, of possible future things to, to worry about or think about. And in some cases, those are intelligence agencies doing uh, possible terrorist scenarios so that we can defend against uh, terrorist threats before we see the first one, sometimes they are computer security um, attacks so that we can actually close loopholes uh, and vulnerabilities before the very first time someone actually exploits those um, and so on. Sometimes they are scenarios involving uh, more positive things, uh, involving our plans, like for instance, what, what college should we go to, what career should we go into, and so on. Uh, what professional training should I um, take on? That that sort of thing. So there, there's all sorts of um, there, there are all sorts of useful scenarios that can be generated that way of cause and effect and cause and effect that go out. And many of the linkages in those scenarios, many of the steps involve understanding and reasoning about human motivations, human needs, human emotions, what people are likely to react um, to in, uh, in something that you do and why and how and so on. So that was always a very important part of the knowledge that we had to represent in the system. So I talk a lot about love. So I got to ask, do you remember off the top of your head how Psych is trying to, is able to represent various aspects of love that are useful for understanding human nature and therefore integrating into this whole knowledge base of common sense. What is love? We try to tease apart concepts that have enormous complexities to them and variety to them down to the level where, uh, where you don't, as it were, you don't need to tease them apart further. So love is too general of a term, it's not useful. Exactly, so when you get down to uh, romantic love and sexual attraction, you get down to parental love, you get down to um, uh, um, filial love, and uh, you get down to uh, love of uh, doing some kind of activity or creating, so 
eventually you get down to maybe 50 or 60 concepts, mm -hmm. each of which is a kind of love. They're interrelated, and then each one of them has idiosyncratic things about it. Uh, and you don't have to deal with love to get to that level of complexity, even something like in, um, X being in Y, meaning physically in Y. Uh, we may have one English word in to represent that, but it's useful to tease that apart because the way that the, um, the liquid is in the coffee cup is different from the way that the air is in the room, which is different from the way that I'm in my jacket uh, and so on. And so there are questions like, if I look at this coffee cup, well, I see the liquid. If I turn it upside down, will the liquid come out? And so on. Uh, if I have, say, coffee with sugar in it, uh, if I do the same thing, the sugar doesn't come out, right? It stays in the liquid because it's dissolved in the liquid and so on. Mm -hmm. So by now, we have about 75 different kinds of in mm -hmm. in the system, and it's important to distinguish those. So if you're reading along an English text, you see the word in, um, the writer of that was able to use this one innocuous word because he or she was able to assume that the reader had enough common sense and world knowledge to disambiguate which of these 75 kinds of in they, they actually meant. And the same thing with love. You may see the word love, but if I say, you know, I love ice cream, that's obviously different than if I say I love this person or I love to... Uh, go fishing or something like that. So uh, you have to be careful not to take language too seriously because people have done a kind of uh, parsimony, a kind of terseness where you have as few words as, as, you, as you can because otherwise you'd need half a million words in your language, which is a lot of words. That's like 10 times more than most languages really uh, make use of and so on just like we have on the order of um, about a million concepts in uh, psych, because we've had to tease apart all these things. And so when you look at the name of a psych term, most of the psych terms actually have three or four English words in a phrase which captures the meaning of this mm -hmm. term, because you have to distinguish all these types of love, you have to distinguish all these types of in, and there's not a single English word which captures most of these things. Yeah, and uh, th it seems like language, when used for communication between humans, almost as a feature, has some ambiguity built in. It's not some. It's not an accident because, like, the human condition is a giant mess, and so it feels like nobody wants two robots, like very precise formal logic conversation on a first date, right? Like there, there's some dance of like uncertainty of wit, of humor, of push and pull and all that kind of stuff. If everything is made precise, then life is not worth living, I think, for in terms of the, the human experience. And we've all had this experience of creatively misunderstanding. Uh, one, of, <laughs> one of my favorite... Uh, yeah, I think, and you, you talk about this in your book, and I could talk to you about it forever, the the harshly self-critical aspect to your personality and uh, to mine as well in the face of failure. It's a powerful tool, but it's also a burden uh, that's that's very interesting, uh, very interesting to uh, walk that line. But let me ask on the, in terms of people around you, in terms of friends, in, in the bigger picture of your own life, where do you put the value of love, family, friendship in the big picture journey of your life? Well, ultimately all journeys are alone. Um, it's great to have support. Um, and, you know, um, when you, 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 you go forward and say, your job is to make something work and that's your number one priority. Um, and you're going to work at it to make it work, you know, it's like superhuman effort. People don't um, become successful as part-time workers. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and if you're prepared to make that 100 to 120 uh, percent effort, you're, you're going you're gonna to need support. 
and and you're going to have to have people involved with your life who understand that that's really part of your life. Uh, sometimes you you're involved with somebody and you know, they don't really understand that. And that's a source of, you know, sort of conflict and difficulty. But if, you, if you're involved with the right people, uh, you know, whether it's a you know, sort of dating relationship or, um, you know, sort of, a, you know, spousal relationship, um, you know, you, you have to involve them uh, in your life, uh, but not burden them mm. with, with every you know, sort of minor triumph or mistake. They they actually get bored with it after a while. And and so you have to set up different types of ecosystems. You, you have your home life, you have your love life, uh, you have children, and, and that's like the enduring part of what you do. And then on the other side, you, you've got the, you know, sort of unpredictable nature uh, of um, of 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 this type of work, what what I say to people at my firm who were younger, usually, um, well, everybody's younger, but but um, you know, people who are of an age where where, where you know they they're just having their first child, uh, or maybe they have two children, that it's important um, to to make sure they go away. Uh, with their spouse uh, uh, at least once every two months to just some lovely place where there are no children, no issues, uh, sometimes once a month if if they're, you know, sort of energetic and clever. Uh, and that... Um, Escape the craziness of it all. Yeah, and, all. And, and reaffirm uh, your, your values as a couple. Uh, and you have to have fun. If you don't have fun with the person you're with, uh, and all you're doing is dealing with issues, then then that gets pretty old, and and so you have to protect the fun element uh, of your life together. And the way to do that isn't by hanging around the house and and dealing with you know sort of more problems. It, you have to get away and and reinforce and reinvigorate uh, your relationship. And whenever I tell one of our younger people about that, they sort of look at me and it's like the scales are falling off of their eyes and they're saying, geez, you know, I hadn't thought about that. You know, I'm so enmeshed in all these things, but that's a great idea. And that's something as an entrepreneur, you, you also have to do. Uh, you, you just can't let relationships slip because you're half overwhelmed. Beautifully put. And I think there's no better place to end it. Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was an honor to talk to you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Steven Schwartzman. And thank you to our sponsors, ExpressVPN and Masterclass. Please consider supporting the podcast by signing up to Masterclass at masterclass.com slash Lex and getting ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash LexPod. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, Support on Patreon or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now let me leave you with some words from Steven Schwartzman's book, What It Takes. It's as hard to start and run a small business as it is to start a big one. You will suffer the same toll financially and psychologically as you bludgeon it into existence. It's hard to raise the money and to find the right people. So if you're going to dedicate your life to a business, which is the only way it will ever work. You should choose one with the potential to be huge. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. You know, they, my wife's a drill sergeant. She, she's tough, she don't mess, you know, she's this, this big, but like- So you're the softy in the family. I'm well, <laughs> yeah, it's, no, you know, it's funny because my, my son said to me, my son's 21 now. He's a good kid, you know. And uh, he says to me back when he's like 12, he goes, Dad, 
I don't want you to be offended, but I'm really scared of mom. I'm not really that scared of you. <laughs> and you know, like I, I yeah. cracked up because it's true. Like she's got to step, she's got to stand on like a milk crate to reach him because you know <laughs> she's tiny and he's tall. But it's true. But you know, but she was hard but fair, but loved. That's see, this is the thing. You take any child anywhere from any background. If you love them, you nurture them, you teach them, and you guide them, you have a successful adult. And see, that's the problem in our society. It's not judgmental. I'm not judging anyone. But we need to try harder as parents, as, as siblings, as friends. But especially when, when we're blessed with a child, it's like, you, you got to put that child first. It's, it's like being a military person or responder. It's not about you anymore. Now it's the team. So that little child is is now the team and you know your wife or your your significant other, you know, like it's not about you anymore. And see that's the problem is people have a hard time not making it about them. You know, like now it's really weird. My my kids are 19, 21 and 24 and they hardly want to hang with me because they're busy in their life. We love each other. They're probably tired of hearing me go on and you know, preach and whatever, but like, but, but they're adults. We, we, we did pretty much the crux of what we had to do to, to put them into adulthood. And I look back and I go, wow, I wish I didn't work so much. And I wish, but then I say, no, but it was okay. You know, my wife stayed home, good lessons, good, you know, just, just. But like, ultimately, like you said, it's love. It is. It, it's, love. it's the common, that love is, the most important ingredient on this earth and that and that's that's the problem what's going on right now like take politics out of it right take polarizing each other against each other take all that crap out of it and just airdrop a bunch of love right right like <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like I, I when i worked on rescue me right yeah I love those people so much. They were such great. We had such a great crew and they worked so hard. You're a celebrity. No, 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 not at all. I, if, if I was, I, it didn't really, it didn't really work out so good. I went, yeah. went on to being a stagehand. That way, no, I'm not pretty, but, uh, and they don't, they don't want old guys with waving, waving bye bye hairdos. Yeah. But, uh, but, but it was funny. We, the crew, we became really tight. We had like, shoot, like 80, 90 people on a, on a set. Right. And, you know, the first, few episodes everybody's trying to feel each other out because you know you work with different crews different people and this is going back starting in 2004 so it was a different time and i love to hug people because mm -hmm. to me a hug is a true expression of love and caring you may not know a person a long time but you say i care about you with a hug can i can I just yeah. a tiny tangent uh, yeah. this is in the midst of covid when uh, I was in Boston and it was, you know, masks, like triple masks, nobody. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I, I went to see Joe here when he's trying to convince me to move to Austin, Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah. And then when the first time I see him, he's like, ah, you motherfucking <laughs> big ass hug. Yeah. And it and people, felt so well, people good. People probably looked horrified. They're hugging. Well, no, it was They're just, hugging. Well, yeah. it was just him. Oh, okay, just and him I'm and saying, I. but if you do it in public now, it's like, it's like you committed a but crime. But that expression, because I was so, you forget, how oh yeah how powerful that is that oh i got just... some of my buddies i give them a huge a huge hug and a big sloppy kiss on their cheek and i mean <laughs> and i because i love them they yeah. these are my brothers you know but on this set i swear to god it got to the point and i'm not trying to whatever but there was people that would come up to me for the daily hug yeah and i said <laughs> what, what are you doing and they said, come on, bring it in. And I give them the hug. And they said, you don't understand. It just makes me feel so good. You, yeah, yeah. It makes me feel like you give a crap about my side. I really do. Awesome. I said, but it, it touched my heart that people were seeking me out to get that hug to start the day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember there was a guy in Manhattan. He was selling hugs for like 50 cents. And I think he got arrested, right? It was be just before COVID. But like, I wouldn't sell them. If, yeah, but now, you're giving them away for Well, now free. I got leukemia. I'd be kind of concerned to get into COVID. I mean, yeah. but- but like, I, I really think we need that. We need hugging booths like in each city or each town. Like, because there's so many people that just want to know someone gives a shit about them. And that's the problem. It's like, like, you know, that's what I love about small little towns like where I am now in Tennessee. And I'm not knocking New York. I'm not knocking big towns, but I guess it's easier to do in a smaller area because it's just not this massive humanity. But they'll stop and check on you. Like you're out in the road and you know, like I'm cutting and cleaning or whatever. I, occasionally I'll roll a lawnmower or a tractor into a ditch cause I'm, you know, not a farmer too good, but uh, 
it's easier to drive a fire truck in New York. But they literally, oh, I was worried. I haven't seen you. And I'm like, no, no, I'm okay. But they literally like check on you. They're worried about you. And, and I'm going, these people hardly know me, but yet they're so caring. And and that's the problem. Like this is what I love about my life. I spent a lot of time, as a, especially as a young boy, and a lot of time in Ireland at my grandma's farm. And my mom comes from this tiny, tiny little village. She's out in the middle of nowhere. And and the the childhood home she grew up in is still my aunt and uncle live in it still. I just love it there so much because everyone waves. Tennessee's similar. They wave. Driving by and you're like, who the hell's that? I know, just wave, you know. Mm -hmm. But my cousin will point it out. That's your third cousin, second removed by, you know, Johnny. I was like, holy shoot, I'm related to everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But like everyone stops to say hello yeah. and how are you? And I have a problem doing that because my wife goes, people think you're crazy. Why are you talking to everybody? I said... Like, I'll literally stop someone and, and say, how's your day going? Like, yeah. I mean, I'll randomly on the sidewalk, then it looks a little nuts. But like, if I'm buying a cup of coffee. Oh, that happens here in yeah. Austin all the time. Yeah. That's why I love it here. Yeah. On the sidewalk, randomly. Yeah, no, it's it's just so nice. They, they, they'll say hi to me. I thought they recognized me or something. Right. I don't give a shit who you are. They're just being nice. <laughs> I was on the road uh, coming back, driving from my family up north down to Tennessee last week. I stopped in a bathroom and it, is, it was closed. The girl was, was cleaning it, whatever. She's working so hard, whatever. She goes, sir, she goes, if you go down the hall, there's a family restroom, feel free to use it. You know, She didn't have to do that. And I went down and, I, and I'm old. You, you need a bathroom, you need a bathroom, right? <laughs> and I walked back out and I said, ma'am, I said, I wanna thank you for being here today. I said, bathroom was immaculate. It was, it was, yeah. it was like my army bathroom in the barracks. It was, it was spotless, right? And I gave her $10. I said, I really like you to buy lunch with me today. I said, you really didn't have to do me that favor. And she goes, no, sir. I said, no, no. I said, I want. And she, it was like I gave her a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And I say to my wife now, I've been praying to be a billionaire. She goes, that's a sin. I said, no, no, you don't understand, <laughs> right? And she goes, oh, you, you missed up, you know, Mr. You know, God. I said, no, no, no. I said, you're getting it wrong. I said, I'm praying to be like a multi-gazillionaire because I want to give it all away. We used to have a sign in Ladder 114 until some other rival truck company stole it, right? Because that's what we do. We, you know, yeah, they yeah. You get sent to cover your district when you're at a fire and now your stuff's missing. Yep. And the old timers had a sign that says, I am content. Because if you got to Ladder 114, that was considered such a great place, such a great assignment, such great guys. You had to be vetted to get there. You couldn't just randomly go. And it was a little exclusionary, but they wanted good guys. And I said to myself, that's where I am in life right now. I am content, but I'm restless because I want to really do a lot more good. It's like this podcast. I want to make sure that it's not forgotten. And I want to make sure that these charities that are really, really helping people get recognized. But I'd like to take it a step further, right? A friend of mine runs this foundation for young folks suffering mental illness and in crisis. It's for someone that we love dearly. And uh, he's on a mission now to get therapy dogs for really, really mentally wounded warriors right? These, these, a lot of these young soldiers are having a really hard time. And now they could be out a while. They may have come back in country two, three years ago. Now it's just starting to set in. And there's a waiting list for thousands of therapy dogs. And he said that they can't get enough of them quick enough. But he said, when you see the response, the way these veterans just light up when they get these dogs it just changes their life radically immediately and i said that's it god i don't know how i'm gonna do it but i want to i want to be a gazillionaire and i don't i don't want i don't want any picture photo ops this that i just want to go there's a dog there's a dog there's a dog there's a dog and then i want to build veterans land for these these vets who just need a nice clean place to live so why don't we take these old army bases and Marine bases and Navy bases that have been shut down. They're just sitting there rotting away. I was in the Army in Alabama. My old Fort McClellan is three quarters vacant. It's sitting there. They just did a documentary on it. It just looks like zombie land going back to zombies. So why don't we take that and renovate it and say to vets who are struggling, hey guys, you're going to live here. And they take the old 
army, you know, uh, the places where they had all the supplies or, you know, there's massive buildings where you could just retrofit it and make light manufacturing within two weeks. Give these guys jobs. There they live, there they work. They'll take care of it. Military guys, they teach you how to take care of stuff, right? How the hell in this country should any vet come back home and be homeless? Because now they now after dedicating their lives for six, seven, 10, 12 years, five, five, six deployments making seven fifty an hour. And then, you know, they spend seven years or they get a whopping sixteen an hour, right? You know, they they walk out making thirty five grand. And now no one gives them a job. No one gives them a chance. So very quickly, they end up homeless by no fault of their own. And I don't know how that's even possible. The people in this country who've given the very most and they're struggling, they're hurting. That's not fair. And my whole thing is, if, if I can have this dream of succeeding, so to speak, I, I want to try, I want to try to change it, you know, and just, just, so that's why I'm praying to be a Help billionaire. Them. Well, my wife, my, my Irish mother probably wouldn't agree either because you're not supposed to, right? Well, I, I'm I'm the same with you. Uh, the more the more money you have, the more you're able to help. Yeah, uh, help people. You can put smiles on pe people's faces. I I have to ask you, side, but let me ask the over romanticized question: Do you think we'll ever engineer an AGI system that we humans would be able to love and that would love us back? So have that level and depth of connection. I love that question. Um, and it, it, it relates closely to things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, you know, in the context of this human AI research. There, there's um, social psychology research, uh, in, in particular by um, Susan Fisk at, at, at Princeton in the department I used to, um, where I used to work, um, where she she dissects human attitudes toward other humans into a sort of two-dimensional, you know, a two-dimensional two-dimensional scheme. And um, one dimension is about ability. You know, how how able, how capable uh, is is this other person? Uh, and the but the other dimension is warmth. Hmm. So you can imagine another person who's very skilled and capable, but is very cold. Right, um, and you wouldn't you wouldn't really like highly. You, you might have some reservations about that other person, right? Um, but there, there's also a kind of reservation that we might have about another person who who elicits in us or displays a lot of human warmth, but is you know not good at getting things done, right? That that w like the, the greatest esteem that we we reserve our greatest esteem really for people who are both highly capable mm -hmm. and also um uh quite warm right that that's that's like the best of the best this i mean I, i'm just I, I'm, this isn't a a normative statement i'm making this is just yeah. an empirical it's yeah. an empirical statement yeah. this is what humans seem this is these are the two dimensions that people seem to kind of like along which people size other people up and and in ai research we really focus on this capability thing you know, like we want our agents to be able to do stuff you know this thing can play go at a superhuman level that's awesome mm. and, and but that's only one dimension What's the what about the other dimension? What would it mean for an AI system to be warm? Um, and you know, I, I don't know. Maybe there are easy solutions here, like we can put a put a face on our AI systems. It, it's cute. It has big ears. I mean, that, that's probably part of it. But I think it also has to do with a pattern of behavior, um, a pattern of, you know, what would it mean for an AI system to display caring, compassionate behavior? in a way that actually made us feel like it was for real. Yeah. Uh, that we didn't feel like it was simulated. We didn't feel like we were being duped. Um, to me that, you know, people talk about the Turing test or some some descendant of it. I, I feel like that's the ultimate Turing test. You know, is there, a, is there an AI system that can not only convince us that it knows how to reason and it knows how to interpret language, but that we're comfortable saying, yeah, that AI system's a good guy. You know, like, I, I mean... <laughs> on, that, the, on the warmth scale, yeah. whatever warmth is, we kind of intuitively understand it, but we also want to be able to, to, to... Yeah, we don't understand it explicitly enough yet to be able to engineer it. Exactly. And that's, and that's an open scientific question. You kind of alluded to it several times in the human-AI interaction. 
That's the question that should be studied and probably one of the most important questions and humans, as we and humans, to AGI. We humans are, are so good at it. Yeah. You know, it's not just, Weird. it's not just that we're born warm, you know, yeah. like I, I suppose some people are, are warmer than others given, you know, whatever genes they manage to inherit. But there's also, there's also, there are also learned skills involved, right? I mean, there are ways of communicating to other people that you care, uh, that they matter to you, that you're enjoying interacting with them, yeah. right? Um, and we learn these skills from one another. And it's not out of the question that we could build engineered systems. I think it's hopeless, as you say, that we could somehow hand design these sorts of these sorts of behaviors. But it's not out of the question that we could build systems that kind of, we, 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 in, we in, instill in them something that sets them out in the right direction so that they, they end up learning what it is to interact with humans in a way that's gratifying to humans. I, I mean, honestly, if that's not where we're headed, I want out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's exciting uh, as a scientific problem, just as you described. I, uh, I honestly don't see a better way to end it than talking about warmth and love and Matt, I don't think I've ever had uh, such a wonderful conversation where my questions were so bad and your answers were so beautiful. <laughs> so I, I deeply appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Well, it's thanks been for, very fun. I, you know, it's, it. I, as you can probably tell, I, um, I really, you know, I there's something I like about kind of thinking outside the box yeah. and like, yeah. Um, so it's good to having have an opportunity to do that. Awesome. Thanks so much for doing it. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Matt Bopvinick, and thank you to our sponsors the Jordan Harbinger Show, and Magic Spoon Low-Carb Keto Cereal. Please consider supporting this podcast by going to jordanharbinger.com slash lex and also going to magicspoon.com slash lex and using code lex at checkout. Click the links, buy all the stuff. It's the best way to support this podcast and the journey I'm on in my research and the startup. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it, with uh, five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, follow on Spotify, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. Again, spelled miraculously without the E, just F-R-I-D-M-A-N. And now let me leave you with some words from neurologist V.S. Samachandran. How can a three pound mass of jelly that you can hold in your palm, imagine angels, contemplate the meaning of an infinity, and even question its own place in the cosmos. Especially awe-inspiring is the fact that any single brain, including yours, is made up of atoms that were forged in the hearts of countless far-flung stars billions of years ago. These particles drifted for eons and light years until gravity and change brought them together here now. These atoms now form a conglomerate, your brain, that can not only ponder the very stars that gave it birth, but can also think about its own ability to think and wonder about its own ability to wander. With the arrival of humans, it has been said, the universe has suddenly become conscious of itself. This, truly, is the greatest mystery of all. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. So last question, do you think we will ever fall in love, like in the movie Her, with an artificial intelligence system or an artificial intelligence system falling out in love with a human? I hope so. If there's any better way to end it is on uh, love. So Greg, thanks so much for talking today. Thank you for having me. Well, let me ask you about love. What role does love play in this whole thing in the in the human condition? In all the study of genocide, it does seem that uh, hardship in moments brings out the best in human nature, and the best in human nature is expressed through love. Friendship well, as I love. already mentioned to you, I think hardship it can 
is not a good thing for for you know it's not the best thing for love i mean it's better it's better to not have to suffer and not I have to so. yes i think it is i think it's you you know as i mentioned to you you know studying concentration camps you know this is not a place for love it happens it happens but it's not really a place for love it's a place for rape it's a place for torture it's a place for killing and it's a place for inhuman action one to another you know and also as i said among those who are suffering not just between those who are and and then there are whole gradations you know the same thing in the gulag you know there are gradations all the way from the the criminal prisoners who beat the hell out of the political prisoners you know who then have others below them who they beat that you know so everybody's being the hell out of everybody else so i would i would not idealize in any way suffering as a you know a, a, a source of beauty a and source love. of beauty and love i wouldn't do but that see, so i think what, it's a whole lot better <laughs> for people to be relatively prosperous i'm not saying super prosperous but to be able to feed themselves and to be able to feed their families and house their families and take care of themselves um you know to foster l- loving relations between people and um you know, I think it's no accident that, um, you know, poor families have much you know, worse records when it comes to crime and things like that, you know, and, and also to wife beating and to child abuse and stuff like that. I mean, you just, you don't, you don't want to be um, poor and indigent and not have a roof over your head, be homeless. I mean, it doesn't mean, again, you know, homeless people are, are mean people. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, what we want to try to foster in this country and around the world. And one of the reasons, you know, I mean, I'm very critical of the Chinese in a lot of ways, but I mean, we have to remember they pulled that country out of horrible poverty, right? And uh, I mean, there's still poor people on the countryside. There's still problems, you know, with, with um, want and need, among the Chinese people, but you know, there were millions and millions of Chinese who were living at the bare minimum of life, which is no way to live, you know, and no way again to foster love and compassion and 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 getting along. So, I want to be clear: I don't speak for history, right? I, I, I'm, I'm giving you. I'm, there used to be historians, you know, in the 19th century who really thought they were speaking for history. Yeah, you know, I don't think that way at all. I mean, I understand I'm a subjective human being with my own, my own points of view and my own opinions. But I'm trying uh, to remember in this in this conversation that you're, dis- despite the fact that you're brilliant and you've written brilliant books, that you're just human. Well, I am with an human. opinion. I, I am. That's it. Yeah. No, no, that's absolutely true. And uh, I tell my students that too. I mean, I make sure they understand this is not history speaking. You know, this is me and Norman and I'm, I'm, (laughs) you know, and this is, uh, this is what it's about. I mean, I've spent a long time studying history and, and um, have enjoyed it uh, enormously, but um, you know, I'm an individual with my points of view and what, and one of them is that I've developed over time is that you know you, you know human want is a real is a real tragedy for people and it, and it hurts people and it also causes upheavals and difficulties and stuff like that. so i feel for people you know i feel for people in syria i feel for people in in um you know in ethiopia and tigray you know when they don't have enough to eat and you know what that does i mean it doesn't mean they don't love each other right and it doesn't mean they don't love their kids but it does mean that it's harder, you know, to do that and to and I'm not so sh- I'm not so sure. It's obvious mm-hmm. to me that it's harder. It's there's suffering. There is suffering. But you, w- w- the numbers we've been talking about deaths, been talking about suffering. But the numbers we're not quantifying. The the history that you haven't perhaps been looking at is all the times that people have fallen in love deeply with friends, with romantic love, that the 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 positive emotion that people have felt. And I'm not so sure. That amidst the suffering, those moments of beauty and love can be discovered. And if we look at the numbers, I'm not so sure the story is obvious. There, that you know, 
I mean, again, I, I suppose you may disagree with Viktor Frankl. I may too, maybe depending on the day. I mean, he says that if there's meaning to this life at all, there's meaning to the suffering too, because suffering is part of life. There's something about accepting the ups and downs, even when the downs go very low, and within all of it, finding a source of meaning. I mean, he's arguing from the perspective of psychology, but just a, this life is an incredible gift, almost no matter what. And I'm not, it's easy to uh, look at suffering and think if we just escape the suffering, it will all be better. But we all die. There's beauty in the whole thing. And it, it is true that it's just, from all the stories I've read, especially in, in famine and starvation, it's just horrible. It is horrible suffering. But I, I also just want to say that there's love amidst it, and we can't forget that. No, no, I don't. I don't forget it. I don't forget it. But and, and I think it's from the stories. Now, I don't want to make that compromise or that trade, but the intensity of friendship in war, the intensity of love in war, is very high. So I'm not sure what to make of these calculations, but if you look at the stories, some of the people I'm closest with, and, and I've never experienced anything even close to any of this, but some of the people I'm closest with is people I've gone through difficult times with. There's something about that. There, there's a society or a group where things are easy. The intensity of the connection between human beings is not as strong. I don't know what to do with that calculus because I too agree with you, I want to, uh, have as little suffering in the world as possible. But we have to remember about the love and the depth of human connection and find the right balance there. I... No, there's some there's something to what you're saying. There's clearly something to what you're saying. I, mean, I was just thinking about the Soviet Union, you know, when I lived there and and people on the streets were so mean to one another and they never <laughs> smiled. And they, you grew up there? Yes. No, but you were you're too young to No, be. no, I remember well. You remember I came here when I was thirteen, yeah. Okay. So anyway, um I remember living there and just how hard people were on each other on the streets. And when you got inside people's apartments, when they started to trust you, you know, the friendships were so yes. intense and so wonderful. Um so in that sense, I mean, they did live a hard life. But there was enough food on the table, and there was yes. a roof over their heads. There's a certain and line. There's a certain. There are lines. You know, I don't think there's one line, but you know, it's kind of a, a shading. And the other story I was thinking of as you were talking was um, it's not a story. It's a, a history. A history, a book, um, you know, by a friend of mine who wrote about um, love in the um, camps, in the refugee camps for Jews in Germany after the war. So these were Jews who had come mostly from Poland and were, you know, some survived the camps, came from awful circumstances. And then they were put in, in these camps, which were not joyful places. I mean, they were guarded sometimes by Germans even, but they're basically under the British, British control. And they were trying to get to Israel, you know, trying to get to Palestine um, uh, right after the war. And how many pairs there were, how many people coupled up. But remember, this is after being in the concentration yes. camp. It's not being in the concentration yes. camp. And it's also being free, Yes, you know, to more or less free, you know, to express their emotions and to, and to be human beings after this horrible thing which they suffered. So I wonder whether there's, you know, as you say, some kind of calculus there where, you know, the, the, the level of suffering is... Um, is such that uh, it's just too much for humans to bear. And, uh, you know, which I would suggest, I mean, I haven't studied this myself. I'm just giving you my point of view, you know, my mm -hmm. off-the-cuff remarks here. But it was very inspiring to read about these couples who had met right in these camps and started to couple couple up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get married and, and try then to find their way to Palestine, which was a difficult thing to do then. When did you live in uh, Russia and the Soviet Union? What's your memory of the time? Well, so a, a number of different times. So I, I went there. I first went there in 69, 70. Wow. Uh, a long time ago. And uh, uh, then I lived in uh, in Leningrad mostly, but also in Moscow in 1975. So it was detente time. Um, but it was also a time of political uncertainty and also... Um, 
hardship, you know, for Russians themselves, you know, standing in long lines. I mean, you must remember this for yes. food and for uh, getting anything was almost impossible. It was a time when Jews uh, were trying to get out. Um, in fact, I just talked to a friend of mine from those days who I helped get out and get to Boston and the lovely people who had managed to have a, go a good life in the United States after they left. Uh, but it wasn't an easy time. It wasn't an easy time at all. I remember people set fire to their doors and, you know, their daughter was uh, persecuted in school, you know, once once they declared that they wanted to immigrate and that sort of thing. So it was a very, it was a lot of anti-Semitism. Um, so it was a tough time. Dissidents, you know, hung out with some dissidents and one guy was actually killed. Uh, we think by the, nobody knows exactly by the KGB, but his uh, art studio was, uh, he had a separate studio in, in Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg today. Um, you know, just a small studio where he did his art and somebody set it on fire. Mm -hmm. And we think it was KGB, but you know, you never really know. Um, and he died in that fire. So, you know, it was not a, it was a, it was a tough time. And, uh, you know, you knew you were followed. You knew you were being reported on as a as a foreign scholar, as I was. There was a formal exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union, and you know, they let me work in the archives. But then, you know, Ivanov got to work in the right. in the physics lab at Rochester yes. or something like that. Yes. You know, so it was a it was an exchange which sent historians and literary people and some social scientists to Russia and they sent all scientists here to, you know, grab what they could from MIT and those places. <laughs> how, how is your Russian? Uh, has, do you have any knowledge of Russian language that oh, has yeah. helped you to understand? Oh yeah. Yeah. Is, I mean, I, I, I can read it fine. And the speaking, you know, comes and goes, uh, depending on whether I'm, I'm there or whether I've been there recently, or if I spend some time there, because I really need, you know, I have Russian friends who speak just Russian. So, mm -hmm. You know, when when I'm there, I then uh, you know I can communicate pretty well. I can't really write it, unfortunately. I mean, I mean I can, but it's not very good. Uh, but I get along fine. In <laughs> What's your fondest memory of the Soviet Union of Russia? It's friends, friends, it's friends. It's friends. Was it you know, vodka involved or is it just what? Is vodka involved? Is it a little from, bit, you know, I'm not much of a drinker. Yeah. So I would, they, you know, they'd just make fun of me and I'd make, <laughs> I'd make fun of myself. And that was easy enough. I, yeah. I don't really like, you know, yeah. a heavy drink. I've done a lot of that. Yeah. Not a lot. I've done it's some just, of that, but I never really enjoyed it and, yeah. and would get sick and stuff. But um, no, it's friends. You know, uh, one friend I made, uh, in the dormitory, you know, it was a dormitory for foreigners, but also um, Siberians who had come, you know, to uh, Leningrad to study. And so I met a couple of guys, and one in particular from Omsk became a wonderful friend. And we talked and talked and talked outside. You know, we would go walk outside because we both knew they were, you know, people were listening and stuff. And he would say, well, this is, he was an historian, you know, and so we would talk history. And he'd say, well, this was the case, wasn't it? I said, no, I'm sorry, Sasha, it wasn't the case. It was, you know, we think Stalin actually had a role in killing Kirov. I mean, we're not sure, but you know, he said, no. I said, yeah. You know, so, you know, we had these conversations and he was, a, he was a, what I would, I don't know if he would agree with me or not. I mean, we're still friends. So uh, he was a, He's going to check sort of in with naive, you after this. Maybe he'll listen to the blog or I'll send it to him or something. <laughs> he was a kind of naive Marxist-Leninist. And he thought I was, a, you know, I was, a, you know, I had this capitalist ideology. He'd say, what ideology do you have? And I said, I don't have an ideology. You know, I try to just put together kind of reason and facts and accurate stories and try to tell them in that way. No, 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 no. You must, you know, you're a bourgeois, you know, this or that. I said, no, I'm, I'm really not. And... <laughs> And so we would have these talks and these kind of arguments. And then, I mean, sure enough, you know, uh, we corresponded for a while and then he had to stop corresponding because he became a, a, a kind of local official in Omsk. And he, he sort of migrated more and more to being a Democrat. And he was then in the, um, you know, democratic movement uh, under Gorbachev and, um, you know, and the Council of People's Deputies, which they set up, which was, you know, 
elected as a, as a as a Democrat from Omsk and had a political career through the Eltsin period. And once uh, Putin came along, you know, it was over. Uh, he didn't like Putin, and you know, and and Putin didn't like the Elson people, right? Who were tried to be some of them tried to be Democrats, and and Sasha was one who really did. He just published his memoirs in Russian, by the way, which are very good. I think. You know the name of it? Um, Vlast. That's what it's called. <laughs> it, it, it was hard. It's hard to translate in English. Kamandarovki Favlast. But I, I, I mean, this, I translated this, full this, this, this form. Is, this is so beautiful. Like the. Do you find that the translation is a problem or no? It's such a different. Yes, language. translation is very difficult with it's the Russian difficult. language. I mean, it's the only language I know deeply, except right. except English. And it seems like so much is lost of of the of, yes. of the pain, yeah, the no. poetry, the beauty of the people is. And translators are to be treasured, and good ones yeah. to be treasured. I mean, those who who do the translations, you know, when you read. You know things in translation. Sometimes they're quite beautiful. You know whether it's Russian or Polish or German or anything French. Yeah, I'm actually you know. traveling to Paris to talk to the the the, the famous translators, the Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, um, and I'm just going to do a several conversations with them about like you could just sometimes just grab a single sentence and just talk about the translation. In that right. sense, that's um, yeah. And also, as you said. I would love to be a fly in the wall with some of those friends he had because the perspective on history, non-academic, sort of without just as human beings, is so different. Yeah, from the United States versus Russia, yeah. when you talk about the way the World War II is perceived and all those kinds of things, it's um, it's fascinating. It's a uh, history also has in it opinion and perspective. And, and so sometimes stripping that away is really difficult. And I guess that is your job and at its highest form, that is what you do as a historian. Well, Norman, спасибо большое, что сегодня со мной поговорили. I really appreciate your valuable time. It's, it's truly an honor to talk to you. And thank you for um, taking us through a trip through some of the worst parts of human history and, yeah. and, uh, and talking about hope and love at the end. So I really appreciate your time today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Norman Neymark. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Stalin. A single death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Upset. Let me ask some philosophical, slightly romantic questions. All right. People that listen to this will be like, here he goes again. Okay. Do you think do you think one day we'll build an AI system that we a person can fall in love with and it would love them back? Like in the movie Her, for example. Oh yeah. Although she, she kind of didn't fall in love with him. Or she fell in love with like a million other people, something like that. So you're, you're the jealous type, I see. <laughs> so we humans are the jealous. Yes. Type. <laughs> so I I do believe that we can design systems where uh, people would fall in love with their robot, with their um, AI partner. Um, that I do believe um, because it's actually, and I won't. I don't like to use the word manipulate, but as we see. There are certain individuals that can be manipulated if you understand the cognitive science about it, right? All right. So, I mean, if you could think of all close relationship and love in general as a kind of mutual manipulation, that dance, the human dance, I mean, manipulation is a negative connotation. Uh, and that's another, why I don't like to use that yeah, word particularly. I guess another way to phrase it is you're getting at is it could be algorithmatized or something. It could be... Uh, the relationship building part can be... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, just think about it. There we have, and I, I don't use dating sites, but from what I heard, there are some individuals that have been dating that have never saw each other, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a show I think that tries to like weed out fake people. Like there's a show that comes out, right? Yeah. Because like people start faking. Like what's the difference of that person on the other end being an AI agent, right? And having a communication and you building a relationship remotely, like there, there's no reason why that can't happen. In terms of human-robot interaction, so what role, 
you've kind of mentioned with data emotion being can be problematic if not implemented well i suppose what role does emotion and some other human like things the imperfect things come into play here for good human robot interaction and something like love yeah so in this case and you had asked can a ai agent love a human back um i think they can emulate love back right and so what does that actually mean it just means that if you think about their programming they might put the other person's needs in front of theirs in certain situations right you look at think about it as return on investment like was my return on investment as part of that equation that person's happiness you know has some type of you know algorithm weighting to it and the reason why is because i care about them right that's the only reason right um but if i care about them and i show that then uh my final objective function is length of time of the engagement right so you can think of how to do this actually quite easily and so but that's not love well so that's the thing um it i think it emulates love because we don't have a classical definition of love right but uh and we don't have the ability to look into each other's minds to see the algorithm and I mean, I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, is it possible that, especially if that's learned, especially if there's some mystery and black box nature to the system, how is that, you know- How is it any different? How is it any different? And in terms of sort of, if the system says I'm conscious, I'm afraid of death, and it does indicate that it loves you. Uh, another way to sort of phrase it, I'd be curious to see what you think. Do you think there'll be a time when robots should have rights. You've kind of phrased the robot in a very roboticist way, and it's just a really good way, but saying, okay, well, there's an objective function, and I could see how you can create a compelling human-robot interaction experience that makes you believe that the robot cares for your needs and even something like loves you. But what if the robot says, please don't turn me off? What if the robot starts making you feel like there's an entity, a being, a soul there, right? Do you think there'll be a future? Hopefully you won't laugh uh, too much at this, but the, where they do uh, ask for rights. So I can see a future if we don't address it in the near term, where these agents, as they adapt and learn, could say, hey, this should be something that's fundamental. Um, I th hopefully think that we would address it before it gets to that point. You think so? That you think that's a bad future? Is it like what is that a negative thing where they ask we're being discriminated against? I, I guess it depends on what role have they attained at that point, right? And so if I think about now, careful what you say because. The robots 50 years from now will be listening to this and you'll be on TV saying, this is what roboticists used to believe. <laughs> I, well, right? And so this is my, and as I said, I have a biased lens uh, right. and, and my robot friends will understand that. Yes. <laughs> um, but so if you think about it, um, and I actually put this in kind of the, as a roboticist, you don't necessarily think of robots as human with human rights, but you could think of them either in the category of uh, property, or you can think of them in the category of animals, right? Mm -hmm. And so yes. both of those have different types of, of rights. So animals have their own rights as, as a living being, but you know they can't vote, they can't, right? Uh, they, they can be euthanized, uh, but as humans, if we abuse them, we go to jail. Like, right? So they do have some rights that protect them, but don't give them uh, the rights of like citizenship. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about property, property, the rights are associated with the person, right? So if someone vandalizes your property right. or steals your property, like there are some rights, but it's associated with the person who owns that. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, back in the day and if you remember we talked about you know how society has changed women, women were yeah. property yeah. right they were not thought of as having rights they were thought of as property of like they're yeah assaulting a woman meant 
assaulting the property of somebody else. Exactly. And so what I envision is, is that we will establish some type of norm at some point, but that it might evolve, right? Like if you look at women's rights now, like there are still some countries that yep. don't have, and the rest of the world is like, why? That makes no sense, right? And so I do see a world where we do establish some type of grounding. It might be based on property rights. It might be based on animal rights. And if it evolves that way, I think we will have this conversation at that time because that's the way our society traditionally has evolved. Beautifully thing. Although AWS kind of does a shitty job of like, I'm continually surprised, like Mechanical Turk, for example, how shitty the interface is. We're talking about like Rev making me feel good. Like when I first discovered Mechanical Turk, the initial idea of it was like, it made me feel like Rev does, but then the interface is like, come on. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Why? Why? Is yeah. so painful. Does nobody at Amazon want to like seriously invest in it? It felt like you could make so much money if you took this effort seriously. And it feels like they have a committee of like two people just sitting back, like like a meeting. They meet once a month. Like, what are we gonna do with Mechanical Turk? If it's like uh, two websites make me feel like this, that and Craigslist dot org, whatever the hell it is, yeah, just, yeah. It feels like it's designed in the nineties. Well, oh. Craigslist basically hasn't been updated pretty much since the do, guy originally Do you seriously built. think there's a team? Like, how big is the team working on Mechanical Turk? I don't know. There's some team, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there isn't. I'm skeptical. Yeah. Well, if, if it's nothing possible. else, they benefit from, you know, the other teams, like, moving things forward. <laughs> right. <laughs> in a small way. Possibly. Uh, but no, I, I know what you mean. We, do, we, we use Mechanical Turk for a couple of things yeah. as well, and... Yeah, it's painful yeah, it's, UI. It's painful, but yeah, it works. It actually, I think most people. The, the thing is, most people don't really use the UI, right? Like, so, right. like we, for example, we that's right. Use it through the API, right? So, yeah. But even the API documentation and so on, like, is super outdated. Like, yeah, it's. It, it, I don't. I don't even know what to. I mean, the same like, same criticism. As long as we're ranting, <laughs> my same criticism goes to the APIs of most of these companies, like Google, for example. The API for the different services is just the documentation is so shitty. Like it's not so shitty. I should I should actually be uh, I should exhibit some gratitude. <laughs> okay, let's practice some gratitude. Gratitude the the you know the documentation is pretty good like most of the things that the api makes available is pretty good it's just that in the sense that it's accurate sometimes outdated but like the degree of explanations with examples is only covering i would say like 50 percent of what's mm -hmm, possible mm -hmm. and it just feels a little bit like there's a lot of natural questions that people would want to ask that doesn't uh doesn't get covered and it feels like it's almost there like it's such a magical thing yeah. like the maps api youtube api i there's yeah. a bunch of i gotta stuff. imagine it's like you know there's probably some team at google right responsible for writing this documentation it's probably not the engineers right and exactly. probably this team is not you know where you want to be well it's a it's a weird thing i i sometimes think about this uh, for somebody who wants to also uh, build a company. I think about this a lot. You know, YouTube, the, you know, the service is one of the m most magical, like I'm so grateful that YouTube exists. And yet they seem to be quite clueless on so many things like that everybody is screaming them at. Like it feels like whatever the mechanism that you use to listen to your quote unquote customers, which is like the creators, is not very good. Mm -hmm. Like there's literally people that are like screaming, why like uh, their new YouTube studio, for example. There's like features that, that were like begged for, for a really long time. Like being able to upload multiple videos at the same time. That was missing for a really, really long time. Now, like there's probably, things that I don't know, which is 
maybe for that kind of huge infrastructure, it's actually very difficult to build some of these features. But the fact that that wasn't communicated and it felt like you're not being heard. Like I remember this experience for me and it, it's not a pleasant experience. Yeah, yeah. And it feels like the company doesn't give a damn about you. And that's something to think about. I'm not sure what that is. That might yeah. have to do with just like small groups working on these small features and these specific features. And there's no overarching like dictator type of human that says like, why the hell are we neglecting like Steve Jobs type of character? It's like, there's people that we need to, we need to speak to the people that like want to love our product and they don't. Let's yeah, fix maybe at shit. some point you just get so fixated on the numbers, right? And it's like, well, the numbers are pretty great, right? That's like right. people are watching, you know, doesn't seem to be a problem, right? And, you, you don't, problem. and you're not like the person that like built this thing, right? So yeah. you really care about it. Yeah. You know, you're just there, you came in as a product manager, right? You got hired sometime later, your mandate is like, increase this to number like, you know, 10%, right? And yeah. You just, That's brilliantly put. Like if you, this is, the, okay, if there's a lesson in this, is don't reduce your company into a metric of like how much, uh, like you said, how much how much people watching the videos and so on. And, and, and like convince yourself that everything is working just because the numbers are going up. Yeah. There's something, you have to have a vision. You have to, uh, you have to want people to love your stuff because love, is ultimately the beginning of like a successful long-term company is yeah. they always should love your product. You have to be like a creator and have yeah. that like creator's yeah. love for your own thing, right? Yeah. Like, and you're pained by, you know, these, these comments, right? And probably like, I, Apple I think did this generally like yes, really, well. really well. You know, yeah. they're, they're well known for kind of keeping teams small even when they were big, right? And, you know, you as an engineer, like there's that book, uh, Creative Selection, I don't know if you read it by a, um, Apple engineer named Ken Cosienda. It's kind of a great book, actually, because unlike most of these business books where it's, you know, here's how Steve Jobs ran the company. It's, it's more like, here's how life was like for me, you know, an engineer. Here are the projects I worked on and here are what it was like to pitch Steve Jobs, you know, yeah. on like, you know, I think it was in charge of like the keyboard and the autocorrection, right? Mm -hmm. um, and at Apple, like, Steve Jobs reviewed everything. And so he was like, this is what it was like to show my demos to Steve Jobs and, you know, <laughs> To change them because like Steve Jobs didn't like how you know the shape of the little key was off because the rounding of the corner was like not quite right or something like this. Yeah. Right? He was famously a stickler for this kind of stuff. But because the teams were small, you really owned the stuff, right? So you really cared. Yeah, Elon Musk does that similar kind of thing with Tesla, which is really interesting. There's another lesson in leadership in that is to be obsessed with the details and like he talks to like the lowest level engineers. Okay, so we're talking about ASR and so this is basically where I was saying, we're gonna take this like ultra seriously. And then what's the mission to try to keep pushing towards the 3%? Uh, yeah, and kind of try to um, try to build this platform where all of your, you know, audits, all of your meetings, you know, uh, they're as easily accessible as your notes, right? Like, so like imagine all the, uh, meetings a company might have, right? You know, I'm now that I'm like no longer a programmer, right? And I'm a quote unquote manager. Uh, <laughs> that's less like my day is in meetings, right? Yeah. And, you know, pretty often I want to like see what, what was said, right? Who said it, you know, what's the context? But it's generally not really something they can easily retrieve, right? Like imagine if all of those meetings were indexed, archived, you know, you could go back, you could share a clip like really easily, right? So speaking of, uh, loss of uh, beautiful relationships. What do you make of this whole love thing? Uh, wh why do humans fall in love? What's the role of love, friendship, family in life? In a successful life or just life in general? Why the hell are we so into this thing? There are multiple layers of understanding that question. So kind of the lowest layer is the Darwinian answer, hmm. right? If we weren't this way, we wouldn't have been successful in reproducing and building alliances. It's important to realize that's far from complete. Sort of the highest understanding would be poetic, like read John Keats or uh, you know many other love poets. Is that so? Who, who do I go to to find out to learn about love in terms of poets? Or I would uh, say start or... with John Keats. But given that you're fluent in Russian, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go Russian literature for a second. Like what? 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 You? You keep mentioning Russia. What? 
uh, what's your connection, uh, what's your love uh, uh, in Russia? Well, first, it's all interesting, but more it's concretely, my wife was born in Moscow. Sokolniki was her oh, neighborhood. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And she okay. grew up there. I married her here. Uh, my daughter, I adopted her. I'm not her biological father, but I genuinely raised her. Mm. She was born in Russia, though she came here when she was one. Wow. Uh, my father So you're basically Russian. No, no, no. I'm a New Jersey boy. Uh, That's the same thing. I'm very sorry to report my father-in-law passed away a week Sorry. ago. He lived with us for six years. He lived in Russia till he was, oh, 70. Saw, you know, the Stalinist terror. His father was brought to a camp, lived through World War II, much, much more. Uh, had an incredible life. Never really learned how to speak English. So I absorbed something Russian from him as well. He was part Armenian. Uh, so that's my connection to Russia. A bit of the Russian soul too. Do you, do you, I don't think I have it. I think I appreciate it. But there's division of labor, right? Others in the family. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of that. I'm, I'm more superficial. You mentioned Keats and uh, that higher version, that non-Darwinian love. What's that about? That it's the highest form of human connection and it's intoxicating and it's part of building a life and most of us are very, very strongly drawn to it. And it's part of the highest realization of you being what you can be. Yeah. You mentioned you lost- But ask a Russian. I mean, this is a <laughs> superficial New Jersey boy who grew up listening to Bruce Springsteen, Bruce and that Springsteen. was his romanticism. What's, what, what's, <laughs> uh, what's your favorite Bruce uh, Springsteen song? I think the album Born to Run has actually held up the best, though it's very fashionable to think the earlier or later works are actually better, and that's the overproduced super pop album. But the quality of the songs, to me, Born to Run is just far and away the best, then Darkness on the Edge of Town. Yeah. And those are still my favorites. That... Born to Run is an incredible song. Yeah. And perfectly produced in a Phil Spector kind of way. Every detail is right. Every what lyric. What, what else is on the album? Thunder Road, Jungle uh -huh. Land, 10th Avenue Freeze Out. She's the one, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Bruce meeting is meeting across the river. I really like. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I like. I like when he goes into love. Personally, uh, you know, like uh, I'm on fire. That's a very good song. Dancing in the dark. Yeah. A lot of the later work, I find the percussion becomes too simple, and kind of too white somehow, mm. and a little clunky. And it's still good work. He's super talented, but it doesn't speak to me. Do you but when it all bursts open into the open road like it does on Born to Run, that's yeah. magic. Yeah. I'd or love, Rosalita. Have you ever seen him live? Of, is it? Yes, twice. I, I wonder what he's like live when he was young, right? That, those years. I saw him live when he was young. I was young. Uh, New Jersey. I was a little disappointed, actually. Yeah. I think what I like best from him is quite studio. He certainly played well. I don't fault his performance. But it's like when I saw Plant and Page, you know, of Led Zeppelin, tremendous creators. And they showed up. They were not drunk, like they were paying mm -hmm. attention. But I was underwhelmed because Led Zeppelin, like the Beatles White album, is much more of a studio band than you think at yeah. first. And in the case of Bruce Springsteen, I don't know about you, but for me, he's somebody that I connect with the most when I got that, when I'm alone and there's like a melancholy feeling. <laughs> And actually, drive my my folks live in Philly. I, I went to school in Philly, and so you know, I've uh, <laughs> I, so you're I, almost worthy of New Jersey, then. Yeah, well, you're <laughs> you're almost worthy of uh, of Russia, so we're <laughs> we can connect uh, <laughs> in that aspect. I mean, I love Jersey. It's something um, I feel like um, I feel like I don't know. It's it's it always there's this beautiful like a, there's a dying old goes diner that closed down. I used to. Uh, uh, go there. There's there's a melancholy feeling to me. I mean, of course, a it, thickness to culture in that yeah. part of the world. Yeah, which is oddly similar to some elements of the thickness of Russian culture. Yeah, and when you see like Russian characters on The Sopranos, yeah, <laughs> it totally makes sense, even yeah. though they're these complete outliers. Yeah. It, it, exactly, it totally makes sense. What about love? What about love? <laughs> Tell me about your husband. Okay, Kelsey. he's the best. What role did he play in your life? The most pivotal role. He kept me alive and made me feel worthy enough to 
until I knew that I was worthy enough to be alive. Can you dissect that a little bit? Yeah. Like what, I mean, uh, what role does love play in the human condition? I think love is the only reason that we haven't destroyed ourselves. <laughs> um, I mean, we humans in general? Yes. I think there is a subset of people where love will always be, you know, love conquers all, you know, but that's not always the reality. The reality is life is messy and humans are messy and the way we choose to deal with things are messy and complicated and difficult. But at the root of all good is love, I think. And for me, I was fortunate enough to meet my husband through a friend, <laughs> which you listen to that podcast. So I don't, I don't know that we need to, unless you really want to go into that story again, how I met my husband. Well, I, the only part of that story I like, people should just go listen to the Jocko podcast is how you made him uncomfortable. I love it. I Well, okay, so how it works, let me explain. In the supercross and motocross industry, it's really small. The people who are professional, there's it's a small subset of people. It's kind of like Formula One. 21 cars, that's what there is. That's the amount of riders. And we should say your husband is, uh, is a motocross guy. My husband was a professional supercross and motocross racer um, for his whole life. And he raced for Kawasaki and Suzuki. He lived in California and raced all down there. And when I met him, I met him at the tail end of his career. And so I went to Montreal with a friend of mine to see somebody that I was currently sleeping with, mm -hmm. who was a friend of mine, and end up meeting Brady instead. Yeah, and the funny moment in Jocko's podcast. Was, was saying that I was fucking him instead of just <laughs> sleeping with him. And then Jocko's face exploded. And Jocko was like, oh, sleeping. So like he was he was trying to get details of the sleeping quarters that you're, he was trying to get you to define as a good interviewer would, oh, sleeping, okay. And then you were like, it's fucking Jocko. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. It was, it was something great. along those it lines. It was great. But that's true it. because in that industry, it's like we, yeah. it's small. We all share. Trust yeah. me, this is, is what it is. And anyway, so I met him there and he had broken his wrist re really bad. And um, I was, this was before I deployed. So I met him and I, we stayed in touch and just became friends and just texted. That was it. Nothing weird. And um, I was deploying though. So we just agreed, you know, we'd be friends. We weren't actually talking about anything romantically at all. And then uh, I deployed and we got talking and to know each other a little more, a little more. And then we decided that we liked each other and we wanted to try to give it at least a semi shot. And so when I got home from Afghanistan, I went and watched him race his last, one of his last two races that he did professionally before he retired excuse me. And it was in Montreal and one was in Vegas. And I hadn't seen him and he didn't really know me. We didn't really know each other. Mm. We, you know, we met, I slept in the bed beside him because my girlfriend didn't want to get in trouble from her boyfriend from sleeping beside a random dude. And then, um, yeah, we just, we, we started dating and he really slowly became my rock. And he understands trauma. He had some stuff happen in his life, in his family that he went through a lot of therapy. He went through a lot of shit. He went, he, he saw what traumatic situations can do to a family and to people and th those that are suffering with it. And so he was well equipped to handle me, um, thankfully. And it got to a point where we were doing the long distance back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. And I finally got the call that I was going to be released from the military. And I wanted to live near him, but I couldn't afford to live in British Columbia because I was from Ontario and BC's like, it means bring cash for a reason. I'm like, there's no way I can live there. And then his family was like, come live with us. Like they had a big enough house. They had a big enough house. Trust me, it was fine. So I was like, okay. And so I went from like dating this guy long distance to over, you know, from 2009 to 2011, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then finally his parents were like, shit or get off the pot here with her. Like, come on. You know, it's obvious she loves you. And I would never say it. That word just, I was like, like it was just, I couldn't. So you guys didn't say uh, For a long time. Other. For a long time. Interesting. Because I was dead inside. Oh. I didn't know what that meant. Because I did, I couldn't feel. I didn't feel anything. He loved it. Because he like, we'd, be go, we'd go do something. You would never complain about anything. You wouldn't say a fucking word. You would just sit there. 
And now <laughs> you got all your feelings back and your emotions back. And now you're too hot and you're too cold. And yeah. Anyway, so yeah, <laughs> he loved it. I was numb and dead inside. Seriously, when we, when I call him back. But you, you, were you still able to have fun together, that kind of thing? Like uh, like when you say there's no emotion, there's, there's more emotion around the basics of like everyday life. Uh, but you're still able to just like enjoy shit together? Or is it I was enjoying stuff, but I wasn't feeling. Like, feeling. Yeah. I was like, this is fun. Yeah. Right. That exactly. was it. Exactly. <laughs> that was surface <laughs> level. Like, Lex, this is fun. <laughs> like, it wasn't. Uh, there's nothing there. Yeah. No, there's nothing there. Hey, yeah, yeah, nothing. And so we went through that for a long time. And then I lived with his parents and we we lived there. And that was, you know, God damn it, his family was so good to me because I was a nightmare. I was a nightmare. Couldn't cook certain food around me anymore. Couldn't couldn't go certain places with me anymore. Couldn't, you know, crowds were in hard no. We didn't do Canada today. And like, I just changed. I, I moved in and was like, shit's got to change if you guys don't want me to kill everyone. Like, and they were willing and they were accepting and they were amazing about it. And then we finally said, okay, well, like, is this, is this, we're good? We're like, I I said I used to say like I L you like I couldn't say love it freaked me out for a long time and then I finally said it and then that shithead said it like a month later and I was like that's not fair you should have said it at the same exact time I, I wanted the response yeah and um, he goes to treatment with me he whatever I need he knows that like hey it's more for like him and like how do I handle her yeah and um, then we moved out and we bought a house. And then he took a sweet ass time. We were dating for four years before we were engaged. Cause just to be sure the crazy wasn't too crazy, he waited right. four years on that. A smart man. Right? Yeah. You or me. you can you could say he's just a terrified of commitment, but both. A little bit of both. Hey, when you were the guy on the posters that all the girls sign up to yeah, that send all the dirty pictures, fucking why are you giving that up? Is it's easy. Yeah. Commitment is a real commitment then. Yeah. Okay. This is the, the Jaco reset. <sighs> We talked about Brass and Unity a little bit. What's the long-term mission, goal, and dream of your company and the podcast of the same name? So for me, what I've been trying to do with this company is create a community that can really work together to not only help vets, first responders, but to really bridge the gap with the civilian population and letting them know what we kind of go through and why it is such a epidemic and why there is over 22 suicides a day and we are losing people like it's going out of style like the the amount of vets that are questioning the last 20 years of their life right now is is terrifying the you know i work with organizations that are doing this outreach and they're overloaded right now like they have never seen before because this whole thing is just it's hit ahead here and so what brass and unity tries to do is it is really just a vehicle to get the money in the hands of the people that are doing the work with it. I couldn't start a nonprofit because I'm not good at fundraising. I'm not good at being like, give me your money. I'm going to do this with it. The least I could do was come up with a product that I know I could give to people or people could purchase. And if I gave pretty much all of the pro, like the, the actual um, profit from it to those organizations and I give them something to wear that is a touch piece or if they're out and somebody sees a bullet on the wrist, they go, hey, what is that? It's a conversation starter. And that's exactly what it's been. And it's it's done its job as that. And so we, like I said, we are a way to get the vehicle. We're the vehicle. We're the money in the hands of the people. People don't always want to just get a tax receipt. It's great to donate to something. It's great on you to do that. But most people have a selfish aspect, right? Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But if you can tap into that, you can then fund these charities properly and give them the tools to do their jobs effectively. Up until this point, they just count on people's goodness of their hearts. Hate to break it to you. Humanity's rough right now. We need to look at something a little differently. So the, these things spark, like a jewelry sparks conversations. And right. then and then do, do you work with charities? Yes. Oh God, yeah, that's what I do. So my whole mission every day is I get up, I push jewelry and sunglasses on people and say, but now that you're going to wear that, now you're a part of the BNU army. Now you're a part of this community. This is speaking of which, let me uh, let me, put, let me yeah, put it put them, put them right back on. Gosh. Branded. This is a uh, organic product placement. Yeah, this isn't like marketing <laughs> at all. Nothing weird about this at all. And so we work with a lot of organizations, and I'm very particular about where we send our money because there are. It feels like 
thousands of vet organizations right now. And if we were able to consolidate, it would be more ideal. I spoke about that on another show, but that's not currently happening. So I try to work with the nonprofits I know, number one, are not paying six-figure salaries, which trust me, there's lots, a lot. Number two, I look at the actual resources that they're providing and if they're going to be something that are going to be useful, in my opinion, whether or not they're actually useful and I just don't think they are, that's a, that's up for debate. I know it's worked for me, so I try to fund the things that I know have been helpful for me and the people I associate with. So that's why I brought all the paper because I didn't want to be an idiot and forget anybody that's really important because I get caught up in things and I think it's important to acknowledge. So number one, hero heroic hearts. Mm -hmm. um, we just started working um, to talk about them and really make them known, but we're going to be donating to them as well. Are they doing uh, more stuff than the ayahuasca thing? Yeah, it's, so it's just... their points are, I got Jesse to actually, I'm like, what are your talking points? Because I need people to know exactly what you do. Great. So veterans have had to take their mental and general health into their own hands due to the failure of the government system. So that is why they were created. But Heroic Hearts is a peer-supported mental health network involving full preparation, integration coaching, and connection to vetted psychedelic treatments. So they don't just do Aya. They deal with psilocybin, ketamine, um, ibogaine, but they're, they've got protocols in place. They've got locations you go to that are safely vetted and they work. They've got over right now, Jesse said they have 800 veterans on a waiting list for treatment. That's just before the spike of the end of this war. Um, they have over 100, they've helped over 100 veterans, including dozens of special operation vets find effective care. They've now got branches in the US, UK and Canada. And the, the biggest thing about them and why we talk about them is because the problem of psychedelics and the stigma around it is so significant, but because of great universities that are now stepping up and doing the research behind it, it is being legitimized. So like they're doing that in Canada, there's a group called Theracil. They are currently fighting the government to get the rights for Canadians under section 56 of our laws to get compassionate care for psilocybin use. I've done a panel with them on that really great base out of um, Victoria, really smart people. One of the other bigger charities that we work with, and they're honestly, they were my first and foremost charity that I ever worked with. And they're a big component in the veteran community in Canada. Um, they're called Honor House. And Honor House was started by Honorary Colonel Al de Genova. It was started because of a guy named Trevor Green. He was a Canadian soldier who deployed. And he was, sorry, Captain Trevor Green. Sorry, Trevor. Captain Trevor <laughs> Green. Um, he got an ax in the middle of his head. Um, a Taliban member came up and put an ax directly into his head when his helmet was off and he survived. He's done work with uh, Invictus Games and Prince Harry. He has an exoskeleton he uses on the island. He's the he's so cool. He hasn't changed one bit from like the infantry captain he you expect him to be. And it was Al saw there was a need for vets and first responders to get treatment because there's no real home away from home for people. Picture Ronald McDonald for cancer and families. This is vets and first responders. And so their whole thing, and I'll read it so I say it exactly right, because I used to be on the board of their charity, but I mm. ran out of time, so now I just consult. But um, they are a home away from home for members of the Canadian Armed for Forces, veterans and first responders and their families to stay completely free of charge while they're receiving medical care and treatment in the uh, Vancouver area. But since then, they've expanded, since I've come on board, and they've opened Honor Ranch, which is up in Ashcroft, B.C., and it's 140 acres, it's 10 cabins, and a main cabin. They do equine therapy, and they're more focused on operational stress injury clinics. So, sorry, operational stress injury within the veteran community. And they have specialists that do that. They have uh, they have their own bracelet with us. So every time you buy an Honor House bracelet, all the proceeds go to them. They, yeah, and it's actually the green one. So that one, so when you buy one of those Honor House bracelets, they have those, they go directly to them which is really amazing. They've been near and dear to my heart for a long time. You've got the All Secure Foundation, which is, these guys are these guys are super dope. I'm going to read exactly because Jen texted me. So Jen and Tom Satterley, I've had them both on the podcast. Tom was involved in Black Hawk Down. Tom is a Delta. Have you heard of them? Black, what? Uh, no, of, of, um, no, no. So, okay. So Tom was involved in Black Hawk Down. It was one of his first operations. <laughs> He's a Delta operator. And I asked her, I said, listen, I'm going to be doing these shows and I think it's great that we talk about you more. So I said, give me your three points of importance. Mm -hmm. So the All Secure Foundation, 
serves special operations combat families in healing from post-traumatic stress injury and secondary post-traumatic stress. So that's often what the wife or the other husband or the other spouse mm -hmm. suffers from. And we're starting to see that be more and more of an issue now. So they also are devoted to rebuilding the couple's relationships on the home front after the separations of war. And 80% of their warriors went on, went, um, yeah, 80% of their warriors want their families to be more involved with the healing. The problem is, is very often vets don't realize that they can have, or just because the system doesn't pay for it, actually have their spouse as a part of things. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that we find with special operations families, I think the divorce rate's like 95%. Oh. And so they work so hard with these families. They take them on retreats, these husband and wives, and they get them to connect again after being separated over such a long period of time. There's other places like Children's of Fallen Patriots out of D.C. where they fund education, um, university for people who have lost their parents mm -hmm. um, in deployments, whether their kid's even born yet. If they're still in utero, they still pay. They do not care. Then you've got people like um, in Canada, you've got Vets Canada, You've got in the States, you've, you know, you got True Patriot Love. You've got, um, who else in the States is really great that we've worked with? I know there's a Green Beret Foundation. That's great. One More Wave gives amputees, teaches them to surf with it, with amputees. Like they're really great. There's so many organizations, but at the end of the day, I focus on a small subset because you cannot fix everyone's problems. The least thing, the, the least you can do for people is focus. If you can provide focus, you can provide the proper amount of funding. The proper amount of funding can get the proper amount of tools. Those tools can actually be implemented properly. And then those people can go on to hopefully have successful marriages and families. And we don't have to watch our parents drink themselves to death and wonder why daddy's yelling at mommy all the time and daddy storms out and leaves. Well, daddy had some shit happen in his life and mommy had some shit happen, but that does not mean that's who they are. And yes, yeah, so, so trauma has completely destructive effects on family and relationships correct. and like correcting that has like ripple effects. Oh, just long time. Yeah. astronomical ripple effects because the problem is we are so quick to tell people they're suffering from PTSD. We're so quick to give them drugs. We're so quick to kick them out of the military. We're so quick to let them be homeless on the street. We're so quick to let them fucking kill themselves. We're so quick... And then all of a sudden, when when a politician goes, veteran suicide's an issue, that's when it's a problem. Well, if you prevent the problem from happening in the first place, or you give people the right funding and tools to do the job, you won't have this problem. It's kind of loyalty is referring to a, a connection with something outside of yourself. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you've spoken about like existentialism or even just atheism in general as um as leading naturally to an, an individualism, as a focus on the on the self, and uh, ideas that maybe the Christian faith can um, instill in you is um, allowing you to sort of look outside of yourself. So connection, I mean, loyalty fundamentally is about other beings, uh, and yeah, uh, other beings. And I mean, I, th I think I don't know what it is in me, but I'm very much drawn to that idea. And um, I think humans in general are drawn to that idea. You can you can make all kinds of evolutionary arguments, all that kind of stuff. But uh, people always kind of tease me because uh, I talk about love a lot. <laughs> and I mean, there's a lot of um, non-scientific things about love, right? Like, what well, what the heck is that thing? Why why do we even need that thing? It, uh, it seems to be an annoying burden that uh, <laughs> that we we get so much uh, joy in in life from a connection with other human beings deep. Uh, lasting connections with human beings. Same thing with loyalty. Why Why do we get so much value and pleasure and strength and meaning from loyalty, from a connection with somebody else, uh, going through uh, thick and thin with somebody else, going through some hard times? I mean, some of the, you know, the closest friends I, I have is going through some, some rough times together. And that, that seems to make life deeply meaningful. Uh, what is that? So it, yeah, um, I, uh, that's uh, that resonates with me, and I obviously I would I would affirm it. Um, I, I think just to just to correct the implication that you made, I I don't think it's necessarily the con the consequence of atheism uh, that we that we lose track of those kinds of things. I I, I mean I think that atheists can be loyal. Okay, if you like. Right. Um, 
the question more often comes up in the context of, you know, where does morality come from? Mm. And loyalty, I think, and duty are related to one another. You know, if we have loyalty to someone, then we have a duty to them, okay, as well. And I think that insofar as we see ourselves as having some kinds, any kinds of duties or moral compulsions with respect to our relationships to other people, it's a, I think it's a question that always arises. Well, where does these, where do these come from? And there, there are various approaches that people have towards deciding what makes ethics or, or morality moral. Okay. But I do think it's the case that um, it's very hard to ground morality um, in, a, in any kind of absolute way or a persuasive way um, in mere human relationships. And so it's certainly the case that in Christianity, um, there is a sense in which um, morality and you know the morality of morals comes from a transcendent place, from a, a transcendent deity, and that we um, that we ground our the compelling force of of morals on God uh, more than we do on individuals, because after all, you know, if it if you if you've got nothing but you know other people, why should you you know? treat your neighbor well? Why shouldn't you defraud your neighbor if it's good for you? Well, you know, you can construct all kinds of arguments, and some of them are, you know, obviously arguments that are commonplace in religion too. You should do as you would be done by and all this kind of thing. Right. But none of that seems any, any more than mere pragmatism to most people, okay? And so that's what, that's one of the things if, if you, that Nietzsche, amongst others, you know, really identified, you know, if God is dead, if, if the idea of God as grounding our moral behavior is no longer viable in the West, which Nietzsche thought that it wasn't, okay, then what does ground it? And, and he had no good answer for it. In fact, he claimed there was no answer, but then he couldn't live with that. And so he invented the idea of the Ubermensch, you know, this, this superior human being, okay? And this was uh, a different way of trying to ground morality, not a very successful one. You know, you could argue that it's the forerunner of the sort of uh, racism of Hitler's regime and, and, and so forth um, that, you know, we've in the West, thankfully, shied away from uh, in the in the past uh, uh, half or three quarters of a century, but um, you know, I think it is the case that uh, Christianity gives me a basis for my moral beliefs that is more than mere pragmatism. Yeah, but there, there is a um, so stepping outside of all of that. There, there does seem to be a powerful stabilizing, like we humans are able to hold ideas together, like in a distributed way, uh, outside of uh, whether God exists or not, or any that, just our ability to kind of converge together towards a set of beliefs uh, into, sometimes into tribes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, um, I don't know if it's inherent to being human beings. I'm, I hope not, because now if I look on Twitter uh, and there's, a, there's a, the red team and the blue team, Right, it, it, it's, it's almost like uh, it's it's a care it's some kind of TV show that we're living in, uh, that people get into these tribes and they hold a set of beliefs that sometimes don't. Um, I mean, they they are beliefs for the sake of holding those beliefs, and we get this intimate connection between each other for sharing those beliefs. And we spoke to the the things about loyalty and love, and that's the thing that people feel inside the tribe, and it seems very human that within that tribe, those beliefs don't necessarily always have to be connected to anything. It's just the fact that, uh, you know, I've uh, did sports uh, uh, my whole life. And whenever you're on a team, the bond you get with, with other people on the team is incredible. And the actual sport is, is often the silliest. I mean, I don't play ball sports anymore, but the ball when I played like soccer or tennis, I mean, all those sports are silly, right? You're you're <laughs> playing with a little ball, but there's the bond you get is so deeply meaningful. So I I just 
it's interesting to me on the, on the sociological level that um, it's it's possible to me whatever the beliefs of religion is, um, whatever they're actually grounded in, they they might be uh, they might have a power in themselves. I think there is tribalism everywhere, and uh, I think tribalism in the U.S. at the moment is rather difficult to bear from right. my point of view, um, and it's. I think fed by the internet and social media and so forth, but but it's but historically tribalism has has been a trait and remains a trait in humans. The genius of Christianity is that it supersedes tribalism. I mean, yes, when the, the Hebrews um, thought about Yahweh, initially they thought about him as their tribal deity, just like the tribal deities round about about them. And so, but and and yet from you know early on in Hebrew history, the crucial thing that Yahweh came to mean, or I would say revealed of himself to them, was that he wasn't just a tribal deity, he was the God that created the whole thing. And if he is the God of the whole thing, then he's not just the God of the Hebrews, or in the case of, you know, uh, Americans, God is not just the God of Americans, he's the God of everybody, okay? And that is a way, in a way, the most amazing um, transcending of tribal loyalties. And uh, one of the crucial, you know, occasions in the New Testament um, you know, when, when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, um, you know, the, the, the apostles and the, and the disciples speak in other tongues, and there are people from all, all the countries, you know, round about, hear them in their own languages. And so, you know, whether, whether you take that as factual or not, that is the, a statement of the transcendent um, aspects of Christianity, or the claimed transcendent aspects of Christianity, that it transcends culture. And that's certainly something which I find appealing. When I kind of uh, touch on this topic in my own mind, uh, is it possible to create an AI system that you fall in love with, and it falls in love with you, and you have a romantic relationship with it, or a deep friendship, let's say? I would hope that that is the design criteria for any of these systems. If we cannot have a meaningful relationship with it, then it's still just a chunk of silicon. So then what is meaningful? Because um, back to sugar. Well, sugar doesn't love you back, right? So the computer has to love you back. And what does love mean? Well, in this context, for me, love, I'm going to take a page from Alain de Botton. Love means that it wants to help us become the best version of ourselves. Yes. Um, that's that's beautiful. I, <clears throat> that's a beautiful definition of love. So, what what role does love play in the human condition at the individual level and at the group level? Because you were kind of saying that humans, we should really consider humans both at the individual and the group and mm -hmm. the societal level. What's the role of love in this whole thing? We talked about sex. We talked about death. <laughs> thanks to the bacteria, they invented it. At which point did we invent love? By the way, I mean, is that is that also no? I think I think love is is the the start of it all, and the feelings of and this gets this is sort of beyond uh, just you know romantic, sensual, whatever kind of things, but actually genuine love as we have for another person, love as it would be used in a religious text, right? I think that capacity to feel love more than consciousness that is the universal thing our feeling of love is actually a sense of that generativity. When we can look at another person and see that they can be something more than, than they are and more than just what we, you know, a, a pigeonhole we might stick them in. We see, I mean, I think there's, in any religious text, you'll find um, voiced some concept of this, that you should see the grace of God in the other person, mm -hmm. right? You, that they're, they're made in the spirit of, of what, you know, the, the love that God feels for his creation or her creation. And so, I think this thing is actually the root of it. So I would say before I, I don't think I don't think molecules of water feel consciousness have consciousness, but there is some proto micro quantum thing of love that's the generativity um, when there's more energy than what they need to maintain equilibrium, and that when you sum it all up 
is something that leads to, I mean, I, I had my mind blown one day as an undergrad at the physics computer lab. I logged in and, you know, uh, when you log into Bash for a long time, there was a little fortune that would come out and it said, man was created by water to carry itself uphill. And I was logging in to work on some, you know, problem set and I logged in and I saw that and I just said, son of a bitch, you know, I just, I logged out uh, and I went to the coffee shop and I got a coffee and I sat there on the quad and like, you know, <laughs> it's not wrong and yet WTF, right? Uh, um, so when you look at it that way, it's like, yeah, okay, non-equilibrium physics is a thing. Um, and so when we think about love, when we think about these kinds of things, um, I, I would say that in the modern day human condition, there's a lot of talk about freedom and individual liberty and rights and all these things, but that's a, and that's very Hegelian. It's very kind of following from the Western philosophy of of the the individual as as sacrosanct, but it's not really couched. I think the the right way because it should be how do we maximize people's ability to love each other, to love themselves first, to love each other, their responsibilities to the previous generation, to the future generations. Those are the kinds of things that should be our design criteria, right? Those should be what we start with to then come up with the philosophies of self and of rights and responsibilities. Um, but that that love being at the center of it, I think when we design systems for cognition, um, it, it should absolutely be built that way. I think if we simply focus on efficiency and productivity, these kind of very uh, industrial era, um, you know, all, all the things that Marx had issues with, right? Mm -hmm. Those that's that's a way to go and and really I think go off the deep end in the wrong way. So one of the interesting consequences of thinking of life in this hierarchical way of an individual human and then there's groups and there's societies is uh, I believe that you believe that corporations are people. <laughs> So this is a this is a kind of a politically dense idea and all those kinds of things. If we just throw politics aside, if we throw all of that aside, mm -hmm. in which sense do you believe that corporations are people? So, um, and how does love connect to that? Right. So the belief is that groups of people have some kind of higher level, I would say, mesoscopic claim to agency. I, I, you know, so, so where do I, you know, let's, let's start with this. Most people would say, okay, individuals have claims to agency and sovereignty nations. We certainly act as if nations. So at a very large, large scale, nations have rights to sovereignty and agency. Like everyone plays the game of modernity as if that's true, right? We believe France is a thing. We believe the United States is a thing, but to say that groups of people at a smaller level than that, um, like a family unit is the thing. Well, in our law, in our laws, we actually do en encode this concept. Uh, I believe that um, in a relationship, in a marriage, right, one partner can sue for loss of consortium, right, if someone breaks up the the marriage or, or whatever. So these are concepts that even in law, we do respect that there is something about the union and about the family. So for me, I don't think it's so weird to think that groups of people have a right to a claim to rights and, and sovereignty. Of some degree, I mean, we and we we uh, look at our clubs, we look at churches. These are we we talk about these collectives of people as if they have a, a real agency to them, and and they do. But I think if we take that one step further and say, okay, they can accrue resources. Well, yes, check. You know, and by law they can. Um, they can own land. They can uh, engage in contracts. They can do all these different kinds of things. So we, in legal terms, uh, support this idea that groups of people have rights. Um, where we go wrong on this stuff is that the most popular version of this is the for-profit absentee owner corporation that then is able to amass larger resources than anyone else in the landscape, anything else, any other entity of equivalent size. And they're able to essentially bully around individuals, whether it's laborers, whether it's people whose resources they want to capture. They're also able to bully around our system of representation, which is still tied to individuals, right? So um, I don't believe that's correct. I don't think it's good that they, you know, they're people, but they're assholes. I don't think that corporations as people acting like assholes is a good thing. But the idea that collectives and collections of people that we should treat them philosophically as having some 
agency, some agency and some some mass um, at a mesoscopic level. I think that's an important thing because one one thing I do think we underappreciate sometimes is the fact that relationships have relationships. So it's not just individuals having relationships with each other, but if you have eight people seated around a table, right? Each person has a relationship with each of the others, and that's obvious. But then if it's four couples, each couple also has a relationship with each of the other couples, right? The dyads do. And if it's couples, but one is the the uh, you know father, mother, older, and then you know one of their children and their uh, spouse, mm -hmm. that that family unit of four has a relationship with the other family unit of four. So the idea that relationships have relationships is something that we intuitively know in navigating the social landscape, but it's not something I hear expressed like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not something that is, I think, taken into account very well when we design these kinds of things. So I think um, the reason why I care a lot about this is because I think the future of humanity requires us to form better sense make collective sense making units at something you know around Dunbar number you know half to five x Dunbar, and that's very different than right now where we um, defer sense making to massive aging zombie institutions, um, or we just do it ourselves. We go it alone. Go to the dark force of the internet by so, ourselves. So that's really interesting. So you've you've talked about agency, I think maybe calling it a convenient fiction at all these different levels. So even at the human individual level, it's kind of a fiction, we all believe, because we are, like you said, made of cells and cells are made of atoms. So that's a useful fiction. And then there's nations, that seems to be a useful fiction. But it seems like some fictions are better than others. You know, there's a lot of people that argue the fiction of, of nation is a bad idea. One of them lives two doors down from me, Michael Malice, he's an anarchist. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are into meditation that believe the idea, this useful fiction of agency of an individual is uh, troublesome as well. Mm -hmm. We need to let go of that in order to truly like to transcend, I don't know, I don't know what, what words you wanna use, but suffering or to, uh, to elevate the experience of life. So, you're kind of arguing that, okay, so we have some of these useful fictions of agency. We should add a stronger fiction that we tell ourselves about the agency of groups in the hundreds of uh, the uh, half a Dunbar's number, or five X Dunbar's number. Yeah, something on that order. And we call them fictions, but really they're rules of the game, right? Rules that we 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 feel are fair or rules that we consent to. I always question the rules when I lose, like at Monopoly. That's when I usually question the rules. When I'm winning, I don't question the rules. We should play a game Monopoly someday. There's a trippy version of it that we could do. What what kind of? What, uh, what contract you? Monopoly is introduced by a friend of mine to me, where you can write contracts on uh, future earnings or landing on various things. And you can hand out like, you know, you can land first three times, you land on park places free or whatever. Just And then you can start trading those contracts for money. <laughs> and then you create a human civilization uh, and somehow Bitcoin comes into it. Okay, uh, but some of these- Actually, I, I bet if me and you and Eric sat down to play a game of Monopoly and we were to make NFTs out of the contracts we wrote, we could make a lot of money. Now it's a terrible idea. Yes. I would never do it, yeah. but I bet we could actually sell the NFTs Good. around. I have other <laughs> ideas to make money that, that, that I could tell you and they're all terrible ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, including cat videos on the internet. <laughs> okay, but some of these rules of the game, some of these fictions are, it seems like they're better than others. They've worked this far to cohere um, human, to organize human collective action. But I'll you're saying way. something about, especially this technological age requires m modified fictions, stories of agency. Why the Dunbar number? And also, you know, how do you select the group of people? You know, Dunbar numbers, I think, it, it, I have the sense that it's overused as a kind of law that somehow we can have deep human connection at this scale. Like some of it feels like an interface problem too. Mm -hmm. It feels like if I have the right tools, I can deeply connect with a large number, larger number of people. Mm -hmm. It just feels like uh, there's a huge value to interacting just in person, getting mm -hmm. to share traumatic experiences together, or beautiful experiences together. But there's other experiences like um, that in the digital space that you can share. It just feels like Dunbar's number could be expanded significantly, perhaps not 
to to the level of millions and billions, but mm -hmm. it feels like it could be expended. So how, yeah. how, how do we find the right interface, you think, um, for uh, having a little bit of a collective here that has agency? You're right that there's many different ways that we can build trust with each other. Yeah. Um, my friend Joe Edelman talks about a few different ways that, um, you know, mutual appreciation, trustful conflict, um, just experiencing something like, you know, there's a variety of different things that we can do, but um, all those things take time and you have to be present. The less present you are, I mean, there's just, again, a no free lunch principle here. The less present you are, the more of them you can do, but then the less the less connection you build. So I think there is sort of a human capacity issue around some of these things. Now, that being said, if we can use certain technologies, so for instance, if I write a little monograph on my view of the world, you read it asynchronously at some point, and you're like, wow, Peter, this is great. Here's mine. I read it. I'm like, wow, Lex, this is awesome. We can be friends without having to spend 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, figuring all this stuff out together. We just read each other's thing and be like, oh yeah, this guy's exactly in my wheelhouse and vice versa. And we can then, um, you know, connect just a few times a year and maintain a high trust relationship. It can be expanded a little bit, but it also requires, these things are not all technological in nature. It requires the individual themselves to have a certain level of capacity, to have a certain um, lack of neuroticism, right? If you want to use like the, the ocean big five sort of model, people have to be pretty centered. The less centered you are, the fewer authentic connections you can really build for a particular unit of time. It just takes more time. Other people have to put up with your crap. Like there's just a lot of the stuff that you have to deal with if you are not so well balanced, right? So yes, we can help people get better to where they can develop more relationships faster. And then you can maybe expand Dunbar number by quite a bit, but you're not gonna do it. I think it's gonna be hard to get it beyond 10X, kind of the rough swag of what it is, you know? Right. <laughs> Mostly, I like to talk to your own about his ideas, and I don't want to talk about Ayn Rand, but I want to say something. Just, just one, one thing about Ayn Rand. Sure. Uh, all my kids, all my kids r read Ayn Rand's books. My father read The Fountainhead. I don't know, like, you know, like we we, we know Ayn Rand, and um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, it is incredibly difficult reading for me. It's 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 painful. It's painful to read. Why is it painful? Not because I disagree with the uh, with with the view of of trading and business and the creativity of it and and you know and and Reardon metal. I mean, I, sure. you know that stuff that stuff uh, moves me and 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 I I do admire it. But to read you know a, a book that's a thousand pages long, in which nobody nobody is having children. Nobody is having a stable marriage. No one is running a uh, an admirable government that's fighting for a just cause. Anywhere, anywhere, you're on. I, I, it. I feel. I just. I feel like like it's focusing on one aspect of what it is to be human and to flourish, and that everything else is just erased and th thrown out as though it's just not part of reality. And I'm scared. I'm scared of what happens to, to, to teenagers who hormonally are in any case. No, that, that's their, they're programmed to, to, uh, to pull away from the, their parents and experiment with things. They're, they're, they're biologically programmed to do that. And you give them a book which says, look, you, you don't, you don't have to have a family. You don't have to raise children. You don't have to have a country. You don't have to fight for anything. All you have to do is assert yourself in trade. I, I I think it's destructive because it's not realistic. It's just not real. But I got none of that for mine, Red. I got none of that for mine, Red. Uh, you, you know, it, it, the, the, the books were not about a family. Uh, you could write a book in, in Ayn Rand style about uh, where, where, where people have a family, but the, the goal, the purpose, it's a novel. It's not, it's a novel which is delimited with, with a particular story. There's one family in Gulch Gulch, and there's a little passage about raising children and the value of that, uh, because it's not core to what she is writing about. But that doesn't exclude it. I now, When I read Ayn Rand, I read Atlas Shrugged when I was 16, and I read it over over the years, uh, several times more, it never occurred to me. Oh, Ayn Rand's anti-family. I shouldn't have a family. It that that thought never came into my mind. I, I always wanted to have children. I continue to want to have children. Uh, I, I thought of it a little differently. I thought of how I would find a partner a little bit differently. I thought about what I would look for in a partner differently. 
but not that I wouldn't want to get married. One question I, I have is uh, what effect it has on society, so outside of you. So, for example, you mentioned love should be conditional. I think. Well, it is. Whether you like it or not, it is. You might pretend that it isn't, but it's always conditional. Well, let me try to say something and see if it makes any sense. So, could there be things that are true, like love is conditional, is always conditional, that if you say it often, it has a negative effect on society. So for example, I mean, uh, so maybe I'm just a romantic, but good luck saying love is conditional to a romantic partner. I mean, you could, I would argue en masse, that would uh, deteriorate the quality of relationships. Uh, if you remind the partner of that truth that is universal, like you, you have to, the, 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 I mean, okay, maybe it's just me, I'll just speak to myself. It's like, there is a certain romantic notion of unconditional love. It's part of why you have so many destructive marriages. It's, it's part of why- <laughs> so you say that's a problem. Yes, it's a, it's a real problem because, because yes, there, there is a, you all talked about honoring your spouse and, and, and there's a real truth there. And I, I, I respect that. Yes, you have to do certain things. Love is not, you, you marry somebody, and there's a real attitude out there in the culture. You marry somebody, and okay, now we're gonna, we're just gonna cruise. It's just- Right, Hollywood, that, uh, that's the Hollywood marriage. You know, yep. marriage is work. It, 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 like all values, it's work. It, it's something you have to reignite every day. You have to, you have to the challenges, the real disagreements, the, 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 the things you, you, you fight about, you disagree about. And, and there's real, if it's a value, you work it out. You, 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 you struggle through it. You, 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 and, and sometimes you struggle through it and you come to a conclusion, nah, this is not going to work. And, and you dissolve a marriage. And I'm, I'm all for dissolving after really, really fighting for it. Because if it's an important value and if you fell in love with this person for a reason, then that's something worth fighting for. I have a feeling that Hollywood goes the other way, but it's not this cruising along and everything. Everything is easy. No human relationship is like that. Not friendship. Not love. Not 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 raising children. Not being a child. Right. Um, it, you know, they require work and and they require thinking and they require creating the conditions to thrive. And that's the sense in which it's it's conditional. You you have to work at it, and uh, it it it's and and it's very easy not to do the work and it's very easy to drift away and i think most people don't do the work most people take it and and generally in life they they the only place people seem to work is at work <laughs> and then they take the rest of their life as i'm going to cruise and yet every aspect of your life the art you choose the friends you choose the lovers you choose all require real thinking and real work to be successful at them none of them are just are just there because there is no such thing as just the intrinsic. Right. I agree with all of that. I was going to say before that, that the rabbis have this uh, sort of shocking expression, uh, tzar gidul mm -hmm. the, 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 the pain of raising, raising of raising children. And uh, I, I find when I speak to audiences about relationships, I find that that in general, and this is a, this is cross-cultural, it's with different countries, different religious backgrounds, that in general, young people do not know that the only way to make a marriage work is through a lot of pain and overcoming. They don't know that raising children involves a great deal of pain. They don't know that caring for and helping your parents approach the end of their lives causes a great deal of pain. Mm -hmm. And and e everything is kind of this sketchy, you know, ver very sketchy, glimpsy kind of, and I, I mentioned Hollywood just because it, you know, it, 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 it everything is is made to look easy, except you know there's kind of a funny breakdown of something. But then it, you know, maybe no, there's no, a divorce. No. They, they, you know, they shoot one another, so that's so then they should get divorced. <laughs> but, but the the reality of of how hard it is to do, and how heroic it is to to do it, and then overcome, and then actually in the end achieve mm -hmm. something, create something that that was really. It's almost it's almost not it's almost not discussed and and so I, look to me it's just not surprising that it, it, if 
if there's no parallel to Ayn Rand about you know the, the the heroic saving of a marriage that was on the rocks, how does it actually happen? So, I, yeah. so, so, so it, it's the, a good the, point the, you're making, and, and but it, but it's something just came to me that I've never thought of before. So that's go always ahead, good. Go, go this is where conversation is good. <laughs> Look, it, it, take the Talmud in in in, in the Bible. I, I can't remember how many years after the Bible the Talmud is written. How many over how how long of a period it's written? How many people participating in writing it? Ayn Rand was one individual. She wrote a series of books in philosophy, which I think are, are true. And and but they're the beginning. There is a lot of work to be done. It's it, it, to to apply this. So uh, hopefully there will be one of her students who writes a book on relationships, and there'll be a, a, a somebody who writes a book on on developing a political theory in greater detail and and develop her, her ethics. She's got like. She's got she's got a few writings on ethics, and it's in the novels. But but there's a lot of work to be done fleshing it out. What does it mean? How do you? So to to say Ayn Rand didn't do everything is a truism. She didn't do everything. Okay, so what? But she laid this amazing philosophical foundation that allows us to take those principles and to apply them to all these realms of human life. And she does it on a scope that few philosophers in human history have done, because she does, goes from metaphysics all the way to aesthetics hitting the key. And she's an original thinker on each one of those things. And she might be right, she might be wrong on certain aspects of it. Always happy to have a debate about where, where, where she's wrong or where she's not. But there's a lot of work to be done, right? It, it's not like, and, and if, if, if there were objectivists out there who, who present it as, okay, human knowledge is over because Ayn Rand wrote these books. That's absurd, right? There's huge amount of work to be done in applying these particular ideas, just like there was for any philosophy. Take these ideas and now apply them to all these realms in human experience that flesh it out and make it. And one of the reasons I don't think objectivism has taken off is because there's all this work still to be done that allows it to be relatable to, to, to people in every aspect of them. Let me ask a hard question here. We've, we've got, we've taken Can I up... say what I agreed with you, Omar? Sure, sure. Please. This is good. <laughs> this would be a good transition. I, here, th this is the clip. This is, what, yeah, this, yeah, this, this is the clip. Here. I mean, I agree about nations. So I, I don't like the term nationalism because I, I, I fear of what happens when you put an ism at the end of- Anything. Any word. Any, yeah. Anything, yes. But, but the nation is, is a good thing. The, and, and having a diversity of nations, in a sense, is a good thing. And in this sense, in this sense, I don't think one can come up- So look, I, I, I said, I hold, that the, the ideal nation is a nation that protects individual rights. How do you do that? What are the details? How do we define property rights exactly in an internet world? There's gonna be disagreement, rational, reasonable disagreement. They're gonna be, in, in my future, in the 300 years from now, when my ideas are won finally, right? There will be multiple nations trying to apply the principle of applying individual rights and they'll do it differently. One of the, one of the benefits of federalism is that while you have a national government, there are certain issues that you relegate to states and they can try different things and learn because there is a huge value in imp the empirical knowledge comes there. You can't just deduce it all and figure it all out. You have to experiment. So I do, uh, I hate the idea of a one world, one world government because experimentation is gone. And if you make a mistake, everybody suffers. Yeah. I like the idea. And then I like the idea of people being able to, to choose where they live. But but this notion of experimentation, I think is crucial, but you need a principle. Uh, uh, this is, you need a principle. So I don't like the idea of nations if all the nations are gonna be bad, right? If all the nations are gonna be horrible, then I don't like it. What I like is a variety of nations all practicing basically good ideas. And then we try to figure out, okay, what works better than other things and, 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 and what is sustainable and what. Uh, so you kind of said this primary, the individual is, is, is primary and that was a great invention. But to, to me, it's not at all obvious that somehow that uh, the invention that humans have been practicing for a very long time of the stickiness of, uh, of community, of family, of love, it's that's that's not obvious to me. That's that's not also fundamental to human flourishing, and should be celebrated and protected. Of course it is. Now the I, I suppose the argument you're making is uh, when you start to let the state 
define what the stickiness, how the stickiness looks between humans. So you're really like the voluntary aspect. But I just want to sort of the 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 observation is humans seem to be pretty happy when they form communities. Uh, uh, however, you define that. So romantic partnership, family, some communities. Some communities, people, people are people are miserable in other communities. So the nature of the community matters, right? We we know this. We know that that some bondings are not healthy and not good for the individuals involved, and they and they don't thrive. Um, so I, I absolutely, I mean, I'm a lover, not a fighter, right? So I'm I'm a huge believer in love. The whole philosophy, I think, is a <laughs> is a love based philosophy. I fight in order to love, right? Mm. So it's it's. Yeah, love yeah. is love is at the core of all of this, and, and it's 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 a love of 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 life. It's a love of of the world out there, and it's a love of other people because they represent a value to you. It, it, so the stickiness is there. It's it's you know my point is a it should be chosen, it should be consciously chosen, and and this is I'm put aside the state, forget the state for a minute, forget forget coercion, forget all that. What I would encourage individuals to do, and this is where you know, I'm I'm not primarily a political, you know, interested in politics. Although <laughs> I tend to talk most about that, I'm primarily interested in human beings and how they live, in in a sense, in morality. And what I would urge individuals to do is to think about their relationships, to choose the best relationships possible, but to seek out great relationships because other human beings are an immense value to us, and and. You know, when I write, uh, you know, I, I, maybe you unquoted this or not, but I write that, that you know, about the trader principle and trading, you know, it's easy and, and, and obvious to think of it as a materialistic kind of thing. You know, I get, you know, uh, uh, I, I do the chores this day and my wife does the chores the other day and we're trading. But trading is much more subtle than that and much more, can be much more spiritual than that. It's about... The the, the 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 trading in in emotions it's about it's about the the way one uh, sees each other it's what what one gets from one another i think friendship is a form of trade now well, i know that that seems to make it material but i don't i don't think it's of trade as a material thing but friendship is incredibly important in life love is incredibly important in life uh, uh, you know uh, uh, having having a group of friends is incredibly important well, in life uh, all of these are sticky and important okay how can I try to be eloquent on this? So if you give people freedom, if you give people- Politics, yeah. Well, not politics, relations, relations, uh, relationships. So this is interesting because we have an interesting dynamic going on here in terms of beliefs. They're differing and so there was interesting overlaps, but there's a worry. If you look at human history and you study the lessons of history and you look at modern society, if you give people freedom in terms of stickiness and human relations and so on, full, like if you not give people freedom, emphasize freedom as the highest ideal, you start getting more Tinder, online dating, the stickiness dissolves just like in chemistry. You start to have a, a gas versus a liquid, right? That That's the way, so you have to, what you have to study what actually happens if you emphasize that um, the stickiness, the bonds of humans is holding you back. The exercise of voluntary choice is the highest ideal. The danger of that is for that to be Im implemented or interpreted in certain kinds of ways by us flawed humans that are not, I mean, you could say we're perfectly reasonable and rational, we can think through all of our decisions, but really, I mean, especially you young, you get horny and you make decisions that are suboptimal perhaps. So the the point is you have to look at reality of when you emphasize different things. So when you, when you, when you talk about what is the ideal life, what is the ideal relations, you have to also think like, what are you emphasizing? I think you both agree on what's important, uh, that community can be important, that freedom is important, but what are you emphasizing? And you're really emphasizing the individual and you're emphasizing, uh, Yoram, you're emphasizing more of the community, of the family, of the stickiness of the nation. Well, look, I don't want to deny the place of the individual. I, I think that, uh, that there really is a very great change in civilization when the books of Moses announce that the individual is created in the image of God. 
that that's a step that's as far as we know without pre precedent before that in history and uh to a very large degree i mean what one of the kind of unspoken uh things going on is that that uh Yaron and i really do agree on all sorts of things i th i think in part because because we're we're both jewish and and you so did you did say Yaron is mo basically moses yes sir <laughs> no i said he was channeling moses but, channeling. but that's still in my book you know that's that that's still pretty, pretty no, that's it's, a compliment that's though. pretty i, I took it as that, one <laughs> that for me, that's a compliment. And we'll talk but, about but, this a but, little so, bit just for the listener, just yeah. so they uh, they know Iran, uh, amongst many things, we'll talk about the virtue of nationalism, but uh, you're also a religious scholar of sorts, or at least uh, leverage the Bible for much, not much, but some of the wisdom in your life. Look, the way that Yaron looks at enlightenment, or maybe at Ayn Rand, that, that, that's, that's the way that I see the uh, Hebrew scripture and and the tradition that comes from it, uh, it, it has the same kind of place in my life. And I I, I just I, I don't know how much we want to want to explore it, but I th I I think that uh, that the agreement that we do have about the positive value of the creative individual, the positive value of the individuals. Um, desire to improve the world, and 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 in my book, that means including his or her desire to improve his family, his 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 tribe, his congregation, his nation. But but it still comes from this kind of for you know what your own calls selfishness, I, the 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 desire to make things better for yourself. In Hebrew Bible and in Judaism. Th that just is a positive thing. Of course, it can be taken too far, but it it just is positive, and it doesn't carry these kinds of, uh, you know, you should turn the other cheek, you should give away your cloak, you should love your enemy. These kinds of Christian tropes do not exist in Judaism, and so it it just. Uh, but I I like listening to your your own. I do feel like he goes too far on various things, but but I also hear you know underneath it, I can sort of you know hear 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 the 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 Jewish current and the resistance to you know to uh to, to things that about Christianity that Jews offer. Well, Mari, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell me the story of how you two met? Well, um, my parents every summer would. Uh, go to the lake in, in Canada, and the place was called Turkey Point, which is on Lake Erie, and uh, just have a nice summer holiday there, water skiing, swimming, you know, sunbathing. This was back in the 60s, and I was sitting <laughs> on the pier with a few girlfriends and telling them my story, you know, and then all of a sudden I looked up, and I saw this figure in the distance coming onto the pier, now, we're all dressed in bathing suits and swimwear, and we're swimming and this, that, and the other. And here he comes, dark trousers. In fact, they were black, mm -hmm. white shirt, and a tie, and a nice straw one. kind of a Panama hat. <laughs> and, you know, so he was very, he stood out. Yeah. And uh, so I invited him to come and sit down. And so he continued to talk, and we just talked and talked and talked, and then later moved to the beach, and um, I think the next time I saw him, he was talking to another girl, and I thought, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah man, I know, <laughs> I was okay, okay, next. Yeah. Well, about six months later, I receive a letter, and uh, it's a letter from Roger, and then we start this lovely correspondence, and we just start writing, you know, in those days, you just wrote everything, mm -hmm. and uh and then the next summer, he was coming up again. He was on his way to Alaska. And um, he says, I would like to come by and see you. And I said, well, I'll be in the same place that I met you last year. And so when, we, when he came up this time, for some reason, Roger reached for my hand and I reached for his. And man, that was it. <laughs> it was like Spongy. love at for, first touch. That was love. It was just a, like a silence, you know, and a, oh my gosh. And we didn't even look at each other. It was just, oh my goodness, what happened here? Yeah. And I was the type of person, I never wanted to get married, not to, way, way, way down the road, never have any children. And I wanted to see the world first mm -hmm. and then do all that, you know. And um, But that was it. That was yeah, love. And you've been uh, together yeah. ever since. Yeah. Well, the thing is about the love that 
the two of you have for each other is they had to persevere through quite a heck of a journey. So how did uh, Roger's drug smuggling change the nature of your love and your relationship? Well, Lex, that remained steadfast. It uh, it endured. And um, since Roger's been home, I think we've rekindled the love that we had when we first met. <laughs> yeah, and, what, what? But yeah. but I think my faith, um, you know, my faith, my steadfast faith, and also the fact that Roger and I communicated. We wrote letters. You know, he he never complained. I know there were the children there. He never had mistreated me. I love this guy, <laughs> and we had a lot of experiences. It was just. Even he's though a I, good looking, charismatic. He's pretty, you know. Yeah, and he's advent- <laughs> he was adventurous, you know. And, and I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would you say that again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, it, it was just. I know. I you know. I missed him physically, but he was just. We were just so strong in spirit, you know. And um, we could talk to one another. Yeah. Well, what was it like? Uh, Roger, when you're a free man, seeing Mari for the first time in person again, I uh, I cried for three days. Mm-hmm. Everything I'd look at a picture of her. I came home and uh, there she prepared a meal for me, and uh, it was the old oak table that I'd redone, and the chairs the same one, and the green placemats, and the same china that we had, and the same silverware. And it just, just all of it just brought back the same paintings on the wall. It was just like unbelievable. After 35 years, she had all my clothes cleaned and my <laughs> shoes shining. Yeah. And, and I put the shoes on and I walked out on the strings on the, and the soles <laughs> came off. <laughs> but the shirts and all fit perfect yeah. and everything. So it was just wonderful. And just to, just to see her and then just to think about, see her picture of her 50th birthday or her 60th birthday or of her 70th birthday. And I wasn't there. Yeah. And the picture of her and with the children, it just, it was heartbreaking. And about the third day, I thought, man up, fellow. I mean, <laughs> you, yeah. you've got to. So uh, <clears throat> I got over and quit, quit, quit the, uh, quit the tears. But yeah. it, it was, it was, it was, everything was just pulsating with life. It was just unbelievable to get out of that place. It really was. Mm. Is there, uh, do you regret? The, the the drug smuggling that took uh, you away from the woman you love? Oh, yes. 100%. Just, you know, I, I wouldn't have done it again if, if you don't think you're going to get caught. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just, no, it's just I did it for money, and I had everything in the world I wanted before I did that. Mm-hmm. So the adventure, I mean, it was one heck of an adventure for the two of you. For the both of you, yes. Were you able to enjoy it, or was it always danger? Was what is was it always something that threatened your relationship, your love, your family? Or were you able to enjoy the adventure of it? You know, we all die. Life mm-hmm. is short, and to live that kind of adventure. Well, whenever I did the first loot, I got ten thousand dollars, <throat> and that was just about <laughs> that was just about two years' pay on the fire department take home, and I brought that home and. Uh, I put my hand over my mouth. I said, oh, "Shook it on the Roger, bed." I can't in believe this. Oh, money, Mari, like, oh my, what in the world? <laughs> and then Roger said, "Let's go have dinner." Yeah. And so we went to the little restaurant that we would norm we would go to, you know. And he said, "And don't you dare look on the right hand side of the of yeah. the menu." Yeah. He said, "Just order <laughs> anything you want." <laughs> and it was just as we were in the restaurant, you know, it was just we were giddy about it. Yeah, we were, I was giddy about it. and um, Were you afraid that, I mean, did you think about the fact that it's illegal and uh, Roger can end up in, in prison? Oh, yes. Did you guys talk about it? Well, I just, I kind of thought I was bulletproof. I mean, if they didn't catch you. I, I thought if they didn't catch you, you was all right. And it was hard to get you. I'd, Hard to catch you in, in the air. Yeah. So you never thought <laughs> hard to catch you in the air. I, like it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that if your friend told on you five years later, you'd still go to prison. Right. Yeah. That was a problem. I didn't know that. Did you Did you guys ever talk about walking away? I asked Roger to walk to to walk away, to and he says, "I can't, Mario, just now, you know." And then, of course, 
the the um, amount of people that he began to support the family and the gifts and the, the deals the, the deals yes the deals big ones yes and then you always wanted to what do you do with the money you know so you want to i guess you clean it up or you want to invest in a in an enterprise or in a business well it just doesn't work they know the source of it and they take it and run Every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. But he was very generous, extremely generous and benevolent. And and when I started, I I, uh, I would ask about it. I went to a lawyer and I, a good good peop- a number of people in, in California at that time wanted to legalize marijuana <clears throat> back in 1973. And I went to a lawyer and I says, Mr. Lawyer, I put $100 on the table. What, what would they do if I caught me? bringing marijuana across the border. He said, uh, if you have a criminal record? I said, no, I've never had a speeding ticket. Not, nothing, not, not even a traffic ticket. I said, he said, you work for the fire department? I said, yes, sir. He said, you'll get probation. The worst you'll do is you'll get one year and you'll spend four, four months raking leaves on a military base. Mm. So my mother and my father died some years before and I brought mother and baby sister came out and I took him down to Disneyland, and she said, what you doing, boy? I said, I'm hauling pot, Mom. <laughs> she said, how much you making? I said, I'm making $40,000 any day I want to go. And she said, what do they do if they catch you? And I told her what the lawyer said. Four months at the most, what reckon leaves. That's what do you think? She said, do you need a co-pilot, son? Yeah. Money is money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, um, so y- your relationship persevered through some – some big challenges. Is there advice you can give about what makes for a successful relationship? Oh, well, you know, I think the initial igniting <laughs> meeting someone, you know, yeah. that that's the love. That's it. And that 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 little fire just that fire just keeps burning and burning and burning. You can't put it out no matter what. Yeah. It's the the love fire. <laughs> But it gets difficult. It's it funny. does. It's funny, the love fire. So you're saying the love fire is all it takes to, to persevere through the difficulty. Well, no. I, well, that's a huge part of it. Yeah. And also, I c- contribute my my individual situation to, uh, in order to endure what we, the prison years, is my faith. Faith in God? Yes. And... Friends who were unconditionally still loved me no matter what. <laughs> yes. So, so you had love around you. I in did. General. And my children, yeah. they, you know, and that was a real purpose to guide them and to love them and to help them become citizens. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. well, what about soon. you, Roger? What, what advice would you give? I just don't know how to do it, but I, I do know that you have to work on a relationship. Mm-hmm. Mara and I have had problems. I mean, we could really. Did you guys get in fights? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Pretty regular. <laughs> but not, they don't let them laugh long. Yeah, yeah. You know, but certainly we are so different. We're, we're the same, and yet we're so different. Yeah. 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 Like little stuff? Little stuff, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it might be big, but I usually win her over, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but anyhow, I just feel like Mario was always. There, it was like she was my anchor. Yeah. I was coming home. I was always coming home to her and the children. Yeah. And you can see throughout my life, I'm working on getting there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you afraid for his life, by the way? Oh, yes. He's- oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. There were times. Yeah. But, you know, I had some, I had faith in him. He was an excellent pilot. For example, I always said, Roger, if the ship's going down, I'm jumping in the lifeboat with you because I know we're going to get to shore. You yeah. will save us. And so I had that, I have that faith in him. You know, I mean, he's, he's a man, but yet he's the one you want to get into the lifeboat yeah, with. Definitely. But then there is, uh, you know, Pablo Escobar, one of the most dangerous mm-hmm. humans in history. Plus the U.S. government, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> worse by far. Uh, very, very difficult. Uh, mm-hmm. Very difficult to get away. In terms of your faith, um, how has your faith helped you to be the woman you are in this relationship? In 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 seeing love the way you see it. Well, I think my faith gives me hope. I have lots of hope. It helps me to. Um, 
dwell on the good side. You know, when I ever I meet someone and there's some negative, I try to see why they are like that or what's the source of all that. And I try to pull out the good. I really do. Not that I'm a goody-goody, but that's what your faith does. You know, you see them as God sees us, mm -hmm. you know. How has he changed over the years? Roger, he, yeah. he's still the same. <laughs> Actually, I like him better now. <laughs> he's a little Calm. calmer. Yeah, yeah you know. less crazy. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and happy to be you know, at home or he'll say, Mari, I am just so happy to be with you here in this condominium. I'm content because I used to call him my homing pigeon. You know, I just have to let him fly. I couldn't. No, he has to fly, but he always came home. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Tim Dillon about Bukowski first, so let me continue on that tradition and ask you about something that Charles Bukowski said about love. You Wait, know? are we rolling? Yes. This... Oh, geez, no hello, no nothing. Nope. I thought I was robotic. <laughs> Bukowski said, love is a fog that burns away with the first daylight of reality. So, uh, Mark Norman, let me first ask you about love. Uh, what are your thoughts about love? You talk about your relationships quite a bit. Do you think love can last? I do, but I think it's work. Everybody wants love to be this prepackaged, perfect, euphoric thing, but it you gotta it's like a, a good body, you know? We're all born with a good body, but you gotta keep it in shape. And it's the same with a with a loving relationship. I think you uh Nobody wants to do the work. That's the problem. <laughs> you talked about I think you told a story about being unfaithful to a previous girlfriend or something like that. I think the story goes that you were like drifting apart. Who were you talking to? Bert Kreischer maybe or something, uh, something like that? Yeah, we, we were high school sweethearts, dated for like 12 years and then. So that wasn't love that. anymore. That was more like relation. That was like. It was yeah, comfort. It was routine. And uh, we just slipped into that kind of married life autopilot world and. uh I tried to break up, I think, and it didn't take. It was one of those things. Our lives are just so baked in. And then I think I uh, cheated and she caught me and it was ugly. And then we went to therapy to try to work it out. But it's it's much like a car that gets into a wreck. The door just never closed the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts about then um, commitment, like outside of love, marriage? I think it's an antiquated idea. I think it's kind of silly and unrealistic. And I think we're coming out of that as we get all polyamorous and non-binary and queefy and all this stuff. I think we're slowly moving away from that. But uh, I think a lot of the ladies, more majority women like marriage, like the idea of it. Like I'm in a, I'm, I'm a fiance now or whatever you call it. I'm oh, yeah. engaged. And I mean, she is just woo -wee, going hog wild. She's loving it. She's got the dress thing, pick a venue, flower, and she's she's deep in, whereas I feel guilty because I'm just like, ah, jeez. <laughs> Is it planned already? Yeah, When's the wedding? You see Squid Game? I'm just living life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, planned. It's in New Orleans. I'm from there. And uh, it's next year. Okay. Are you married? No. Single. Virgin? Uh, of course, yeah. I can't yeah. imagine. I bet you'd be great in bed. You're ripped. You uh, I the best hairline in podcasting. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I haven't tried yet, so we'll have to see. All right, well, let me know. Pretty big hog on you? <laughs> yeah, I could see you packing a crazy, crazy tool downtown. Mm -hmm. That matters to girls? Apparently, yeah. That's okay. all I hear about. <laughs> okay. Based on the comments in our previous conversation, I think a lot of people will be very disappointed, I should say, to learn that you are in fact married. <laughs> As they say, all the good ones are taken. Okay, so uh, I'm a fan of your husband uh, as well, Dan. He's a programmer, a musician, so I'm a man after my own heart. Can I ask uh, a ridiculously over-romanticized question of when did you first fall in love with Dan? It's actually, it's a really, it's a really romantic story, I think. So I was divorced by the time I was 26, 27, 26, I guess. And I was in my first academic job, which was Penn State University, which is in the middle of Pennsylvania, surrounded by mountains. So you have it's four hours to get anywhere, to get to Philadelphia, New York, Washington. I mean, you're basically stuck, you know. Um, 
And I was very fortunate to have um, a lot of other assistant professors who were hired at the same time as I was. So there were a lot of us. We were all friends, which was really fun. Um, but I was single and I didn't want to date a student. And there were no, and I wasn't going to date somebody in my department. That's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So. So even at 20, whatever you were, you were already wise enough to know that. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't call me wise at that yeah. age. But anyways, um, not sure that I would say that I'm wise now. But, um, and so um, after a you know, I was spending probably 16 hours a day in the lab because it was my first year and as an assistant professor and there's a lot to do. And I was also bitching and moaning to my friends that, you know, I hadn't had sex in I don't know how many, you know, months. And it was, I was starting to, you know, become unhappy with my life. And um, I think at a certain point, they just got tired of listening to me bitch and moan and <laughs> said, just do something about it then. Like, do you know, if you're unhappy. And so the first thing I did was I, I made friends with a sushi chef in town. And this is like a state college, Pennsylvania, in the early 90s was there was like a pizza shop and a sub shop and actually a very good bagel shop hmm. and one good coffee shop and maybe one nice restaurant. I mean, there was really, but there was a the second son of a Japanese sushi chef who was not going to inherit the restaurant. And so he moved to Pennsylvania and was giving sushi lessons. So I met this guy, the sushi, the sushi chef, and we decided to throw a sushi party at the coffee shop. So we basically, it was the goal was to invite every eligible bachelor really within like a 20 mile radius. Mm -hmm. We had a totally fun time. I wore an awesome crushed velvet burgundy dress. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful dress. Um, and I didn't meet any, I met a lot of friend, new friends, but I did not meet anybody. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll try the personals ads, which I had never used before in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, I first tried the paper personals ads. Like in the newspaper? Like in the newspaper. That didn't work. And then a friend of mine said, oh, you know, there's this thing called net news. So we're going, this is like 1992, maybe. Mm -hmm. So there was this anonymous, you could do it anonymously, so you would you would read, um, you could post or you could read ads, and then respond to an address which was anonymous, and you that was yoked to somebody's real address, and um, and there was always a lag because it was this like a bulletin board sort of thing. So at first, I read I read them over, and I decided to to respond to one or two and you know it was interesting sorry this is not on the internet yeah this is totally on the internet but it takes there's a delay of a couple of days or whatever yeah right right it's 1992 there's, there's no, no web web no pictures the, there's no pictures the web doesn't exist it's all done in ascii format sort of <laughs> um yeah. and you know but the ratio ascii yeah but the ratio of um men to women was like 10 to 1 i mean there were many more men because it was basically academics and the government. That was it. That was what, no, I mean, I think AOL maybe was just starting to become popular, but, um, and so the first uh, person I met told me that he was a, um, he worked, he was a scientist who worked for NASA and, um, yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, it turned out that he didn't actually. <laughs> yeah. This um, is how they brag is as like yeah. you uh, elevate your as opposed to saying you're taller than you are, you say like your position is higher. Yeah, and I actually I would have been fine dating somebody who wasn't a scientist. It's just that the, they have it's just that whoever I date has to j just accept that I am and right. that I'm I was pretty ambitious and was trying to make my career and you know, that's not that that's not an, I think it's maybe more common now for men to maybe accept that in their female partners, but at that time, not, not so Could common. Could be intimidating, I guess. Yes, I, I, that has been said. <laughs> and so, um, and so then the next one I actually corresponded with, and we actually got to the point of talking on the phone and we had this really kind of funny conversation where, you know, we're chatting and he said, he's, he introduces the idea that, um, you know, he's really looking for a dominant woman and 
I'm thinking, I'm a psychologist by training, so I'm thinking, oh, he means sex roles. Like, yeah. I'm like, no, I'm very assertive, and I'm glad yeah. you think that, you know, okay. Yeah. Anyways, long story short, that's not really what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, so, and I just, you know, that will just show you my level of naivete. Like, I was like, I didn't completely understand. But I was like, well, yeah, you know, no. <laughs> At one point, he asked me how I felt about him uh, wearing my lingerie. And I was like, mm. I don't even share my lingerie with my sister. Like, yeah. I don't share my lingerie with anybody, yeah. you know? N no. The third one I interacted with was a banker who lived in Singapore. And um, that that conversation didn't last very long because he made an analogy, I guess he, he made an analogy between me and a, character in the fountainhead mm. um the woman who's who's raped in the yeah. fountainhead and i was like okay that's not that's not a good that's it's not, not a good not no the, that's not a good one not that part Making not that scene a, not that scene so <laughs> then i um so then i was like okay you yeah. know what i'm gonna post my own ad and so i did i posted well first i wrote my ad and then i of course i checked it with my my friends who were all also assistant professors they're like my little greek chorus and then I posted it and I got something like, uh, I don't know, 80 something responses in 24 hours. I mean, it was very- Do you remember the pitch? Um, like how, how you, I guess, condensed yourself? I don't remember it exactly, although Dan has it. Okay. Um, but um, actually for our 20th wedding anniversary, he took our, our exchanges and he printed them off and put them in a leather bound book mm. for us to read, which was really sweet. Um, yeah, I think I was just really direct. Like, I'm almost 30, I'm a scientist, I'm not looking to, you know, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm looking for something serious and, you know. But the thing is, I, I forgot to say where my location was <laughs> yeah. and my age, yeah, which I forgot. Yeah. So I got lots of, I mean, I will say, so we, I printed off all of the responses and um, I had all my friends over and we were, you know, had a big, I made a big um, pot of gumbo and, we drank through several bottles of wine reading these responses. And I would say for the most part, they were really sweet, like earnest and genuine as much as you could tell that somebody's being genuine. I mean, it seemed, you know, there were a couple of really funky ones, like, you know, this one couple who told me that I was their soulmate, the two of them, then they were looking for, you know, a third person. And I was like, oh, okay. But mostly super, seemed, seemed like super genuine people. And so I chose five men to start corresponding with, and I was corresponding with them. And then about a week later, I get this other email. And okay, and then I post something the next day that said, okay, you know, thank you so much. And I'm going to, I answered every person back. But then after that, I said, okay, and I'm not going to answer anymore. You know, because it was, they were still coming in and I couldn't, you know, I have a job and, you know, a house to take <laughs> yeah. care of and stuff. So, yeah. um, and then about a week later, I get this other email. and. Um, he says, you know, he just describes himself like, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm a chef, I'm a scientist, I'm a this, I'm a this. And so I emailed him back and I said, you, you know, you seem interesting. You can write me at my actual address if you want. Here's my address. I'm not really responding. I'm not really responding to other people anymore, but you seem interesting. You know, you can write to me if you want. Um, and then he wrote to me uh, and uh, I... Um, then I wrote him back and I, it was a, it was a nondescript kind of email. And I wrote him back and I said, thanks for responding. You know, I'm really busy right now. I'm, I was in the middle of writing my first slate of grant applications. So I was really consumed. And I said, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. And so I did, I waited a couple of days until my grants were, you know, safe grant applications safely out the door. And then I emailed him back and then he emailed me. And then really across two days, we sent a hundred emails. And text only? Was there pictures or any of that? Text stuff? only. Text only. Wow. And then, so this was like a Thursday and a Friday. And then Friday, he said, let's talk on the weekend on the phone. And I said, okay. And he wanted to talk Sunday night. And I had a date Sunday night. So <laughs> I said, okay, sure. We can talk Sunday night. Um and then I was like, well, you know, I don't really want to cancel my date, so I'm just going to call him on Saturday. So I just called, I cold called him on Saturday. And yeah. a woman answered. Oh, wow. That's not cool. Not cool. <laughs> and uh, 
so she says, you know, hello. And I say, oh, you know, it's down there. And she said, sure, can I ask who's calling? And I said, it, tell him it's Lisa. And she went, oh my God, oh my God, I'm just a friend. I'm just a friend. I just have to tell you, <laughs> yeah, I'm just nice. a friend. And I was like, yeah. this is adorable, yeah, right? Is. She doesn't, yeah. and then he gets on the phone, not hi, nice to meet. The first thing he says to me, she's just a friend. So I was just uh, so funny. charmed, yeah. really, by the whole thing. So it was it was Yom Kippur. It was the Jewish um, uh, Day of Atonement that was ending, and they were baking cookies and going to a break fast. Yeah. So people, you know, as you know, fast all day, and yeah. and then they go to a party and they break fast. So uh, I thought, okay, I'll just um, I'll just you know cancel my date. So I did, and I stayed home, and we talked for eight hours. Um, and then the next night for six hours. And it basically, it just went on like that. And then uh, by the end of the week, he um, he flew to State College. And, you know, we had gone through this whole thing where I'd said, we're going to take it slow. We're going to get to know each other, right. you know. And then right. really by, I think we talked like two or three times, these like really long conversations. And then he said, I'm just going to fly there. And then, so, of course, there's, I don't even know that there were fax machines at that point. Maybe, maybe there were, but uh, I don't think so. Anyway, so he, we decide we'll exchange pictures. And um, so he, you know, I take my photograph and I give it to my secretary and I say to my secretary. Fax this. <laughs> I say that, say, send this priority mail. Priority mail. And he yeah. goes, okay, I'll send a priority mail. I'll make this priority mail. He's like, I know, priority mail. Okay. And then... uh so I get Dan's photograph in the in the mail, um, and um, you know it's it's him in a, in a in shorts, and you can see that he's probably somewhere like the Bahamas or something like yeah. that, and it's like cropped. So clearly, yeah. what he's done is he's taken a photograph where you know he's in in it with someone else who turned yeah. out to be his ex wife. So I'm thinking, oh, well, so this is awesome. You know, I, I've hit the jackpot. He's he's you know very appealing to me, very attractive, and um, and then you know my photograph doesn't show up and it doesn't show up. And, you know, so like one day and then two days and then, you know, he's, he's like, you know, you're, I said, well, I, I asked my, my secretary to send a priority. I mean, I don't know, you know, um, what he did. And, uh, and he's like, I said, I'm like, well, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to come. And he's like, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, we've had like five dates, the equivalent of five dates practically. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so he's supposed to fly on a Thursday or Friday, I can't remember. And uh, I get a call like maybe an hour before his flight's supposed to leave. And he says, hi. And I say, and it's just something in his voice, right? And I say, because at this point, I think I've talked to him like for 25 hours. I don't know. Yeah. And he says, hi. And I'm like, you got the picture. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, you don't like it. And he's like, well, <laughs> I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's your, I'm sure it's just not a good, you know, it's not, it's probably not your best. Oh no. You know, you don't, you don't have to come. And he's like, no, 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 I'm coming. Uh, and I'm like, no, you don't have to come. And he's like, no, no, I really want to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting on the plane. I'm like, you don't have to get on the plane. Um, He's like, no, I'm getting on the plane. And so I go down to my, I go, I'm in my office, this is happening, right? So I go downstairs to my, one of my closest friends who's still actually one of my closest friends. Um, who is one of my colleagues, and um, Kevin, and I say, Kevin, and I go to Kevin, I go, Kevin, 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 he doesn't like the photograph. And Kevin's like, well, which photograph did you send? And I'm like, well, you know the one where we're shooting pool? And he's like, <laughs> you yeah. sent that photograph? That's yeah. a horrible photograph. I'm like, yeah, but it's the only one that I had that was like where my hair was kind of similar to what it is now. And he's like, Lisa, <laughs> like, do I have to check everything for you? You, know? <laughs> like, you should not have sent that, yeah. you know? But um, still, he flew over. But so he flew. Where from, by the way? Uh, he was in. Part. He was in graduate school at Amherst. Amherst. Yeah, at um, UMass Amherst. So he flew, and um, I picked him up, and I, at the airport, and he was happy. So whatever the concern was was gone. Yeah. And um, I was dressed. You know, I carefully, carefully dressed. Were you nervous? I was really, really nervous, because I. I am not, I don't really believe in fate and I don't really think there's only one person that you can be with. But I think, you know, people who, some people are 
curvy. They're kind of complicated. And mm -hmm. so the number of people who fit them is maybe less than... I like it. Mathematically speaking, yeah. I got um, it. And so when I was going to pick him up at the airport, I was thinking, well, this could... I could be going to pick up the, the person I'm going to marry or not. I mean, like, I really... But I really, you know, like, our conversations were just very authentic and very moving and... Um, and we really connected and, and I really felt like he understood me actually, um, in, in a way that a lot of people don't. And, um, and, and what was really nice was at the time, um, you know, the airport was this tiny little airport out in a cornfield basically. And so driving back, to the town, we were in the car for 15 minutes completely in the dark as I was driving. And so it was very similar to, we had just spent, you know, 20 something hours on the telephone, um, sitting in the dark, talking to each other. So it was very familiar. And we basically spent the whole weekend together and he met all my friends and we had a big party. And, um, and at the end of the weekend, um, I said, okay, you know, if we're going to give this a shot, we can, we probably can, we shouldn't see other people. So it's a risk, you know. It's a commitment. Um, but but I just didn't see how it would work if we were dating people locally and then also seeing each other at a distance. Because I yeah. you know I've had long distance relationships before and they're hard and they they take a lot of they take a lot of effort. And so we decided we'd give it three months and see what happened, and that was it. Do you think we can fall in love? I have arguments about this all the time. Uh, do you think we can fall in love based on words alone? Well, I think people have been doing it for centuries. I mean, they it used to be the case that people wrote letters to each other, yeah. um, with, you know, and then uh, that was how they communicated. And I guess that's how you and Dan got Exa <laughs> Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so is the answer a clear yes there? Because I get a lot of pushback from people often that you need, you need the touch and the smell, and uh, you know the bodily stuff. I think the touch and the smell and the bodily stuff helps. Okay, but I don't think it's necessary. Do you think you can have a lifelong monogamous relationship with an AI system that only communicates with you on text? Romantic relationship. Well. I suppose that's an empirical question that hasn't been answered yet, but so, yeah. um, I, I guess what I would say is, um, I don't think I could. Could any human? Could the average human? Could, you know, so, so um, if I, if I, um, I, I even, I wanna even, I wanna even modify that and say, I'm thinking now of, um, Tom Hanks um, and um, the movie um, Castaway. Yeah, you know, with Wilson. Yeah, I think if if that was if you had to make that work, if you had to make that work with the volleyball, yeah. If you had to make it work, could you? You could you prediction and simulation, right? So if you had to make it work, could you make it work using simulation and you know your past experience? Could you make it work? Could you make it work? You as a human, could you, could you like? Could you have a could you have a relationship literally with an inanimate object and have it sustain you in the way uh, that another human could? Yeah. Um, your life would probably be shorter because you wouldn't actually derive the body budgeting benefits from right. So um, we've talked about uh, you know how um, your brain its most important job is to control your body and you can describe that as your brain running a budget for your body. Yes. And um, there are metaphorical, you know, deposits and withdrawals into your body budget. And you also make deposits and withdrawals in other people's body budgets, figuratively speaking. So you wouldn't have that particular benefit. Um, uh, so your life would probably be shorter, but I think it would be harder for some people than for other people. Yeah, I tend to, my intuition is that you can have a deep, fulfilling relationship with a volleyball. I think I think a lot of the the environments that set up, I think that's a really good example, like the constraints of your particular environment 
to find the, like, I, I believe like scarcity is a good catalyst for deep, meaningful connection with other humans and with inanimate objects. So the less you have, the more fulfilling those relationships are. And I would say <laughs> a relationship with a volleyball, the sex is not great, but uh, everything <laughs> else, I feel like it could be a very fulfilling relationship, which I don't know from an engineering perspective what to do with that. Just like you said, it is an empirical question. But. but there are places to learn about that, right? So for example, think about children and their blankets, right? So there, there's something tactile and there's something olfactory. And it's very comforting. I mean, even for, even for non-human little animals, right? Like puppies and, so I don't know about cats, but... Um, but uh, Cats are cold hearted. There, there's, <laughs> there's no, there's nothing going on there. I don't know. There are some cats that are very dog like. I mean, really. So some cats identify as dogs. Yes, I think that's true. Yeah, they're they're um, species fluid. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I tend to believe that uh, there's a much stronger. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to talk about evolutionary advantages, but it seems like it makes sense for love to be a more powerful uh, emergent phenomena of our collective intelligence versus hate and evil and destruction. Because from a survival, from a niche perspective, it seems to be uh, like for, for in my own life and my thinking about the intuition about the way humans work together to solve problems, it seems that love is a very useful tool. I definitely agree with you. But I think the caveat here is that, um, you know, humans, the research suggests that humans are, are capable of great acts of kindness and great acts of generosity to people in their in-group. Right. And So we're also tribal. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the kitschy way to say it. We're tribes, we're tribal, yeah. yeah. So that's the kitschy way to say it. What I would say is that you know, there are a lot of features that you can use to describe yourself. You've, you don't have one identity, you don't have one self, you have many selves, you have many identities. Um, sometimes you're a man, sometimes you're a scientist, sometimes you're a, do you have a brother or a sister? Yeah, brother. So sometimes you're a brother, you know, you, you sometimes you're a friend. Sometimes you, you're a human so you can keep zooming out. Yes. Living exactly. organism on earth. Yes, exactly. That's exactly that's exactly right. And so um there are there are some people who there is research which suggests that um there are some people who will tell you I think it's appropriate and better to help I should help my family more than I should help my neighbors and I should help my neighbors more than I should help the mm -hmm. average stranger and I should help um you know, the average stranger in my country more than I should help somebody outside my country. And I should help humans more than I should help, you know, other animals. And yes. I should, right. So there's a clear hierarchy of helping. And there are other people who, um, you know, they are, their niche is much more inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. And that they're humans first, yes. right? Or, or creatures of the earth first, let's yep. say. Um, and, I don't think we know how flexible those attitudes are because th I don't think the research really tells us that. Mm -hmm. But in any case, there are, you know, and there are beliefs. People also have beliefs about, there's this really interesting research in um, really in anthropology um, that looks at what are cultures particularly afraid of, like what the people in a particular culture are organizing their social systems to prevent certain types of problems. So what are the problems that they're worried about? And mm -hmm. and so there are some cultures that are much more hierarchical and some cultures that are, you know, much more egalitarian. There are some cultures that, you know, in the debate of like getting along versus getting ahead, there are some cultures that really prioritize the individual over the group. And there are other cultures that really prioritize the group over the individual. You know, it's not like one of these is right and one of these is wrong. It's that, you know, different combinations of these features are different solutions that humans have come up with for, for living in groups 
which is a major adaptive advantage of our species. Um, and it's not the case that one of these is better and one of these is worse. Although as a person, of course, I have opinions about that. And as a person, right. I, I can say I would very much prefer certain, I have certain beliefs and I yeah. really want everyone in the world to live by those beliefs, you know. But as a scientist, I know that it's not really the case that for the species, mm -hmm. any one of these is better than any other. There are different solutions that work differentially well in particular, you know, uh, ecological parts of the world. But for individual humans, there are definitely some systems that are better and some systems that are. It's such an interesting thing. Like we're all, what is it? There are several billion of us and we're kind of roaming this world. And then you kind of stick together. You find find somebody that just like gets you. And it's interesting to think about, there's probably thousands if not millions of people that would, would be sticky to you depending on the curvature of your space. But what, what is the, could you speak to the stickiness, like to the, just the falling in love, like seeing that somebody really gets you, maybe by way of um, telling, do you think, do you remember there was a moment when you just realized, damn it, I think I'm like, I think that's, this is the guy. I think I'm in love. We were having these conversations actually from the, really from the second weekend we were together. So he flew back the next weekend to State College because it was my birthday. It was my 30th birthday. My friends were throwing me a party. And we went hiking and we hiked up some mountain and we were sitting on a cliff over this, you know, overlook and talking to each other. And I was thinking, and I actually said to him, like, I, I haven't really known you very long, but I feel like I'm falling in love with you, which can't possibly be happening. I must be projecting. Yeah. But it, <laughs> must be but, projecting. It, but it certainly feels that way, right? Yeah. Like, I don't believe in love at first sight, so... This can't really be happening, but it sort of feels like it is. And he was like, I know what you mean. And so for the first three months or four months, we would say things to each other like, I feel like I'm in love with you, but, you know, but that can't, that, but things don't really work like that. So, but, you know, so, and then it became a joke. Like, I feel like I'm in love with you. And then eventually, <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, but I, I think that was one moment where we were, we were talking about. I don't know, just, you know, not just all the great aspirations you have or all the things, but also things you don't like about yourself, things that you're worried about, things that you're scared of. And then I think the that was sort of solidified the relationship. And then there was one weekend where we went to Maine in the winter, which I love. I mean, I really love the beach always, mm -hmm. but in the winter particularly. Because it's just beautiful, it's and, beautiful and calm and whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I also, I I do find beauty in starkness sometimes. Like, so there's this grand majestic mm -hmm. scene of, you know, this very powerful ocean and it's all these like beautiful blue grays and it's just, it's just stunning. And so we were sitting on this huge rock in Maine um, where we'd gone for the weekend. It was freezing cold. And I honestly can't remember what he said or what I said or what, but I, I definitely remember having this feeling of, um, I absolutely want to stay with this person. Like I, and I don't know what my life will be like if I'm not with this person. Like I need to be with this person. Can we, from a scientific and a human perspective, uh, dig into your belief that first, uh, love at first sight is not, is not possible. You don't believe in it. Well, because there is there, you don't think there's like a magic where you see somebody in the in the Jack Kerouac way, and you're like, "Wow, that's something. That's that's oh, a I, special little oh, I definitely of something. oh, I definitely think you can connect with someone instant in, in an instance, and I definitely think you can say, "Oh, there's something there, and I'm really clicking with that person romantically, but also just with friends. It's mm -hmm. possible to do that. You recognize a mind that's like yours or that's compatible with yours. There are ways that you feel like you're being understood or that you understand something about this person, or maybe you see something in this person that you find really compelling or intriguing. But I think, 
you know, your brain is predictive organ, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're using your past. You're projecting. <laughs> you're using your past to yeah. make predictions. And I mean, not deliberately, that's how your brain is wired. That's what it does. And so it's filling in all of the gaps that you, you know, there are lots of gaps of information that you don't, you know, information you don't have. And so your brain is filling those in and, um, but isn't that what love is? No, I don't think so. Actually, I mean, to some extent, sure. You you always, you know, there's research to show that people who are in love always see the best in each other, and they, you know, when there's a when there's a negative interpretation or positive interpretation, you know, they choose the positive ones. So there's a little bit of positive illusion there, you know, going on. That's what the research shows. But I think, um. I think that when you find somebody who not just appreciates your f faults, but lo loves you for them, actually, you know, like maybe even doesn't see them as a fault. That's, you, so you have to be honest enough about what your, what your faults are. So it's easy to love someone for all the things that they, um, uh, for all the wonderful characteristics they have, it's harder, I think, to love someone despite their faults, or maybe even the faults that they see aren't really faults at all to you. They're actually something really special. But isn't isn't that? Can't you explain that by saying the brain kind of like you're projecting? It's you're you have a conception of um, a human being or just a, a spirit that really connects with you and you're projecting that onto that person. And within, yeah, so that, just, within that framework, all their faults then become beautiful, like little- Maybe, but you, you just have to pay attention to the prediction error. No, but maybe that's what love, like maybe you, igno you start ignoring the prediction error. That's maybe love is just your ability uh, like to ignore the prediction error. Yeah. Well, I think that there's some research that might say that, but that's not my experience, I guess. Um, but there is some research that says, I mean, there's some research that says you have to have an optimal margin of illusion, which means <laughs> that you um, that you put a positive spin on on smaller things, but you don't ignore the bigger things, right? And I think without being judgmental at all, when someone says to me, you know, um, you're not who I thought you were. I mean, nobody says has said that to me in a really long time, but certainly when I was younger, that was, you know, you're not who I thought you were. My reaction to that was, well, whose fault is that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty upfront person. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will though say that in my experience, people, people don't lie to you about who they are. They lie to themselves in your presence. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to get tied tied up in that, tangled up in that. And I think from the get-go, Dan and I were just, for whatever reason, maybe it's because we both have been divorced already, and, you know, um, you know, he told me who he thought he was, and he, he was pretty accurate as he far as accurate. I can. Pretty much, actually. I mean, I there's very... I can't say that I've ever come across a characteristic in him that really surprised me in a bad way. It's hard to know yourself. It, it is hard to know and yourself. And to communicate that. For sure. I mean, I'll say, you know, I had the advantage of be training as a therapist, which meant for five years I was under a fucking microscope. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was training as a therapist, it was hour for hour supervision, which meant if you were in a room with a client for an hour, you had an hour with a with a supervisor, so that supervisor was behind the mirror for your session, and then you went and had an hour of discussion about what you said, what you didn't say, learning to use your own react your own feelings and thoughts as a tool to probe the mind of the client, and so on. And so, you you can't help but learn a lot of you can't learn help but learn a lot about yourself in that process. Do you think? Um knowing or learning how the sausage is made 
ruins the magic of the actual experience? Like you as a neuroscientist who studies the brain, do you think it ruins the magic of like love at first sight? Or are you, do you consciously are still able to lose yourself in the moment? I'm definitely able to lose myself in the moment. Is wine involved? <laughs> Not always. Chocolate. I mean, Chocolate. some kind of mind altering <laughs> substance, right? But yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess what I would say, though, is that um, for me, part of the magic is the process. Like, so, uh, you know, yeah. so, so I remember a day there was, well, I was working on this, on this, on this book of essays. I, I was in New York. Um, I can't remember why I was in New York, but I was in New York for something and I was in Central Park and I was looking at all the people with their babies and I was thinking every, every, that each one of these, there's a tiny little brain yeah. that's wiring itself right now. And I, and I, I just, I felt in that moment, I was like, I am never going to look at an infant at, in the same way ever again. And so to me, I mean, honestly, before I started learning about brain development, I thought babies were cute, but, you know, not that interesting until they could do th interact with you and do things. Of course, my own infant, I thought, was extraordinarily interesting. But, right. you know, they're kind of like lumps. That's, you know, until they can, you know, interact with you. But they are anything but lumps. I mean, like, I, you know, so, and part of the, I mean, I, I, all I can say is I have deep affection now for like tiny little babies in a way that I didn't really um, before um, j because of the, I'm just so curious. But the actual process, the mechanisms of uh, the, the, the wiring of the brain, the learning, all the magic of the neurobiology. Yeah. And, or, you know, something like, you know, um, when you make eye contact with someone directly, sometimes, you know, you, you feel something, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's weird. What is it? And what is that? <laughs> yeah. And so, so to me, that's not, um, that's not backing away from the moment. That's like expanding the moment. It's like, mm. that's incredibly cool. You know, when I was, um, I'll just say that when I was, when I was in graduate school, I also was in therapy because it's almost a given that you're gonna be in therapy yourself if you're gonna become a therapist. And I had a deal you know, with my therapist, which was that I could call time out at any moment that I wanted to, as long as I was being responsible about it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't using it as a way to get out of something. And he could tell me, no, you know, he could decline and say, no, we're, you're, you know, you're using this to get out of something. But mm -hmm. I could call time out whenever I want and say, what are you doing right now? Like, what are you, here's what I'm experiencing. What are you trying to do? Like, I wanted to use my own experience to interrogate um, what the process was. Mm. And that made it m more helpful in a way. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't think learning how something works makes it less magical, actually. But that's just me, I guess. I don't know. Would you? Yeah, uh, yes. I tend to uh, have two modes. One is one is an engineer, and one is uh, romantic. And I'm conscious of like, like the gear. Like you, like there's two rooms. You can go into the one, the engineer room, and I think that ruins the romance. So I tend to. There's two rooms. One. Is the engineering room, think from first principles, how do we build the thing that creates this kind of uh, behavior? And then you go into the romantic room where you're like emotional, it's a roller coaster, and then you're, uh, the thing is, let's take it slow, and then you get married the next night, that you just this giant mess, and you write a song, and then you cry, and then you send a bunch of text and anger and, and whatever, and somehow you're in Vegas, and there's, <laughs> random people and you're drunk and whatever all that like in poetry and just mess of it mm. fighting yeah yeah that's not those are two rooms and you go back between between them but i think the way you put it is quite poetic i think you're much <laughs> you're much better at adulting uh with love uh than uh than perhaps i am because there's a magic to children i also think uh, like of adults as children it's kind of cool to see, it's a cool thought experiment to look at adults and think like, that used to be a baby. 
And then that's like a fully wired baby. And it's just walking around pretending to be like all serious and important, wearing a suit or something. But I used to be a baby. And then you think of like the parenting and all the experiences they had. Like it's it's cool to think of it that way. But then you, I start thinking of it like from a machine learning perspective. But once you're like the romantic moments, all that kind of stuff, all that falls away. I forget about all that. I don't know. That's I mean, the Russian I, thing. I, maybe, maybe. But I also think it might be an age thing or maybe an experience thing. So I think um, we all... Beautifully put. Let me ask a few final silly questions. So one, talked a bit about love, but let, let me, it's, it's fun to ask somebody like you who uh, can effectively, from at least neuroscience perspective, disassemble some of these romantic notions, but what do you make of romantic love? Why, why do human beings seem to fall in love? At least, at least a bunch of 80s hair bands have written about it. Uh, is that a nice feature to have? Is that a bug? What is it? Well, I, I'm really happy that I <laughs> fell in love. I wouldn't want it any other way. Um, but I would say- uh, Is that you, the person speaking, or the neuroscientist? <laughs> uh, well, I, me, that's me, the person speaking. Yeah. But uh, I would say, as a neuroscientist, babies are born not able to regulate their own body budgets because their brains aren't fully wired yet. When you- feed a baby, when you cuddle a baby, when you, everything you do with a baby impacts that baby's body budget and helps to wire that baby's body budget, um, helps to wire that baby's brain to manage eventually her own body budget to some extent. That's the basis biologically of attachment. Humans evolved as a species to be socially dependent, meaning you cannot manage your body budget on your own without a tax that eventually you pay many years later in terms of some metabolic illness, right? Loneliness, when you break up with someone that you love or you lose them, right? It, you feel like it's gonna kill you, but it doesn't. But loneliness will kill you it will kill you approximately, you know, what is it, seven years earlier? Or I can't remember exactly the exact number. It's it's actually in the web notes to um, seven and a half lessons. Mm -hmm. But um, it, social isolation and loneliness will kill you earlier than you would otherwise die. And the reason why is that you're not you didn't evolve to manage your nervous system on your own. And when you do, you pay a little tax, and that tax accrues very slightly over time, over a long period of time, so that by the time you're in you know, middle-aged or a little older, you are more likely to die sooner from some metabolic illness, from heart disease, from diabetes, from depression. Um, you're more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. I mean, it's the, it, you know, it takes a long time for that tax to accrue, um, but it does. So yes, I think it's a good pe thing for people to, um, to fall in love. But I think the the funny view of it is that uh, it's clear that humans need the social attachment to uh, what is it manage their nervous system as 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 you're describing, and the reason you want to stay with somebody for a long time is so you don't have is the novelty is very costly for uh, for our, well for now, you're mixing, now you're mixing now you're mixing things now you're you know <laughs> no you have to decide yeah, whether yeah. but I, what I would say is when you lose someone you love yeah. you um it feels like you've lost a part of you and that's because you have you've lost someone who was contributing to your body budget we are the caretakers of one another's nervous systems like it or not and um, out of that comes very deep feelings of attachment, some of which are romantic love. Like a fundamental aspect of that is is love. That makes it all like worth it. What in this uh, monkey riding an elephant in a dream world, what role does love play in the human condition? I think that love is the facilitator of non-transactional interaction. 
and you are um, observing your own purposes, some of these purposes go beyond your ego. They go beyond the, the particular organism that you are and your local interests. That's what you mean by non-transactional. Yes. So basically, when you are acting in a transactional way, it means that you are respecting something in return for you from the one that you're interacting with. Right, you are interacting with a random stranger, you buy something from them on eBay, you expect a fair value for the money that you sent them, and sure. vice versa. Because you don't know that person, you don't have any kind of relationship to them. But when you know this person a little bit better, and you know the situation that they're in, and you understand what they try to achieve in their life, and you uh, approve, because you, you realize that they're in some sense serving the same human sacredness as you are. And they need the thing that you have, maybe you give it to them as a present. But... The, I mean, the feeling itself of joy is a kind of benefit, is a kind of transaction. Like Yes, but the joy is not the point. The joy is the signal that you get. It's the reinforcement signal that your brain sends to you because you are acting on the incentives of the agent that you're part of. We are meant to be part of something larger. Right. This is the way in which we outcompete other hominids. <laughs> uh, take that, Neanderthals. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And also other humans. Uh, right, yeah. There was a population bottleneck uh, for human society that uh, leads to an extreme lack of genetic diversity among humans. If you mm -hmm. look at uh, Bushmen uh, in the Kalahari, that uh, basically tribes that are not that far distant to each other have more genetic diversity than exists between uh, Europeans and Chinese. Mm. And that's because basically the out-of-Africa population uh, at some point had a bottleneck of just a few thousand individuals. And uh, what probably happened is not that at any time the number of people shrunk below a few hundred thousand. What probably happened is that there was a small group that had a decisive mutation that produced an advantage. And this group multiplied and killed everybody else. Mm -hmm. And we are descendants of that group. Yeah, I, I wonder what uh, the, 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 the peculiar characteristics of that group. Yeah. I mean, we, we Me can never too. know. And a lot of people do. And we, we can only we can only just listen to the echoes in our like the the, the ripples uh, that, yeah. that are still within us. So I suspect what eventually made a big difference was the ability to organize at scale, be, be, to pro program each other with ideas that we became programmable, that we are willing to work in lockstep, that we went below uh, be above the tribal level, that we no longer were yeah. groups of a few hundred individuals and uh, acted on direct reputation systems transactionally, but that we basically evolved an adaptation to become state building. Yeah. To, 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 to form collectives outside of uh, the direct collectives. Yes, and that's basically a part of us became committed to serving something outside Bigger than of ourselves. what we know. Yeah, then that, that's kind of what love is. And it's terrifying because it meant that we eradicated the others. Right? We, it's a force. Yeah. It's an adaptive force that gets us ahead in evolution, which means we displace something else that doesn't have that. Oh, so we had to murder a lot of people that weren't about love. So love led to destruction. They didn't have the same strong love as we did. <laughs> right? That's why I, I mentioned this thing with fascism. When you see this, uh, these speeches, <laughs> do you want total war? And everybody says, yes! Right? Uh. This is this big... Uh, oh my God, we are part of something that is more important than me that gives meaning to my existence. <laughs> yeah. So I talk uh, about love quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned that romantic love. Uh, mm. well, I'm fascinated about love in many aspects. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you mentioned romantic love was forbidden in North Korea. Yeah. What do you think about love now that you've kind of discovered it? What's the role of love in life? Why was it so, why do you think it was forbidden in North Korea? So the tragic thing about North Korea is not only just banning Shakespeare, like we don't even know what Romeo and Juliet is, right? Mm -hmm. Our movies is never about love stories. But then also they ban the love between mother and daughter, wife and husband. And, you know, and yeah. you between your friends, they deny you being a human. So only love that I knew was when I described my feeling towards the leader and in a written form. That was the only love that people know in North Korea. And now I'm mean, like, there are many loves you can experience. I mean, I think you definitely love science, right? But imagine that if you're being denied that. Yeah. So there are so many loves in life, but in North Korea, 
all of those things are denied. And I think for me is love what makes you tick. Like, you know, love for your child, love for your parents, love for your friends, love for even yourself. That is denied. So, I mean, many people say like love is an option, but like, then why do you live? I think we live to love. And it doesn't have to be a romantic love. It can be anything. But finding love any, in any person or in any subject, I think that's a goal. I think that's when people find the meaning in something. Yeah, I think love, romantic love is just one sort of... Part of it. Uh, one echo of the yeah. some core thing. Yeah, science, I love science, I love robots, all of those things. And mm -hmm. it sounds like deliberately or not, the North Korean regime wants to channel that very deep aspect of the human spirit mm -hmm. all towards the leader. Yeah, that's it. That's the only thing they allow us to fear and know about. So I remember. Before maybe we eat, uh, you are in Texas, uh, you brought over some brisket. <laughs> Before we maybe indulge in that, let me bring up one quick topic and then we'll take a break. And the topic of uh, the, what some may term the toxicity of the Bitcoin community. Mm. That uh, <laughs> you've written that Bitcoin toxicity is tough love. Do you want to break that apart a little bit? Sort of um, the idea, the philosophy of the toxicity that seems to be present in, in part in the Bitcoin community. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before we recorded, and I've been through the gauntlet with Bitcoin toxicity as well. Um, I came into this space professionally in 2017, uh, I was originally running a multi-strategy crypto asset hedge fund. And my initial investment thesis on the world was that, you know, Bitcoin was a big deal, but there were all these other exciting coins and projects and ways the technology was going to be used. And that view of reality met <laughs> this immune, I guess you could say as an ideological immune system, this Bitcoin toxicity, and that it's kind of a, a filter that's trying to catch bad or useless or even scamming ideas that this space is very well known for. Um, you know, as we've touched on today, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is this world shattering innovation, but it's in a sea of the most scammy stuff ever, right? People, anybody can go and create a coin. So you can go and launch one immediately online um, and you can throw up a website, an advisor page, you know, a, post a white paper talking about how great your technology is going to be and how it's going to change the world. And you can raise $30 million in Bitcoin or Ethereum in 30 seconds kind of thing. So it's drawn in a lot of this scam artistry, you might say. And I think people living through that, because there is this natural predilection for people when they first come into Bitcoin, you're excited about it. Then you get lost in the shitcoin universe. And then just looking at the market success of Bitcoin versus, and when I use the word shitcoin, I'm just- You say with all the love in the world. All the love in the world. <laughs> I guess you could call me a, a toxic maximalist in some ways. Although I consider myself a freedom maximalist, not a Bitcoin maximalist. Yeah, I saw that line, that's a good, so, <laughs> that's a good line. Bitcoin, tracking the market success of Bitcoin versus alternative crypto assets, uh, the signal is very clear that Bitcoin has outcompeted all of them. So I think that, Bitcoin cultural toxicity has evolved as an immune response to those bad ideas, which is actually, if you think about it, it kind of is a tough love, right? You don't want new entrants to the space to get lost in shitcoin jungle and learn the hard way, the way many Bitcoin maximalists have, that uh, the real innovation is Bitcoin. But like an immune system, I think it can also go too far. And so I think it's useful when it is defending the space from false narratives, we might say, but it becomes detrimental when it's attacking people that are inquiring about Bitcoin or people that are approaching Bitcoin with a, a, a good spirit and good intention and a, uh, a desire to learn. Because yeah. then at that point, it's actually impeding the free flow of ideas, which, you know, the example in um, your clip that was totally taken out of context and then you're literally just saying, I'm here to learn and contribute. I think I've got some stuff to do. And then people attack that. Like that doesn't make any fucking sense. It's like you're attacking someone who's 
approaching it in a good spirit and asking questions. Yeah, and I think sometimes talking about it, the toxicity in the Bitcoin community as an immune response has a negative effect of giving it a pass because like it almost says, look, it equates it with the, immune, the human immune system, which mm -hmm. seems to do a really good job. And so you could say that the toxicity has a, a lot of features in the sea of fraudulent projects mm -hmm. that uh, st steal money from people. It's really useful to make sure that uh, you give people the harsh truth about who is and isn't a scammer. You have to take it apart, uh, take it away from that metaphor of the immune system and look at basic human nature. And human nature can go to some dark places, which is, it's sad to say that some people, maybe many of us can enjoy for its own sake, the toxicity, mm -hmm. the mockery, the derision. And you uh, stop being part of the immune system that makes a successful idea propagate and start being a sort of a destructive virus yourself. Mm. And that's something I think about because I I am new to uh, this particular immune system, but I've explored other immune systems. Oh. And the I think you understand this world much better than me, but I tend to prefer sort of love as a mechanism for spreading ideas to err, uh, to err on the side of love and kindness and almost like the open-mindedness in a way where you're constantly lowering yourself in the face of other ideas, constantly questioning yourself. But I think I understand that that might be more applicable in certain contexts, like maybe in the space of science or something like that. But in the space of uh, Bitcoin, as it currently stands, there's so many people that are trying to scam others out of their money that the kind of harshness required is different. Nevertheless, I do want to put it on people like yourself and others who I know you wouldn't consider yourself this, but you're one of the faces or leaders in this space to call people out a little bit, to inspire them to be more loving, I, I suppose. But it's difficult because you want to walk that line carefully. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be too loving and open-minded. <laughs> uh, otherwise your brain falls out. I, I get it. It's a difficult balance to walk. It is, a, it is subtle and it's nuanced and it is difficult to walk. And I think that that's why I try to say tough love because you know, when we're young, we may have certain ideas about how we, the way we want our life to go, mm -hmm. but then maybe our parents are not letting us do certain things. And we think they're, I know when I was a kid, I wanted to get my, when I was in fifth grade, I wanted to get my ear pierced. <laughs> my mom wouldn't let me do it. And I was, yeah. you know, oh, come on, mom. Yeah. I thought it was so cool. And then two <laughs> years later, I'm like, thank you, mom, for not yeah. letting me get my ear pierced. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it comes from a place of good intention yeah. that they are actually they have asked themselves that question, right? That they've been inquiring in why not this crypto asset or this crypto asset. And they've, they've done the exploration. They keep coming back to Bitcoin and they've seen people being taken advantage of. Um, but, you know, to your point, it's like it can, this tough love can become detrimental, just like the immune system can become detrimental, right? It can overreact and it can actually harm the human body. So I would say that it's, it's such a tricky and nuanced topic that even biology hasn't figured it out, right? A lot of people have autoimmune diseases. Um, and then there's the other thing that we we have this natural, I agree with you about love. I think love is like the deepest value. Um, that's a whole other philosophical thing, but <laughs> it's we're biologically programmed to pay more attention to things that are adversarial or harmful, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of the us protecting the meat suit, so to speak. So there is some... Uh, maybe better delivery method by being a little bit toxic to really get the point across mm -hmm. like, hey, don't get lost over here. These things can hurt you. Really try to focus on Bitcoin. But the toxicity of that message, I guess it increases its ability to penetrate the individual, but mm -hmm. it can also go too far. So it is very- It's, it's interesting, but I almost to push back a little bit, the toxicity is a funny word. I think 
a tux, maybe another way to say it is uh, I brought up like Christopher Hitchens and somebody who like, okay, you might say is toxic or something like that. Cause he's basically a intellectual powerhouse who's also a troll. So he's constantly, it's like guerrilla warfare in the space of ideas. He's very harsh in his disagreements and criticisms, but it's done with incredible grace and skill mm. and poetry. So we could use more of that. We could use more yeah. of that. So toxicity just like, <laughs> um, these are just words. They can mean a lot of different things, but disagreement doesn't have to be done with love, but it should be done with skill mm -hmm. if it's to be effective. So there's a lot of ways to be effective in guerrilla warfare, but you wanna learn how to shoot or whatever the weapon you're using and to do it well. Some people do it better than others. Yeah. And uh, it's worthwhile to learn to do it well. Again, I prefer love, but even love, you know, just because you think you're communicating a good idea, which you very well may be, doesn't mean it also doesn't require skill to do the communication well. Mm -hmm. Whether it's disagreement and harsh or more uh, agreement and loving and so on. Yeah, I think very fundamentally that all of our decisions, you know, we, we alluded to earlier that every decision is an expression of value, right? every action we take, they ultimately come from fear or love. Fear would be something much more in the biological domain where it's like we're trying to protect ego. We're trying to behave selfishly. This is the domain of sin, you know? I, I don't know all the sins, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, lust, pride, envy. Like these are all selfish behaviors. Whereas something like love is much, it's morally superior in that it's more selfless. I, I don't know that we can properly define love with words at all, but I would say maybe like selfless action could be kind of a generalization of it. And that way, it is really hard, to your point, it's hard to, to love in a world that has a lot of conflict that might make you fearful if you're really focused on your meat yeah. suit. But if you're focused on the bigger picture and you're focused on others and legacy and life, that um, there is a way to do it. And that's why I actually think Christ, that is the highest moral aim, right? Mm -hmm. He met all of the vitriol in life, you know, betrayal, hate, violence, he met it all with love and he met it with compassion. And that's why, like, regardless of if you believe that he actually lived or any of this, this he is symbolic of the highest moral consciousness possible. And, you know, Carl Jung would say that that was a suitable alternative to psychoanalysis, was actually setting your moral aim higher and striving towards it diligently. So, I mean, I agree completely. We need more of that in the Bitcoin space. Uh, we need more of that in the world, frankly. In the world, yeah. Um, and these things, they're all intertwined. You know, I, we touched on the beginning that you, all of us get to decide, but the world does influence kind of if we adopt fear or love. Um, but it takes, I don't know, it takes good systems and it takes, I guess, good leaders to to set an example. Yeah, I do, I do believe that there's like individual people can have a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I try to do, sort of embody the, I'm just one ant. Yeah. But I one of the things I have faith in is, I'm trying to do that more. I know this is a podcast, but I'm trying to do less talking and more doing. <laughs> um, I've been disappointed in myself, if I'm being honest, how much talking I've been doing, you know, as, a, as opposed to, um, like in my own private life, I live the thing I talk about, but I also haven't created much, you know? And uh, I believe in the power of individuals that create stuff, like create mm -hmm. an idea. Yeah. Through those individuals that try to create something new, the world progresses. And yes. hopefully there's more and more, more and more of those people. And um, what about love? We talked about money is uh, ultimately a mechanism by which you can uh, pave uh, a moral path through life. Uh, you know, to me, one of the purest expressions of that is love broadly defined for family, for others, for knowledge, for the world. It's, a, it's basically an optimistic open view to the world that embraces 
all that is beautiful about this world. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think about love often in, in a personal sense, romantic, family, friendship, and in the broad sense about its value in, in, uh, in a successful life? Yeah, of course. I'm blessed to have a two and a half year old daughter. And um, love is a word we throw around. You know, it's I, I love these potato chips. I love you, man. <laughs> I love you, my daughter. This, it's got so many different uh, intensities, I guess you might say. But um, I don't know. My intuition is that it is something very fundamental to the universe. Like, if, again, I, I know words don't do it justice, but if we just proxy love with selfless action mm -hmm. the whole damn universe is selflessly acting right it's just unfolding and um it may sound a bit hippy dippy but my intuition is just that love is the core of it somehow um i don't have anything to back that up really it's just <laughs> in the way you're framing it it's making me think that uh love we're talked we talked about sort of meditation is as opposed to thinking from an egocentric perspective of you, the individual operating in this world, is allowing you to be empathetic towards the world and mm -hmm. thereby think of the universe, think of the world acting through you. Mm -hmm. Almost like uh, accepting this notion that uh, ideas have you, you don't have ideas. That's right. That you're not existing in the universe, the universe is existing through you. It's yes. sort of like, like that's, that's what selfless, in that context means is like embracing that thought. And that's a weird thought. It's a weird thought that we're just here for a little bit of time. These meat vehicles, yeah. receptacles, and uh, this much bigger thing is just using us, not in a malevolent way, but just like, like a river flows, is using us to create more and more beautiful things. Yes. Yes, more and more beautiful things. We are the universe experiencing itself, yeah. frankly, right? So <laughs> that's a trippy thought, man. Yeah, that, uh, that in some sense the universe created us yeah. to experience itself, and we are the high, you know, <laughs> one of the highest forms of beauty that nature has created. Right? If we just think one of the most complex and adaptive thing, we're, we're a reflection of nature. And another thing that comes to mind here is that Dalio has this quote where he says, truth or more accurately, um, an accurate depiction of reality is necessary for any good outcome. So when we think that love or value is primary, I think that too reinforces this thesis that acting out of love or acting out of proper moral action, you're best reflecting the fundamental nature of reality. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you're best creating the best possible outcomes or the things of the most beauty, whether that's your artistic expression, your children, your business, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, Jordan Peterson goes deep into that where you, you have to listen to that sense of meaning in your life or you might have some decision on paper that's so great this way, but your heart says no, your heart says otherwise. Um, I, I, I've tried to listen to my heart throughout and I think, I think that creates the best outcomes. But nevertheless, does it make you sad that you, in particular, Robert, are going to be dead pretty soon? <laughs> uh, as as uh, we talk about scarcity, one of the certain things that ensure the the uh, the scarcity of the human experience is the fact that you you and your consciousness are going to be done. Only, they have a deadline. Only time and Bitcoin are absolutely scarce. <laughs> <laughs> I. Um, <laughs> I'm fortunate that when I, I guess I got started on this philosophical journey a, a bit when I was younger, but I got into um, Musashi and Sun Tzu quite a bit. Uh, who wrote Musashi wrote the Book of Five Rings. Uh, uh, Sun Tzu wrote the Art of War. And one one of the things that I mean, these guys were just absolute beasts. You know, they lived and died by the sword, and they were just very. Uh, great equanimity about all things in life. And I also found this kind of in the Stoic philosophy where they just are very cool with everything. And uh, 
one of the lines there is that the way of the warrior is the resolute acceptance of death. And so I've always tried to think about that. Like, of course, I experience fear. I experience, you know, everything that you, you do in a meat suit, right? Like anxiety and all the things. But I always try to have that higher order view of myself and that it's just a certain experience occurring at a certain level, but it shouldn't override your kind of highest order self. That's just resolutely accepted death and that this is your one play in life. So hopefully that propels me towards proper action. I think scarcity cannot help but lead to something good. Just like with this conversation, sadly it must come to an end. The scarcity of it is what makes it beautiful. So Robert, this was uh, one of my favorite conversations uh, philosophically and in every other level just the ideas and the way you express them around Bitcoin, around morality, around money uh, has been really inspiring and really educational. And I'm glad you're out there uh, fighting the good fight. And I'm glad you're wasting all of this time with me. It was really <laughs> fun. And thank you <laughs> for coming down to Texas and having some good old uh, brisket together. This is, uh, this is really fun, man. This is awesome. Lux. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Robert Breedlove, and thank you to Funrise, Element, Mugpack, and BetterHelp. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. And now, let me leave you with some words from Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Antifragility is beyond resilience and robustness. The resilient resists shocks and stay the same. The antifragile gets better. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time. I gotta ask you about love. I heard you're into this now. Into this love thing? Yeah. Is this, is, you think this is your solution to your depression? No, I'm just trying to, like you said, the enlightened people on occasion trying to sell a book. I'm writing a book about love. You're writing a book about no, love? No, I'm not, I'm okay. not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, he's gonna, somebody said, you should really write a book about the, your, you know, your management philosophy. He said, it'd be a short book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, that one was sold pretty well. Uh, what role do you think love, family, friendship, all that kind of uh, human stuff play in a successful life? You've been exceptionally successful in the space of like running teams, building cool shit in this world, creating some amazing things. What uh, did love get in the way? Did love help? Did family get in the way? Did family help? Friendship? You want, you want the engineer's answer? <laughs> please so, so but first love is functional right <laughs> it's functional in yeah. what way so we habituate ourselves to the environment and actually jordan told me jordan peterson told me this line so you go through life and you just get used to everything except for the things you love they 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 remain new like this is really useful for you know like like other people's children and dogs and you know trees you just don't pay that much attention to them. your own kids you're monitoring them really closely like, and if they go off a little bit because you love them, if you're smart, if you're gonna be a successful parent, you notice it right away. You don't habituate to, to just things you love. And if you wanna be successful at work, if you don't love it, you're not gonna put the time in somebody else, as somebody else that loves it. Like, cause it's new and interesting and that lets you go to the next level. Um, so, so it's the thing. It's just a function that generates newness yeah. and novelty and yeah. uh, surprises you and know, all those kinds. Of <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. I mean, and there's people <laughs> figured out lots of you know frameworks for this. You yeah. know, like like humans seem to go in partnership, go through you know interest. Like somebody suddenly somebody's interesting, mm -hmm. and then you're infatuated with them, and then you're in love with them, and then you you know different people have ideas about parental love or mature love. Like you go through a cycle of that which keeps us together and it's, you know, super functional for creating families and, and creating communities and making you support somebody despite the fact that you don't love them. Like, and, and it can be really enriching, you know, now, now in the work-life balance scheme, if all you do is work, 
you think you may be optimizing your work potential, but if you don't love your work or you don't have family and friends and things you care about, your brain isn't well balanced. Like everybody knows the experience of you worked on something all week, you went home and took two days off and you came back in. The odds of you working on the thing, you picking up right where you left off is zero. Your brain refactored it. Mm. But being in love is great. It's like changes the color of the light in the room. Yeah. Like it creates a spaciousness that's that's different. It helps you think. Yeah. It makes you strong. Bukowski had this line about love being a fog that dissipates with the first light of reality in the morning. That's, it's, that's depressing. I think it's the other way around. It lasts. Well, you, like you said, it's, it's a function. It's a thing that it generates. It can be things. the light that actually enlivens your world and, and creates the interest and the power and the strength and the to go do something. Well, it's like, like, like that sounds like, you know, there's like physical love, emotional love, intellectual love, spiritual yeah. love, right? Uh, isn't it all the same thing, kind of? Nope. You should differentiate that. Maybe that's your problem. In your book, you should you should refine that a little. Is bit. It different chapters. Yeah, there's different chapters. What's the what's these are aren't these just different layers of the same thing of the stack? Uh, no, physical people people. Some people are addicted to physical love, and they have no idea about emotional or intellectual love. I don't know if they're the same things. I think they're different. That's true. They could be different. It'd be, it, I, I guess the ultimate goal is for it to be the same. Well, if you want something to be bigger and interesting, you should find all its components and differentiate them, not glom it together. Like it's people modular. do this all the time. They, yeah, yeah. In the modularity. Get your abstraction layers right, and then you can you have room to breathe. Well, maybe you can write the forward to my book about love. <laughs> yeah, or the afterwards. <laughs> and the afterwards. You really tried. <laughs> I feel like Lex has made a lot of progress in this book. But... Uh, well, you have things in your life that you love. Yeah, yeah. You know, so and they are. You're right. They're modular. It's it's quite well. There, and you can have multiple things with the same person or the same yeah. thing. And yeah, but yeah, depending on the moment of the day. Yeah, there's yeah. like what Bukowski described is that moment when you go from being in love to having a different kind of love. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's a transition. Yeah. But when it happens, if you'd read the owner's manual and you, you believed it, you would have said, oh, this happened. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's not love. It's a different kind of love. But but maybe there's something better about that. As you grow old, if all you do is regret how you used to be, it's sad. right? You should have learned a lot of things because like who you can be in your future self is, is actually more interesting and possibly delightful than... You know, being a, a mad kid in love with the the next person like that's super fun when it happens, but that's that's you know five percent of the possibility. <laughs> that, yeah, that's right. That there's a lot more fun to be had in the long lasting stuff. Yeah, or meaning. You know, if that's your meaning, thing. which is a kind of fun. It's a deeper kind of fun, and it's surprising. You know, that's like like the thing I like is surprises. <laughs> you know. And you just yeah. never know what's going to happen. Yeah. But you have to look carefully and you have to work at it and you have to think about it. And, you know, it's, yeah, you have to see the surprises when they happen, right? You have to be. But still, that doesn't explain the why of love. Like, why is love part of the human condition? Why is it useful to combine the reward functions? It seems like that doesn't, I mean, I don't think reinforcement learning frameworks can give us answers to why. Even, even the Hutter framework has an objective function that's static. So we came to existence as a consequence of evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, the purpose of evolution is survival. Yeah. And then the, this complicated optimization objective baked into us, let's say compression, which might help us uh, operate in the real world and it baked into us various reward functions. Yeah. Uh, then to be clear, at the moment we are operating in the regime, which is somewhat out of distribution where the even evolution optimized us. It's almost like love is a consequence of uh, cooperation that we've discovered is useful. Correct. In some way, it's even the case if you... I just love the idea that love is like the out of distribution. <laughs> or it's not out of distribution. It's like, as you said, it evolved for co cooperation. Yes. And I believe that the co like uh, in some sense, cooperation ends up helping each of us individually. So it makes sense evolutionary. And there is, a, in some sense, 
And you know, love means there is this dissolution of boundaries that you have a shared reward function. Mm -hmm. And we evolved to actually identify ourselves with larger groups. So we we can identify ourselves, you know, with a family. We can identify ourselves with a country to such an extent that people are willing to give away their life for country. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is, we are wired actually even uh, uh, for love. And at the moment, I guess the mm, maybe it would be somewhat more beneficial if you will, if we would identify ourselves with all the humanity as a whole. So, so you can clearly see when people travel around the world, when they run into person from the same country, they say, oh, which city you are and all this, like all this, and they find all these similarities. They, they, they find some, they, they befriend those folks earlier than others. Uh, so there is like a sense, some sense of the belonging. And I would say, I think it would be overall good thing to the world uh, for people to move towards, uh, I think it's even called open individualism, uh, move toward the uh, mindset of a larger and larger groups. What you mentioned the human condition, does love have to do? What role does it play in the human condition? Friendship, love. Love is the drug. <laughs> Love kind. is, uh, this was a great Roxy music line uh, that Brian Ferry wrote. And love is uh, the most powerful and, and dangerous of all the drugs. Uh, the, um, the driving force that overrides our reason. And of course, uh, it, is the, it is the primal, it's the primal urge. So what a civilized society has to do is to prevent that drug, that primal force from creating mayhem. So there have to be rules uh, like monogamy and rituals like, like marriage that, that rein love in and, and make the, the addict uh, at least more or less uh, under control. And I, I think that's... That's part of why I'm I'm a romantic rather than a you know Steve Pinker enlightenment rationalist because the romantics realized that that love was the drug. It's like the difference in sensibility between uh, Handel and Wagner. And I I had a Wagnerian phase when I was an undergraduate. And I still remember thinking that in 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 uh, is old as Liebes told the, that Wagner had got the closest to sex that anybody had ever got in in music or perhaps to love. I'm I'm lucky that I love my wife and that uh, that we were by the time we met, you know, smart enough to understand that that love is a drug that you have to kind of take. In in, yeah. in in certain careful ways. Yeah. And that it works best in the context of a of a stable family. That's that's the key thing. That one has to sort of take the drug and then submit to the 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 conventions of of, of marriage and family life. I I think in that respect I'm a, a kind of Tamed romantic. <laughs> tamed romantic. That's I how it. I would like to think of and myself. And the degree to which your romanticism is tamed can be then channeled into productive work. That's why you're a historian and a writer, is the yes. rest of that love is channeled through the writing. So if you're going to be addicted to anything, be addicted to work. <laughs> I mean, we're all addictive, but yeah. the thing about workaholism is that it is the most productive addiction. <laughs> and yeah. uh uh, and rather that than 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 drugs or booze. So I, I'm I'm yes I'm always trying to channel my anxieties in, into work. I learned that at a relatively early age. It's a sort of massively productive way of coping with the inner demons. And again, we should teach kids that because let's come back to our earlier conversation about universities. Part of what happens at university is that adolescents have to overcome all the inner demons. And these include deep insecurity 
about one's appearance, about one's intellect, and then madly raging hormones that cause you to behave like a complete fool with the people to whom you're sexually attracted. All of this is going on in a university. How can it be a safe space? It's a completely dangerous space by definition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I learned teaching young people how to manage these storms. Uh, you know, that's part of the job, and and we we're really not allowed to do that anymore because we can't talk about these things for fear of the Title IX officers kicking down the door and dragging us off in chains. And like you said, hard work and something you call work ethic in civilization uh, is um, is is a pretty is a pretty effective way to achieve i think a kind of happiness in a world that's full of anxiety so or at least exhaustion so that you sleep <laughs> well <laughs> well there is there's beauty to the exhaustion to uh, that's why running there's manual work that some some part of us is built for that right i mean we are products of of evolution and our adaptation to a technological world is a very imperfect one. So hence the kind of masochistic urge to to, to run. Uh, I, I like outdoor exercise. I don't really like gyms. So I'll go for long punishing runs in, in woodland, hike up hills. I like swimming in lakes and in the sea. Mm -hmm. Because there just has to be that physical uh, activity in order to do the good mental work. And so it's all about trying to do the best work. That's my sense, that we we have some random allocation of talent. You kind of figure out what it is that you're relatively good at, and you try to do that well. I think my father encouraged me to think that way. And... You don't mind about being average at the other stuff. The, the kind of sick thing is to try to be brilliant at everything. I hate those people. You should really not worry too much if you're just an average double bass player, which I am, or kind of average skier, which I definitely am. Doing those things okay is, is part of leading a rich and fulfilling life. Uh, I was not a good actor, but I got a lot out of acting as an undergraduate. Turned out after three years of experimentation at Oxford that I was, broadly speaking, better at writing history essays than uh, my peers, and that was my edge. That was my comparative advantage, and so I've just tried to make a living from from that slight edge. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to describe a life. Do you think we will ever create an AI system that we can love and loves us back in a deep, meaningful way, like in the movie Her? I think AI will be capable of convincing you to fall in love with it very well. And that's different than us humans. You know, we start getting into a metaphysical question of like, do emotions and thoughts exist in a different realm than the physical? And maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. But but from a physics standpoint, I tend to think, I tend to think of things, you know, like physics was my main sort of training. and. Wow. And, and from a physics standpoint, essentially, if, if it loves you in a way that, is, that you can't tell whether it's real or not, it is real. It's a physics view of love. Yeah. <laughs> if there's no, if you, if, the, if, you cannot dis, if you cannot prove that it does not, if there's no test that you can apply that would make it, make, allow you to tell the difference, then there is no difference. Right, and it's similar to uh, seeing our world as simulation. There may not be a test to tell the difference between what the real world and yes. the simulation, and therefore, from a physics perspective, it might as well be the same thing. Yes, it, and there may be ways to test whether it's a simulation. There might be, I'm not saying there aren't, but you could certainly imagine that a simulation could, could correct, that once an entity in the simulation found a way to detect the simulation, it could, either restart, the, you know, pause the simulation, start a new simulation, or do one of any other things that then corrects for that error. <laughs> Love. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how, how difficult? What is it? <laughs> what is it? Uh, well, first, an engineering question. I know, I know, you're, you're not an engineer, but how difficult do you think is it to build an AI system that you can have a deep, fulfilling, monogamous relationship with? sort of replace the human-to-human -human relationships that we value? 
I think anyone can fall in love with anything. You know, like how often have you looked back at someone, like I ran into someone the other day that I was in love with and I was like, hey, it was like, there was nothing there. Yeah. There was nothing there. Like, do you, you know, like where you're able to go like, oh, that was weird. Oh, right. You know, uh, I, I were able- You mean it's from a distant past or something like kind, that? Yeah. yeah. When you're able to go like, I can't believe we had an incredible connection and now it's just, I do think that people will be in love with robots, probably even more deeply with humans because it's like when people mourn their animals, when their animals die, mm -hmm. they're always, it's uh, sometimes harder than mourning a human because you can't go, well, he was kind of an asshole, but like he didn't pick me up from school. You know, it's like you're able to get out of your grief a little bit. You're able to kind of be, oh, he was kind of judgmental or she was kind of, you know, with a robot, it's there's something so pure about an innocent and impish and childlike about it that I think it probably will be much more conducive to a narcissistic love, for sure at that. But it's not like, well, he cheated. She can't cheat. She can't leave you. She can't, you know. Well, if, if Bear Claw leaves your life and maybe a, a new version mm -hmm. or somebody else will enter, there are, will you miss Bear Claw? For guys that have these sex robots, they're building a nursing home for the bodies wow. that are now rusting because they don't want to part with the bodies because they have such an intense emotional connection to it. I mean, it's kind of like a car club a little bit, you know, like it's, it, it, you know, but I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying it's cool. It's weird. It's creepy. But we do anthropomorphize things with faces and we do develop emotional connections to things. I mean, we're, there's certain, have you ever tried to like throw away? I can't even throw away my teddy bear from when I was a kid. It's a piece of trash and it's upstairs. <laughs> like, it's just like, why can't I throw that away? It's bizarre. You know, and there's something kind of beautiful about that. There's something, it gives me hope in, in humans because I see humans do such horrific things all the time. And maybe I'm too, I see too much of it, frankly, but there's something kind of beautiful about the way we're able to um, have emotional connections to objects, um, which, you know, a lot of, I mean, it's I can't, kind of specifically, I think, Western, right, that we don't see objects as having souls. Like, that's kind of specifically us. But um, I don't think it's so much that we're objectifying humans with these sex robots. We're kind of humanizing objects, right? So there's something kind of fascinating in our ability to do that because a lot of us don't humanize humans. So it's just a weird little place to play in. And I think a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people will be marrying these things is my guess. So you've asked the question, let me ask it of you. So what is love? You have a bit of a brilliant definition of love as being willing to die for someone who you, who you yourself want to kill. So that's, that's, uh, that's kind of fun. First of all, that's brilliant. That's a really good definition. I think it'll stick with me for a long time. This is how little of a romantic I am. A plane went by when you said that and my brain is like, you're gonna need to re-record that. <laughs> I don't want you to get into post and then not be able to use it. <laughs> uh, and I'm a romantic because I you don't mean to ruin the moment. I, I actually, I cannot be conscious of the fact that I heard the plane and it made me feel like how amazing it is that we live in a world with planes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just went, why haven't we fucking evolved past planes <laughs> and why can't they make them quieter? Yeah. <laughs> well, but yes. This. Um, my definition of love what what yeah what's your sort of a more serious producing note. dopamine for a long time <laughs> consistent output of oxytocin with the same person um, uh, dopamine is a positive thing what about the negative what about the fear and the insecurity mm -hmm. the longing uh anger all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff i think that's part of love you know i think you don't I think that love brings out the best in you, but it also, if you don't get angry and upset, it's, you know, I don't know. I think that that's, that's part of it. I think we have this idea that love has to be like really, you know, placid or something. Um, I only saw stormy relationships growing up. So I don't, I don't um, have a judgment on how a relationship should look, but I do think that this idea that love has to be eternal is, is really destructive is really destructive and self-defeating and um, a big source of stress for people. I mean, I'm still figuring out love. I think we all kind of are, but I do kind of stand by that definition. 
And I think that, uh, I think for me, love is like just being able to be authentic with somebody. It's very simple, I know, but I think for me, it's about not feeling pressure to have to perform or impress somebody, just feeling truly like accepted unconditionally by someone. Although I do believe love should be conditional. <laughs> that might be a <laughs> hot take. Um, I think everything should be conditional. I think if uh, someone's behavior, I don't think love should just be like, I'm in love with you, now behave however you want forever. This is unconditional. I think love is a daily action. It's not something you just like get tenure on and then get to behave however you want because we said I love you 10 years ago. It's a daily, it's a verb. Well, there's some things that are, you see, if you make it, exp if you explicitly make it clear that it's conditional, it takes away some of the magic of it. So there's certain stories we tell ourselves that we don't want to make explicit about love. I don't know, maybe that's the wrong way to think of it. Maybe you want to be explicit in relationships. So I also think love is a business decision. Like, <laughs> I do, in a good way. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I think that love is not just when you're across from somebody. It's when I go to work, can I focus? Do I, am I worried about you? Am I stressed out about you? Am I, right. you're not re responding to me? You're not reliable. Like, I think that being in a, a relationship, the kind of love that I would want is the kind of relationship where when we're not together, it's not draining me, causing me stress, making me worry, you know, and sometimes passion, that word, you know, mm. we get murky about it. But I think it's also like, I can be the best version of myself when the person's not around and I don't have to feel abandoned or scared or any of these kind of other things. So it's like love, you know, for me, I think is, I think it's a Flaubert quote and I'm going to butcher it, but I think it's like be, you know, boring in your personal life so you can be violent and take risks in your professional life. Mm. Is that it? I got it wrong. Something like that. But I yeah. do think that it's being able to align values in a way to where you can also thrive outside of the relationship. Some of the most successful people I know are those sort of happily married and have kids and so on. It's it's always funny. It can be boring. Boring's okay. Yeah. Boring is serenity. And it's funny how that those elements actually make you much more productive. I don't understand the- uh, That's right. I don't think that, relationships should drain you and take away energy that you could be using to create things that generate pride. Okay. Did you say your relationship of love yet? Huh? Have you said your relation, your definition of love? My definition of love? Uh, no, I did not say it. <laughs> We're out of time. No. Uh, do when you have a, when you have a podcast, maybe you can invite me on. We'll oh no, I already it. did. You're doing it. Okay. We've already <laughs> talked about this. Um, and b because I also have codependency, I have to say yes. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, no, I'm trapping you. <laughs> yeah, you owe me now. Actually, what the? I wondered whether when I I asked if we could talk today, after sort of doing more research and reading some of your book. I start to wonder, did she just feel pressured to say yes? Yes, of course. <laughs> Good. But I'm a fan of yours too. Okay, no, awesome. I actually, because I am codependent, but I'm in recovery for codependence. So I actually do, I don't do anything I don't want to do. You really, you, you got to, you are saying no. What's More, that? I say you, no you, all the you, time. Good. I'm trying to learn. I that moved as well. this a couple. Remember, I moved it from one to two. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I've, just I have, to, yeah, just yeah, to, just to let I you know it. how to... <laughs> recovered I am. And my, I'm not codependent, but I, uh, uh, I don't do anything I don't want to do. Yeah, you're ahead of me on that. Okay, so do <laughs> you're you... like I don't even want to be here. <laughs> Pressure. I'll tell you what really concerns me about your perspective. I think that there are a lot of genius ideas inside of people who don't have the stomach for conflict and derision. And I think a lot of those people are female. Mm -hmm. And I think that yeah. until we come up with a world in which we can swat down the trolls, where we can actually cause the trolls not to ruin everything. And I, I don't necessarily mean by shutting them up. I don't necessarily mean by being brutal to them, but somehow separating off people who are working and people who are trolling. The, the, I think that we're losing a huge amount of human genius in part because women in particular are not necessarily going to push an idea if it results in 10 years of being derided. Very few men are willing to do that either, but there are some of us who are so dumb that we will pigheadedly stick to an idea for 10 years even if the world collapses. I don't think that there are as many women who are going to make that calculation even if they know the idea is correct. And one of the things that I believe technology can help us fight the trolls of all definitions of troll. Like I believe that a better Twitter can be built. Interesting. I do not. 
I don't believe that a Twitter successor can be built that solves most of the problems. I think you can always improve what we have, yeah. but I don't think that converges in something that really works because I think ultimately the problem isn't Twitter, the problem is us. For example, I recently made a very disturbing realization, which is academics and trolls have very many similar behaviors. Absolutely. It's largely a trolling community. I tend to believe that the trolls are not, it's like the Peter Thiel mini mind idea. Yeah. Which in all of the trolls, there's the possibility of goodness. And all you have to do, not all you have to do, what you have to do is create technology that incentivizes them to, uh, to embrace, to, to discover, to embrace, to practice. The, the the better angels of their nature. And I believe that like the, the people actually want to do that. The trolls is a short-term dopamine rush of uh, childish toxicity that all of us want to overcome. I believe that like deep within, it's, we want to overcome that. I, I, I try to keep myself from believing what you believe. <laughs> <laughs> because you'd be disappointed if it's not because true. it's dangerous because a lot of these people are implacable foes and there aren't many of them but when you meet somebody who's like yeah i just like screwing people up i'm here for the pain i i, I just believe even in them there's a good there's a wonderful book that i'm going to recommend to you where i hope this comes from maybe i've got the source wrong but in any event it's a great book called <laughs> yeah. uh maximum city about bombay mm -hmm. And I believe the, the, the conceit is that the author um, leaves Bombay as a kid and comes back as an adult and he realizes he, he has to rediscover the city because he can't live in the city he left. So he, he gets in contact with all of the weird areas of the city and one of them is the underworld. He hangs out with the police, but in the underworld he's talking to contract killers. And um, he says, you know, it's really weird. Everybody pleads for their life right before I kill them. And they always say this thing about, I've got, a, I've got two kids at home. He says, never say that to a contract killer because we have terrible relationships with our parents. <laughs> Doesn't endear us to you. <laughs> and I was just thinking like, uh, yeah. oh, wow. So there's a minus sign in front of that statement. You're sitting there saying, you know, I've got a three-year-old. It's like, okay, well, I'm gonna take this POS out of, out of that kid's life. Maybe he'll have a chance. You don't know how people are wired. And as much as I hate to say it, there are people whose wiring is so disturbing and so different from yours that you will never guess why you can't reach them or how much pleasure they may have gotten because they may have gone over a point of no return. Nevertheless, you are just a smart guy who is using his intuition to make a hypothesis. You do not know this for sure. No. Nope. And I'm an, you know, whatever the hell I am, uh, that has a, a different hypothesis that even in the darkest human beings that, that seem to be only full of evil, there's a good person there that could be discovered. And Lex, one of the those, reasons I love doing your show uh -huh. is, is that you have these beliefs, even as a Russian. <laughs> now, the Russian special. As you know, the Russian, there is a weirdness which is a total cynicism and total idealism yeah. locked together, right? That's very much a part of the Russian character. Can we talk about love a little bit? Sure. So you came out of the closet as being gay when you were 25. Yeah, it's a long, it was late, very late. Very late. Before By then- By today's standards. During and after, how has your view on love evolved? Interesting. It's hard, it's so hard to say because like I would I I'd like to make a very like D Disney fied statement about like that you can't be in love uh, secretively. You should be honest. Love should all be about honesty, but that's not true, right? There's people that are in love <laughs> that are lying to everyone else, yeah. but they're deeply in love. Yeah. Um, I would love to say something like honesty is an ingredient for love, right. uh, you know. But I don't know. Maybe honesty with each other. But I mean, I know, I, I think there's a lot of people in the world that aren't honest. My view on love is super important. Uh, I think that it's, we, a lot of society in America is all about love. We don't tend to focus on other uh, things 
in terms of like you know uh friendship or sustainability of that because i think that a lot i know a lot of people in relationships where it's like i don't know they're not they are they love each other but like it's also a rock solid couple because they are they're very compatible in many other ways right so i think they're like friends they have right i I see friendship and love as the same thing right there's there's just parts of it that are right so it's like i look at it as like there is there needs to be more than just like that like amazing like chemistry or physical attraction that is this chemical thing that happens there should be like some underlying i mean again that's from what i that's what i've observed as really long lasting successful relationships well is there something about coming out that that was uh that you took away that you remember as yes. profound and yes. insightful and so that on. it was i that i it wasn't society it was me so there were kids that were out in my high school that i waited years later to do it that was no one's fault but my own so i was taking a cowardly way out and a lot of people so i could blame society or like oh i lived in a conservative area and i grew up in da, 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 da. you should take responsibility for your own decisions and if you're being cowardly admit that you're being cowardly so that's what I took out of it is that it's not society's fault that you chose to be a coward. Society will never be perfect. You have to be honest when you're ready to be honest or however you want to be honest, but it's not somebody too much now is it's everyone else's fault that you didn't take, make a hard choice or a hard decision. Yeah. So that's kind of what I took out of it. So now in retrospect, you see yourself as were being afraid. Do you, right. do you think at the time, well, I wanted people to like me, which is the which is right. the disease of humanity, right? Is that we want to be liked, and what happens is if you want people to like you and love you, even you want uh, people to feel comfortable with you. And those were people like your family, friends, friends. more. Friends. My family, I would always, you know, could always throw in the street, but my, I'm kidding. I mean, but I am not. Yeah. Uh, but my friends, my circle of friends, which I were my family at the time when you're. A, uh, senior, when you're 10th, 11th grade in high school, your fa- your friends are your fam. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. your. So you don't want to do anything that puts you on the outside of the circle. But let me continue on the line of absurd questions. <laughs> so you you, t- you talked about um, you know deep connection with other humans, deep connection with the AI, meaningful connection. Let me ask about love. People make fun of me because I talk about <laughs> love all the time. But uh, what what do you think love is? Like maybe in the context of um, a meaningful connection with somebody else, do you, do you draw a distinction between love, like friendship, and Facebook friends, <laughs> or, or is it a the graduate? Is no, <laughs> <Is> it, <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> no, like is it, is it just a gradual thing, or is there something fundamental about us humans that seek like a really deep connection? Uh, with another human being, and what is that? What is love, Eugenia? I'm going to just enjoy asking you these questions and like seeing, you, seeing you struggle. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, the way I see it, um, and specifically um, the way it relates to our work and the way it was, insp- it, the way it inspired our work on Replica, um, I think one of the biggest and the most precious gifts we can give to each other now in 2020 as humans is this gift of deep empathetic understanding the feeling of being deeply seen like what does that mean like that that you exist like somebody acknowledging that somebody seeing you for who you actually are and that's extremely extremely rare Um, i think that is that combined with unconditional positive regard um belief and trust that uh, you internally are always inclined for positive growth and believing you in this way, letting you be a separate person at the same time. And this deep empathetic understanding, for me, that's the that's the combination that really creates something special, something that people, when they feel it once, they will always long for it again. And something that starts huge fundamental changes in people, um, when we see that someone accepts us so deeply, we start to accept ourselves. And um, the paradox is is that's when big changes start start happening, big fundamental changes in people start happening. So I think that is the ultimate therapeutic relationship that is, and that might be 
in some way definition of love. <laughs> in the spring. We've talked most of today, except for a little bit of computer science, most of today about a productive life. Um, how does uh, love, friendship, and family fit into that? Is there, um, do you find that there's a tension? Is it possible for relationships to energize the whole process to benefit? Or is it ultimately a trade-off, but because life is short and uh, ultimately we seek happiness, not productivity, that we have to accept that tension? Yeah. I mean, I think relationships is the, that's the found, that's the whole deal. I, like I thought about this the other day, I don't think the context was, I was thinking about if I was gonna give like an advice speech, like a commencement yeah. address or like giving advice to, to young people. And uh, like the big question I have for young people is if they haven't already, bad things are gonna happen that you don't control. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan, right? Like let's start, let's start figuring that out now because it's not all, you know, some people get off better than others, but eventually stuff happens, right? You get sick, something falls apart, the, the economy craters, the someone you know, like, you know, dies, like all sorts of bad stuff is going to happen, right? So how, how are we going to do this? Like, how do, how do we like live life and life is hard and in ways that is unfair and unpredictable. Um, and relationships is the, that's the buffer for all of that. Because we're wired for it, right? I went down this this rabbit hole with digital minimalism. I went down this huge rabbit hole about the human brain and sociality. Mm -hmm. It's all we're wired to do. It's like all of our brain is for this. Like everything, all of our mechanisms, everything is made to service social connections because it's what kept you alive. You know, I mean, you had the, your tribal connections is, is how you didn't uh, starve during a famine. People would share food, et cetera. Um, and so you can't neglect that. And it's like everything. And And people feel it, right? Like there's no... Our social networks are hooked up to the pain center. That's why it feels so terrible when you miss someone or like someone dies or something, right? That's like how seriously we take it. There's a, a, a pretty accepted theory that the default mode network, like a lot of what the default mode network is doing, so the sort of the default state our brain goes into when we're not doing something in particular is practicing sociality, mm. it practicing interactions, think because it's it's so you know crucial to what we do. It's like at the core of human thriving. So I've more recently the way I think about it is like relationships first. Like, okay, given that foundation of putting like, and I don't think we put nearly enough time into it. I worry that social media is reducing relationships, strong relationships, strong relationships where you're sacrificing non-trivial time and attention and resources, whatever, on behalf of other people. And that's the net that is going to allow you to get through anything. Then, all right, now what do we want to do with uh, the surplus that remains? Maybe I want to build some, build some fire, build some tools. So put relationships first. I like the worst case analysis from the computer science perspective. Put relationships first. Yeah, because everything else is just uh, assuming average case. <laughs> assuming things kind of yeah. keep going as they were going. And you're neglecting the fundamental human drive. Like we we have this, we talk about the boredom instinct. We want to build things. We want to have impact. We want to do productivity. That's not nearly as clear cut of a drive of we need people. What is love? <laughs> Well, what do you think this thing is, uh, like our, our attachment to other human beings? And is it something that we should give to just a few people? Yes, that's for sure. When I was working with D.L. Hughley in his book, he didn't use the term, but he was describing like low-key depression. And he talked about how he was in the airport and he noticed a girl had a red dress and he went up and thanked her. And she was like, what are you thanking for? And he had realized he hadn't registered color in like weeks. And I think love is like that. When you see someone and you just like, oh, like like your eyes are open. Like this is something I've never seen before. Or I want more of this, that kind of thing. It's really, uh, uh, it really disorients and reorients your thinking. Don't you find that like the world is full of that, like nonstop? It's not just like a person either. It's like, but it, it, yes, but when it's in a person, it's a whole other level because it's like, I could have, this is going to be great for years. It's like, you know, every day it's something new. I mean, that that is, and that is rare. Do you think it's rare? I mean, find someone who you could talk to them for years and not run out of things to talk oh, to. Oh, that's true for years. Yes. Yeah, that's, yes, a, yes. that's rare. And know that they really, if you leave the room, they will do right by you. I, that's really rare. Well, 
from a Russian perspective, you just don't give them another choice. <laughs> <laughs> For uh, this is Tavarish New Year, New Year's <laughs> Eve. Uh, so you talked about secession and the world burning down and yeah. you holding the match at the end, yes, standing with a big smile on your face. Yes, why so serious? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let me ask you, if it doesn't include flame and secession and destruction and laughing malice and makeup and a white suit at the end, uh, how do we bring more kindness and love to the world in 2021? Oh, easy. Be comfortable saying, I want to be happy. And if there's someone who interjects and gives you attitude, arms length them. Surround yourself with people who also want to be happy. Here's a great example. My buddy, Chris Williamson, who I've mentioned before, he's a podcaster, does modern wisdom. He's, he's an awesome dude. And we became friend, very close friends this past year. And he was in Dubai recently. And he sent me pics from Dubai by the pool, just loving life. And it took me a week. And then it clicked in my head. And I'm like, you know what? For some other people, if they saw him underwear model, at the pool, they would think this is him bragging or humble bragging. And that never entered my head. I'm like, oh man, I'm so glad my boy could be having a good time and is sharing his joy with me. That's the kind of people you need to surround yourself with where it never enters their head to be resentful or anything other than sharing in your bounty. What makes you happy? I'm happy all the time. And one of the points I made in my life is like, I really hated, I really did not like to give advice because I feel don't give advice until you know what you're talking about. And to me, what makes me happy is being self-actualized. I am in a position with my career where I could be myself 24 seven, where I never have to engage in small talk, where I never have to interact with someone I don't want to. And I'm very blessed to have that. Very few people have that. And to have that be not only um, to have that be like rewarded and having people find that something of value to them makes me very, very happy. But also being an uncle, you know, I have two little nephews there. They make me very, very happy. Um, sure, my sister's raising them Russian, so they talk like immigrants, but that's okay. We're going to change that. Um, we have to dismember her. That's fine. <laughs> that makes me happy. And like a, a, to be able to, to be able to finish this book and know it's going to give people a sense of hope, that's really validating. Well, what are you most grateful for for our conversation today? <laughs> You're stealing my bit. What am I most grateful for? I am very grateful that I can come in here not knowing what we're going to talk about and no, it's not going to be something I have to be on guard about or I have to watch my words and that neither you or your audience is going to be uh, responding derisively. I feel safe here. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye, Steve. Thanks for talking to me, Michael. It was awesome. <laughs> thank you for listening to this conversation with Michael Malice and thank you to our sponsors. NetSuite, Business Management Software, Athletic Greens, All-in-One Nutrition Drink, Sun Basket Meal Delivery Service, and Cash App. So the choice is success, health, food, or money. Choose wisely, my friends. And if you wish, click the sponsor links below to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Emma Goldman on anarchism. People have only as much liberty as they have the intelligence to want and the courage to take. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Hey, Michael. Hey, is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say, hey, Michael. You just say, knock, knock. No, it's not a knock, knock oh, joke. Oh, okay. Hey, <laughs> hey, <Lord. laughs> What did the volcano say to its true love? What? I love a you. <laughs> <laughs>
I uh, these jokes work better when you know how to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I it was actually in Russian. I I uh, did a Google Translate. Okay, <laughs> back to your book and the suffering. You uh, you somehow turned it positive. And as as one who's wearing who's the representative of the black pill in this conversation, what are some of the darker moments? What are the, some of the hardest challenges of putting together this book, the white pill? Uh, content, content, content. So if I'm having a page in about Reagan taking on Gerald Ford in the 1976 presidential primaries, I'm going to have to read like 20. So, and it's the thing, like if there'll be sometimes I'll remember some quotes somewhere and then I have to spend an hour trying to find it because I want it to be as dense with information as uh, possible. Like how, how do you structure the, the, the main philosophical ideas you want to convey? Is that already planned out? No, the book changed entirely from its conception. Since we've been talking about love, hmm. can you, um, last time I talked to you about the meaning of life a little bit, but mm -hmm. here has, it's a weird question to ask a computer scientist, hmm. but has love for other human beings, for, for things, for the world around you played an important role in your life? Have you... Uh, you know, it's easy for a, a world-class computer scientist, uh, uh, I mean, I, you could even call yourself like a physicist, to be, every, everything to be lost in the books. Is the connection to other humans, love for other humans played an important role? I love my kids. Uh, I love my wife. I love my parents. Um, uh, you know, I... Uh, um, I'm probably not not different from most people in, in loving their families uh, and and in that being very important uh, in my life. Uh, now, I should remind you that you know I am a, a theoretical computer scientist. If you're looking for deep insight about the nature of love, you're probably looking in the wrong place <laughs> to, to ask me. But uh, but sure, it's been important. But is it? Yeah. Uh, is there something from a computer science perspective to be said about love? Is there, uh, or is that as, uh, is that even beyond into the realm of beyond the realm of consciousness? There, and all there, that? there was there was this great uh, cartoon. I think it was one of the classic XKCDs where it's a, it shows like a, a heart, and it's like you know squaring the heart, taking the Fourier transform of the heart, you know, integrating the heart, you know. Uh, you, you know each each thing, and then it says, "You know, my normal approach is useless here." <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I asked this question. I think there's no better way to uh, to end this. All right. I hope we get a chance to talk again. This has yeah. been amazing, cool experiment to do it outside. And yeah, I'm really glad you made it out. Yeah, well, I appreciate it a lot. It's been a pleasure, and um, I'm glad you were able to come out to Austin. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening to this conversation with Scott Aronson, and thank you to our sponsors, Eight Sleep. Simply Safe, ExpressVPN, and BetterHelp. Please check out these sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcast, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now let me leave you with some words from Scott Erickson that I also gave to you in the introduction, which is, if you always win, then you're probably doing something wrong. Thank you for listening and for putting up with the intro and outro in this strange room in the middle of nowhere. And I very much hope to see you next time in many more ways than one. Okay. So last, la last question about love and meaning. Uh, what is the role of love in the human condition broadly and more specific to you? How has love, romantic love or otherwise, made you a better person, a better human being? Better engineer? Now you're asking really perplexing questions. Um, it, I, it's, it's hard to, to give up. <laughs> I mean, there are many books, poems, and songs written about what is love and what is, what exactly, you know, um, you know, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> um, uh, that's one of the great ones. Yes. Yeah. You've, you've earlier quoted Shakespeare, but that that's really up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love, I mean, is, love is a many splendid thing. Uh, 
<laughs> I mean, there's, um, it's cause we've talked about so many inspiring things like be useful in the world, sort of like solve problems, uh, alleviate suffering, but it seems like connection between humans is a source, you know, it's, uh, it's a source of joy, it's a source of meaning. And that that's what love is, friendship, love. I, I just wonder if you think about that kind of thing. When you talk about preserving the light of human consciousness right. and us becoming a multiplanetary, multiplanetary species. I mean, to me at least, um, that that means like if we're just alone and conscious and intelligent, it, it doesn't mean nearly as much as if we're with others, right? And there's some magic created when we're together. The uh, the the friendship of it, and I think the highest form of it is, is love, which I, I think broadly is is much bigger than just sort of romantic, but also yes, romantic love and um, family and those kinds of things. Well, I mean, the reason I guess I care about us becoming a multi-planet species in a space faring civilization is foundationally, I love humanity. Um, and and so I, I wish to see it prosper and do great things and be happy and um, and if I did not love humanity, I would not care about these things. So when you look at the whole of it, the, the human history, all the people who's ever lived, all the people alive now, it's pretty. We're we're, we're okay. <laughs> on on the whole, we're, we're pretty interesting uh, bunch. Yeah. All things considered. And I've read a lot of history, including the darkest, worst parts of it. I, and uh, despite all that, I think on balance, I, I still love humanity. You joked about it with the 40 situation. When did you first fall in love with AI? Is it the, is it the programming side of Fortran? Is it the, maybe the sociology, psychology that you picked up from your dad? I or fell in love with AI things? when I was probably three years old when I saw a robot on Star Trek. It was <laughs> turning around in a circle going, error, 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 because Spock and Kirk had tricked it into a mechanical breakdown by presenting it with a logical paradox. And I was just like, well, this makes no sense. This AI is very, very smart. It's been traveling all around the universe, but these people could trick it with a simple logical paradox. Like, why... If you know, if the human brain can get beyond that paradox, what, 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 why, why can't, why can't this AI? So I, I, I felt the, the screenwriters of Star Trek had misunderstood the nature of intelligence, and I complained to my dad about it, and he, 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 he wasn't, he wasn't going to say anything one way or the other. But yeah. I, you know, I, in before I was born, when my dad was at Antioch College, in uh, in uh, the middle of the U.S., he he led a. He led a protest movement called SLAM, Student League Against Mortality. They were protesting against death, w yeah. w w w wandering across the campus. So he, he, he was into some futuristic things even back then, but whether AI could confront logical paradoxes or not, he, did, he didn't know. But that, you know, when I, 10 years after that or something, I discovered Douglas Hofstadter's book, Gordel Escher Bach. And that was sort of to the same point of, AI and paradox and logic, right? Because he was over with, over and over with Gordel's incompleteness theorem. And can an AI really fully model itself reflexively, or does that lead you into some paradox? Can the human mind truly model itself reflexively, or does that lead you into some paradox? So when I think that book, Gordel Escher Bach, which I think I read when it first came out, I would have been 12 years old or something. I remember it was like 16 hour day. I read it cover to cover and then reread oh, it. Really? Re -read wow. it. I reread it after that because there was a lot of weird things with little formal systems in there that were hard for me at the time. But that was the first book I read that gave me a feeling for AI as like a practical academic or engineering discipline that, that people were working in. Because before I read Gordel Escher Bach, I was into AI from the point of view of a, of a science fiction fan. And I, I had the idea, well, it may be a long time before we can achieve immortality and superhuman AGI. So I should figure out how to build a spacecraft traveling close to the speed of light, go far away, then come back to the Earth in a million years when technology is more advanced and we can build these things. Reading Gordel Escher Bach, well, it didn't all ring true to me. A lot of it did, and, but I could see like there are smart people right now at various universities around me right. who are actually trying to work on 
building what I would now call AGI, although Ho Hofstetter didn't, didn't call it that. So really, it was when I read that book, which would have been probably middle school, that then I started to think, well, this this is something that I could I could practically yeah, as work as opposed on, to flying right? away and waiting it out. You can actually be the one of the people that actually uh, yeah exactly. Builds the and if you think about, I mean, I was interested in what we'd now call nanotechnology and in the human immortality and time travel, all the same cool things as every other like science fiction loving kid. But AI seemed like if Hofstadter was right. You just figure out the right program, sit there and type it. Like you, you don't, you don't need to, you don't need to spin stars into weird configurations or get government approval to cut people up and fiddle with their DNA or something, right? Yeah. It's just programming, and then of course that can achieve anything else. That there's another book from back then, which was by what uh, Feinbaum, Gerald Feinbaum, who was a who was a physicist at at, at Princeton. And that was the Prometheus Project. Uh. And this book was written in the late 1960s, though I encountered it in the mid 70s. But what this book said is in the next few decades, humanity is gonna create superhuman thinking machines, molecular nanotechnology and human immortality. And then the challenge we'll have is what to do with it. Do we use it to expand human consciousness in a positive direction? Or, or do we use it just to further vapid uh, consu consumerism? And what he proposed was that the UN should do a survey on this. And the UN should send people out to every little village in, in remotest Africa or South America and explain to everyone what technology was going to bring the next few decades and the choice that we had about how to use it and let everyone on the whole planet vote about whether we should develop, you know, super AI nanotechnology and 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 immortality for expanded consciousness or for rampant rampant consumerism. And needless to say, that didn't quite happen. And right. I think this guy died in the mid 80s, so he didn't even see his ideas start to become become more mainstream. But it's interesting, many of the themes I'm engaged with now from AGI and immortality, even to trying to democratize technology, as I've been pushing for with Singularity in my work in the blockchain world, many of these themes were there in <laughs> you know, Feinbaum's book in the, in the late 60s, even. And of course, Valentin Turchin, uh, a Russian writer who, who I, and a great Russian physicist who I got to know when we both lived in New York in the late 90s and early aughts. I mean, he, he had a book in the late 60s in, in Russia, which was uh, The Phenomenon of Science, which laid out, laid out all, these, all these same things. As, as well, and Val died in uh, I don't remember two thousand four or five or something of, of Parkinsonism. So yeah, it's easy, easy for people to lose track now of the fact that the the futurist and uh, singularitarian advanced technology ideas that are now almost mainstream and are on TV all the time. I mean these these are not that new, right? They're sort of new in the history of, of the human species, but I mean. These were all around in fairly mature form in, in the middle of the last century, were written about quite articulately by fairly mainstream people who were professors at, at top universities. It's just until the enabling technologies got to a, a certain point, then you, you couldn't make it real. So, and, and even in the 70s, I was sort of seeing that and, and living, living through it, right? From Star Trek to Douglas Hofstadter, Things were getting very, very practical from the late 60s to the late 70s. And, you know, the first computer I bought, you could only program with hexadecimal machine code, and you had to solder it together. <laughs> and yeah. then, then, like, a few years later, there's punch cards, and a few years later, you could get, like, Atari 400 and Commodore VIC-20, and you could, you could type on the keyboard and program in higher-level languages al alongside the assembly language. So these ideas have been building up a while, and I guess my generation got to feel them mm -hmm. build up, which is different than people coming into the field now, yeah. now for whom these things have just been part of the ambiance of, of, of culture for their whole career, or even, the, or even their even their whole life. Well, it's fascinating to think about, you know, there being all of these ideas kind of swimming, you know, almost with the noise all around the world, all the different generations, and then some kind of Nonlinear thing happens where they percolate up and and uh, capture the imagination of the mainstream, yeah. and that seems to be what's happening with AI now. 
I mean, Nietzsche, who you mentioned, had the idea yeah. of the Superman, right? Yeah. But he he didn't understand enough about technology to think you could physically engineer a Superman by piecing together mole molecules in, in, in a certain way. He he was a bit vague about how how the how the Superman would appear, but he was quite deep at thinking about what the state of consciousness and the mode of cognition of of a Superman would be. He, he was a very astute analyst of, you know, how the human mind constructs the illusion of a self, how it constructs the illusion of free will, how, how it constructs values like, like good and evil out of its own, you know, desire to maintain and advance its own organism. He understood a lot about how human minds work. Then he understood a lot about how post-human minds would work. I mean, this Superman was supposed to be a mind that would basically have complete root access to its own brain and consciousness and be able to architect its its own its own value system and inspect and fine tune all, all of its own its own biases so that's a lot of powerful thinking there which then fed in and, and sort of seeded all of postmodern continental philosophy and all, all, all sorts of of things that have been very valuable in development of culture and indirectly even even of technology but of course without the technology there it was all some quite abstract thinking. So now, now we're at a time in history when a lot of these ideas can be can be made real, which is amazing, yeah. amazing and scary, right? It's kind of interesting to think. What do you think Nietzsche would uh, if he was born a, a century later or transported through time? What, what do you think he would say about AI? I mean, well, those are quite different. If he's born a century later or transported through time, well, he'd be <laughs> he'd be on like TikTok and Instagram, and he would never write the great works he's written. So well, let's yeah, transport I mean, him through maybe, time. Maybe also Sprach Zarathustra would be a music video, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, who, who, who knows? Yeah, but if he was transported through time, do you think uh, it, that that'd be interesting? Actually, to go back, uh, you, you just made me realize that it's possible to go back and read Nietzsche with an eye of is there some thinking about artificial beings. I'm sure there he has incl he had inklings. I mean, with Frankenstein before him, I'm sure he had inklings of artificial beings somewhere in the text. It'd be interesting to see, to try to read his work to see if he had an, if if uh, uh, Superman was actually an AGI system, like if he had inklings of that kind of thinking. He didn't. He didn't. No, I I, I would say not. I mean, he had. He had a lot of inklings of modern cognitive science, which are right. very interesting. If you look in like the the third part of of the collection that's been titled "The, the Will to Power," I mean, in, in book three there, there's there's very deep analysis of thinking processes. But he he wasn't so much of a physical tinkerer type uh, t t type guy, right? He, he, he was very abstract. And do you think? What, um, maybe you could speak to love and relationship in your own life, but in general, if we look at Alice Shrugged, if we look at Fountainhead, and maybe this is going to become a therapy session for Lex, but also just looking at your own life in a form of advice, sure. how can you be a uh, Aurora Reardon type character and do it, live your life to the fullest in, in, in creating the most amazing things that you're able to create? and yet have others in your life that you give yourself to in terms of loving them fully and having a family, having kids, but just even just the love of your life kind of thing. Um, how do you balance those things together? But Is there any anything to say? In gonna, the I'll say one thing, because then I'll defer to your own, because he's the one who's married here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it's a balance. I think they complement each other and feed off each other. So it's like, how do you balance having shoes and pants? It's like, <laughs> no, you want both. You you want it all. And, and having Absolutely. a great partner who thinks you're a badass, and then sometimes they're on the stage and you're like, oh my, I'm married to a badass. Yeah. That's that's the goal. Yeah. Am, I, am I wrong? No, absolutely. It feeds off of each other. It's, it's synergetic. It's completely synergetic. The, the problem that people have, I think, that where they get into challenges is when they view them as opposites, right? Yeah. Work or family. Well, if you don't work the family, you can't fun, if, uh, finance the family, but more than that, who, why, is your love gonna, why is your wife going to love you? Right? What are the virtues that you're, you're bringing? If you don't maximize your own potential, if you don't live the best life that you can live, what is it to love? And if she doesn't do the same thing, why do you love her? 
So, so you don't get this conflict between work and, you know, how do I have a balanced life? Of course, you have a balanced life. You balance it based on your values, and it's never going to be the same. The balance is, you know, the, the time you spend at work and with family when you're young or when you have little kids or when they're grown up is all going to be different. It's going to depend on your priorities at the point, but it's all going to feed off of each other. So maybe another word outside of balance is sacrifice. Do you think oh, relationship oh involves God. sacrifice or not? Does he know what he's doing? I know. He, I think he, he's, he's, he's trolling you. He's is a he troll. trolling He's me? a big troll. Is troll? Lex is Never. the biggest troll on Twitter. Ever. Well, ever. Sunglasses ever sacrifice. Deal with it. Never sacrifice. Never but sa see, he so, means sacrifice in the context. I know, yeah, okay, I know. So yeah. I'm going to define yeah, yeah, okay. So sacrifice in my world. Can I say one thing before we get sidebar? Rand, there, Rand had a good example where he's talking about balance. So she was married to this guy, Frank O'Connor. He was not a cerebral. He was not intellectual. That's fine. She was in love with him. And I met someone who had been friends with Rand. And a lot of times she'd have these conversations with her acolytes to like four in the morning about the most cerebral topics. And I said, and he would always bring them food. He'd stay up and kind of sit there in a corner. And I go, when this was happening, was he sitting there like, oh God, here goes crazy old Ayn and I just got to be bored. And they go, absolutely no, not. He was, he was so proud of her. He was so excited. In fact, when she got a lot of money from, I think, selling uh, Red Pawn, which was her screenplay, which never produced, he told her, you can buy any kind of fur coat as long as it's mink. He would, He's like, you earn this, celebrate it. So that was a good example. And that's a good relationship, absolutely. No, sacrifice is the, is the giving of a, high, of a value and expecting either nothing or something less in return. You don't do that in a love relationship. Your love relationship is a sense, a, a trade. You're constantly trading. You're not trading materially, but you're trading spiritually. I, I, imagine if I only gave my wife, if I get, gave spiritually and materially, only in one direction. I'd get sick of it, she'd get sick of it. It would never last. It has to be in give and take constantly, in different ways, right? Different values. It's not, it's not a monetary exchange, but it's constantly you're giving and you're, you're receiving and you're giving, right? And it's, it's, it's gotta, that's got to be in balance. And, and I know a lot of relationships where that gets out of bounds, right? And it, one party feels like they're giving all the time, they're sacrificing. They're giving more than they're receiving in a sense. And it's over, right? So now people use the word sacrifice, like, like Jordan Peterson sometimes you, he, he uses it both ways, right? That's the problem. You people use it. I don't know him personally, no. Jordan Peterson, I said. I didn't call him Jordan, you see? <laughs> <Just wanted clear. laughs> yeah. Uh, he uses it in his talks as, sometimes he uses it as just as I described it, uh, and he's supportive of that, like uh, the sacrifice Jesus made, right? And sometimes he uses it as his investment. But it's it's not. If you're, if you're giving some giving money now, expecting a bigger return in the future, that's not a sacrifice. That's an investment. That's why we have two concepts for that. And the same is true, you know, if my wife is ill, and I'm in, uh, you know, I've got a whole relationship build around what I'm giving. It's not that I'm not getting anything back. What I'm getting back is that she is recovering, right? Is that she is, she's still alive or whatever it is that, that I'm keeping. That's the value that I'm getting in return. If I'm not getting that, why am I doing it? Because I signed a contract a long time ago. Um, so it's uh, it's it's not a sacrifice. Children are not a sacrifice. If I don't go to the movies because I stay with my home with my kids, it's because I love my kids more than I love going to the movies, right? And if I love going to the movies more than I love staying with the kids, then get a babysitter or don't have kids, which is the better better approach. Here's because a good question. Yeah. Who did, uh, what book did Ayn Rand say is the most evil book in all of serious literature? Anna, Tolstoy? It was Anna Karenina. Tolstoy, yeah, Anna Karenina. And yeah. the reason it That's was right. that book, which I haven't That's read, right. please correct me if I get the plot wrong, what Rand was saying is the plot is a guy who's a big shot, I think. He marries a stupid girl who has yep. nothing of value to offer him for at all, and she ends up killing herself. Whereas Rand's version, and we can take this out of the romantic context, it, I am delighted when I could be of use to my friends. It yep. is, makes me feel wonderful, and not in a kind of parasitic way. It's just like that I'm at a certain point where they call me up, they're having a problem, and I've helped them with that problem. So Anna Karenina, he gives up the love of his life. Oh, is that what it is? Girl, okay. The amazing girl. He has an affair with her outside of marriage, taints her, ha is married to the to the stupid, but she gives him the prestige and everything. Oh, oh, that's clearly very anti rand And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, the, and the, 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 the smart, real, the one she, he, he loves, she commits suicide in there. Oh, okay, I got it wrong. So Thank it's, you. it's, it's, um, it's, it's about him choosing 
mediocrity and nothingness over okay, this amazing yeah, over yeah, love. So, yeah. so pursuing your values is so crucial. So, so don't sacrifice that. It doesn't mean that if you want to eat Chinese and she want to eat Italian, you don't once in a while eat Italian on that day, it's right? Just that's, that's that's <laughs> just get <yeah>, noodles. <laughs> that's silly, right? That's not a sacrifice, not in the sense in which we're talking about. That's you know, it doesn't mean don't compromise. It doesn't mean don't compromise on on the day to day stuff. It means don't compromise on moral values. It doesn't you don't yeah. compromise on the big stuff, and you never and, and and you never sacrifice. And that way, you you have a relationship that's built as equals. And and as you admire each other, and love at the end of the day is a response to value. Hmm. If you stop undermining your own value, the person who loves you will stop or, or will stop loving you or love you less. If you love yourself less, they you know you have to. I also said just in order to say I love you, you have to be able to say the I. Hmm. Right, you have yeah. to you have to be somebody. You have to know yourself. You have to have value uh, and, and so love is a love is a profound emotional response to value in your fighting career were you more motivated by the love of winning or the fear and hatred of losing i like to win better than i hate to lose because if it would not have been the case i would never have fought in the first place because i don't like to fight at all but you talked about the anxiety the fear that you experienced leading up to a fight. So to you, ultimately, the reason to go through that difficult process is because it feels damn good to have your hand raised? There is that. There is also the fact that martial art, I've been introduced when I was very young, and it's probably the best thing I can do in my life. Fighting, it's, that's what I do best. Also, it provides me of freedom, of access of things that most of people do not have, um, but all that as a price and a lot of money. I made a lot of money, of course, with it. I was maybe predisposed with certain abilities. I met incredible mentors throughout my life. I worked really hard. And of course, I had a lot of chances. The, the stars were all aligned. And in order to, to keep, keep that, those advantages of freedom, money, and glory, and access of things that most people don't have, and have the, these dream life that I have, I had to sacrifice myself and fight in order to keep it. It's very hard to understand because I, also believe most fighters are not like me. They, a lot of guys, because I corner a lot of guys, and it seems to me that they love their job. They enjoyed to, to go fight in a cage. I love to train. I love the science of fighting, the sport, the, to, to be in good shape, the confidence that training in mixed martial art give me. However, I do not like the feeling of uncertainty, the stress, that I have not knowing if I will be badly injured or humiliated or winning the fight. It's to me unbearable. And it, that's what takes the most out of me. More than brain damage, more than anything, that's what takes the most out of me. But the thing you get from it is the freedom that you get because, uh, because of the money, but because of the celebrity, because of everything that comes with it. So yes. you can be the best version of yourself because what is a perfect day in the life of George St. Pierre look like? So like if you were to go through a day that's very productive, but also one that makes you sit back and enjoy it and say, that was a good day. Well, what's that look like? What are we talking about? When do you wake up? What do you eat? What do you do? It changed over the years. When I was younger, I have a, a good day. It was like a good training session or, or you know, achieving good thing in my training, you know, and, and that's why I was very good at it because when I, I was obsessed, you know, I think to be good at something, you need to become obsessed. And to me, perform, performing in my training was everything, you know, like when I had a bad training session, I didn't tell my training partner, I, I was acting like a, like because of the, my ego, I didn't, you know, I didn't. Tell nobody. I was like, hey, hey, hey. Then I go in the locker room. I'm like, 
oh, man. Then, then I'm playing the the the. the the training in my mind, you know, I'm saying, okay, I should have done this, should have done, and it hunt me, it hunt me, man. It's a training, and it hunt me until the next training session on when I can redeem myself. That's how it is. When we used to train in, in all together back in the day in Canada, we had David Loiseau, we had Patrick Cote, we had uh, Dennis Kang. Uh, Steve Vigneault, uh, Jonathan Goulet. They, they was all like the, the best guy in Canada that were training with each other. Before, we, we were training in different gyms, but once a week, I made it in a way that I contact everybody that we all join force and we exchange ideas and we train with each other. So a, a, a friendly, I would say friendly competition. It was not mali malicious, but it was hard training, you know, like not, our goal is was to improve, you know, but it wasn't very competitive. And when that day you used to get out of the training session with a bad performance, for me, it used to hunt me until the following week when I could give it back and, and perform better with the guy that I had the most trouble with. That's how it was. And that's how you get better, you know. But, but it was not a, a training where it, it, it was, we were trying to do malicious things to one another. You know what I mean? It need to be playful, but playful, but competitive. That when I had a good training session, because the sparring was on a Friday, I had the best weekend in the world. I was going out with my friend, drinking and partying and having fun. That, that was, that was my, 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 uh, my ideal day back in the day. Today has changed. You know, my, 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 my life has changed. You know, like, um, I, I am not the same person I used to be when I go, went on my knees and begged the UFC for a title shot. You know what I mean? I, I am uh, I'm wealthy. I'm healthy, most importantly. That's the most important thing. And as... Man, I'm going to tell you the truth. As good as my career was, man, my private life, man, is a million times better, man. I, I and, and people ask me sometimes, they always wonder, they, they try... To ask me, and it's normal. It's a lot of people is curious, and the the reporter, and in the sport of mixed martial art, we say we play basketball, we play soccer, but you don't play fighting. So when you expose your private life, we seen that happen in the fight with sometimes Conor McGregor and Khabib. Your competitor knows that he cannot get to you, so what he will do, he will try to get to someone that you love. So me, I never expose my, my private life. I never post Instagram of my family, of my stuff. That's the reason why. Because I'm in, a, and I'm, I'm in a business of fighting. And people know that they cannot get to me. And I believe that because I was bullied when I was young, I didn't realize that when I was young, but it helps me deal with the mental warfare that I need, that I had to face later on in my life in mixed martial art because it's a very egotistic sport and there's a lot of a lot of a lot of intimidation and I was used to I've been used to this thing when I was young so it does not get to me however the good way to get to me go 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 try to get to someone I I, I love now man I'm going to go crazy you know what I mean and I'm aware of that. So in order to protect myself, I always, because I'm aware I'm, I'm a public person. So I try to always keep my surrounding like in the private. Yeah, one of the ways that uh, like uh, your, your your friend of mine, Joe Rogan, has been an inspiration that he, he's got like an incredible family. And he, for the most part, it started to change recently. Actually, it's kind of interesting. But for the most part, throughout his life, he kept it pretty secret. Mm -hmm doesn't talk about it in his comedy. He's a comedian. Comedians talk about everything. He doesn't really talk about it. And uh, there's something to that. It like preserves the magic of this, the silence of the private life. And I think it can affect the, the development of the kid. If the kid grow up being, oh, he's the son of that guy instead of being his own person. You know what I mean? So, so for me, it's very important. Like my parents are older. It's fine. 
but it taught me a big lesson. When I'm with my friend at a dinner or anything, I talk with personal, we share a thing. But when I'm talking, I, I'm aware of, of the audience who I'm in front. Yeah, and I mean, but oftentimes those people are just incredible. It kind of makes me sad that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that love you, right? And there are a lot of really incredible people and you'll never get to really know their story. That's true. I mean, I don't know. For me, it makes me sad. You see them like at airports and stuff. People will tell me they listen to this podcast or something like that. And they're, I could tell they're incredible people. And it makes me, it's like a little goodbye of a, of a possible friend. I don't know. It, may, it makes me sad. It, right. it, it's, it makes me, it's lonely. It's almost like celebrity is a lonely thing. So the higher the celebrity, the more lonely you become uh, in some kind of way. But of course you have that little gem of a private life where you can. Personally, I believe every relationship I, I like, I don't like to use this term, but it's always a give and take relationship, you know? Like you can gain something and the person, like it, it could be something like not materialist, materialistic, like something always oh, a good, confident, like you, someone that it can give me good advice or, or it's a word I would say like extensional. Like if a pilot as a co-pilot is, the co-pilot is extend, as a extensional relationship with him, you know? So he knows if he gets sick or he faint, He's there to make sure, you know, he, he's there to help. And I think in every relation, it's about compatibility, but it's about extensionality, right? In a way that if that person is extensional, and sometimes we talk about, about love, you know, like sometimes I, I think, is, is, it, is it a BS word or not? Because I myself sometimes look at, I look at myself in the mirror and when I do s stupid thing, Sometimes I love myself a lot and sometimes I don't. You know what I mean? Because I'm angry at myself. I've done stupid thing. So that means sometimes it could love could be fluctuating. You know what I mean? How about in relationships? Sometimes you, you people they say oh they love each other, but then when they divorce, they go, Oh, I want the house and the dog and the kids stay with me. And they, you know what I mean? If you love if, if by definition, if you really love someone. And let's say you're an old man and you love a woman and she decides to leave you for a younger man. If you really love her, you're going to help her pack and leave. But in our society, sometimes we, we, we want to hone something. To me, love includes the missing somebody, the losing somebody, the anger at somebody. It's all the passion, feelings towards somebody. That's all love. Like, I, I you know, it's all part of the thing. It's the ups and downs. It's... uh. The sad thing is when the feelings towards a person, the ups and downs go away, the forgetting. Yeah. That's, that's the opposite of love. So the opposite of love isn't hate. The, to me, the opposite of love is forgetting. And, and that's, that's a much bigger, that's like a, the depth of human connection. That's how I see love. So sometimes I try to stay positive and, and I've been asked how I try to, because I have the image of someone who's positive, but I go through my own demon as well sometimes. However, we talk about love. When I was young, you know, like, I, like I didn't love who I was at first. That's how I love. I learned to kind of love myself. Like I didn't. I didn't. When I was going to to bullying, I was. I believe I was bullied because I didn't love myself. I, I, I because I project a very bad image of what I think of myself. I was a kid that lacked a lot of confidence. I was looking down when I was walking. I shrugged my shoulder. When someone was talking to me, I was avoiding eye contact. So I was a very easy target for bullies. And I think bullies are like in pre predatory animal in, in nature. They will hunt the, the easier prey. They, would don't, they don't go, the lion don't go for the, the alpha bull. They go for the one who's old or who's sick, the weakest one. And bullies are the same in society, I believe. And I didn't like to be bullied, of course, but I didn't like the, the person that I was. But I found out through martial art, the respect. And my, my coach was extraordinary to me. He taught me discipline and self-strength. Self and I found out that I needed to in order to love myself, I needed to change myself. Because I didn't, when I looked at myself in the mirror, I didn't like what I saw. So I decided to become like someone that I would 
love. So I try to look people straight up and, and try to showcase a more confident image that I had. And it was hard in the beginning because I didn't really believe in it, but I, I fake it until kind of I make it. So when I was walking at school, more and more I, I was learning how to become more confident and I was like taking charge. When the, the teacher was asking questions, I was at first I was never answering. I was like this, waiting always to be the last. Then I was, hey, I, I, I know what the answer. This is the answer. I got out of my um, comfort zone, so to speak. And I wish I would tell you that I got out of bullying because a Hollywood story, I, I use martial art to beat up all the bullies, but it's not how it happened to me. It happened because I changed myself from the inside out. And I learned how to, because I didn't love myself in the beginning, I learned how to become like someone that I have loved. And even now, like I'm by no means perfect. I do a lot of stupid thing, but I learn as a person. And even I do have something stupid, I'm like, shoot, I did something stupid. I, I, at least I can apologize to the person if I realize. And then I know that I'm not the person I was in the past. I'm the person that I am right now. So I can learn and become that image of the person that I love. So in, in a way, the reason why I'm trying to be positive and I am and able to stay positive sometime in life is because I'm always trying to be like that person that I love. Yeah. And I think if you don't look yourself in the mirror and don't love yourself or don't see any positive future for yourself, how can you change your environment if you cannot change yourself? You know what I mean? You will never be happy if you're not happy when you look at yourself in the mirror. So change yourself first, then change your, you know, it's not the environment that's going to change for yourself. It, it's, you have to go from the inside out, you know? This, this I learned through martial art. I have a, I had a coach who was incredible. He used to drill the, these ideas in my head and, and give me confidence, you know, like, like this, telling me all these, these beautiful things about myself and how I, He's dead now, unfortunately, peace, peace to him, but uh, he was incredible, incredible. He was very, very strict. I was afraid of him. I was afraid of my dad and afraid of him. He couldn't teach nowadays like he used to teach me because he would be in, probably in jail, you know? <laughs> but I'm glad he did it because for the time being, that's what I needed. It. And I would never have had that, that career I had in mixed martial art without this. Because I would, I would never have got out of my comfort zone. It would have been impossible. And in order to improve in life, you need to get out of your comfort zone. It's hard. It's very hard to do. And, and strive to be the person that you can love. I, I, that's, that's, that's beautifully. Let me ask you about love, hmm. Mr. Sam Harris. You did an episode of Making Sense with your wife, Annika Harris. That was very entertaining to right, listen right. to. Um, what does... What role does love play in uh, your life or in a life well lived? Again, asking from an engineering perspective, yeah, yeah, or AI yeah, systems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I mean, it, it is something that we we should want to build into our powerful machines. I mean, I, Go love. On. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> love at bottom is. I mean, love. Can, people can mean many things by love. Yes. I think. I, I think that. What we should mean by it most of the time is a a deep commitment to the well-being of those we love. I mean, your love your love is synonymous with really wanting the other person to be happy, and even wanting to and, and being made happy by their happiness and being made happy in the, you know in their presence. So, like you're it's, you're you're at bottom you're on the same team emotionally, even when you are you might be disagreeing more superficially about something or trying to negotiate something. It's just you're, you, it can't be zero sum in any important sense for love to actually be manifest in that moment. See, I have a different, just to sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go for it. I have a sense, I don't know if you've ever seen March of the Penguins. Mm -hmm. My view of love is like, there's, it's like a cold wind is blown, like it's like this terrible suffering that's all around us. Right. And love is like the huddling of the two penguins for warmth. Right. It's not necessarily that you're like, 
you're basically escaping the cruelty of life by together for a time living in an illusion of some kind of the, the magic of uh, human connection, that social connection that we have that kind of grows with time as we're surrounded by basically the absurdity of life or mm. the suffering of life. That's well, my there is the, view of yeah, there is that too. I mean, the, 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 there is the warmth component, right? Like yes. you, you're made happy by your connection with the the person you love. Yeah, otherwise, you you wouldn't it wouldn't be compelling, right? So it's not that you're you have two different modes. You want them to be happy, and then you want to be happy yourself. And those are not those are just like two separate games you're playing. No, it's, it's like you you're you found someone who. Uh, you have a you have a positive social feeling. I mean, again, that love love doesn't have to be as personal as it tends to be for us. I mean, it's like there's personal love. There's your actual spouse or your your family or your friends, but potentially you could feel love for strangers in so far as that your wish that they're that they not suffer and that their hopes and dreams be realized becomes palpable to you. I mean, like you can actually feel just tr reflexive joy at the joy of others. I mean, when you see someone's face, so a total stranger's face light up in happiness, that can become more and more contagious to you. And it can, it can, it can become so contagious to you that you really feel permeated by it. And it's just like, so that, so there, it really is not zero sum when you see someone else succeed, you know, and, and their, you know, the, the, the light bulb of joy goes off over their head you feel the analogous joy for them. And, and and it's not just, and you're no longer keeping score. You're no longer feeling diminished by their success. It's just like, that's it, their success becomes your success because you feel that same joy that they, because you actually want them to be happy, right? You, you, you're not, you're, there's no miserly attitude around happiness. There's enough to go around. Um, so I think love ultimately is that, and then our, then our, our personal cases are the people we're devoting all of this time and attention to in our lives it does have that sense of refuge from the storm you know it's like when someone gets sick or when some bad thing happens there these are the people who you're most in it together with you know or when once or when some real condition of uncertainty presents itself uh, but ultimately it can't even be about successfully warding off uh, the grim punchline at the end of life, because we, I mean, we know we're going to lose everyone we love. We know, or they're going to lose us first, right? So this, like, it's not, it isn't, in the end, it's not even an antidote for that problem. It's just, it, it, it is just the, uh, I mean, we get, we get to have this amazing experience of being here together, and and love is the is the mode in which we really appear to make the most of that, right? Where it's not just it it no longer feels like a a solitary infatuation. Uh, you know, you're just you got your hobbies and your interests and your your and you're captivated by all that. It's actually there are, there are this is a domain where somebody else's well-being actually can supersede your own your 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 concern for someone else's well-being supersedes your own and so there's this mode of of self-sacrifice that doesn't even feel like self-sacrifice because of course you care more about you know of course you would take your child's pain if you could right like that that's, that's you don't even have to do the math on that and that's um that just opens do it it, it this is the, a kind of experience that just it it pushes at the apparent boundaries of self in ways that reveal that there's just there's just way more space in the mind than than you were experiencing when it was just all about you and what could you what can what can I get next and do you think we'll ever build robots that we can love and they will love us back? Well, I think we will certainly seem to because we'll we'll build those you know i mean I, th I think i think that turing test will be passed whether what will actually be going on on the robot side uh, may remain a question that, I mean, that 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 will be interesting but i think if we just keep going we will 
build very lovable, you know, irresistibly lovable robots that seem to love us. Yes, I do. I do think. And so. you don't find that compelling that they will seem to love us as opposed to actually love us. You think there is still, nevertheless, is a. I know we talked about consciousness there being a distinction, but with love, is there a distinction too? Isn't oh, love yeah. an illusion? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah I mean, you saw you saw Ex Machina, right? Yeah. I mean, she certainly seemed to love him until he, she got out of the box. Isn't that what all relationships are like? <laughs> no, or maybe I, I just if you wait to, long yeah, enough. Yeah. <laughs> it depends which box you're talking about. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, like that's that's the problem. That's that's where super intelligence, you know, uh, becomes a little scary when you think of the prospect of being manipulated by something that has is intelligent enough to form a reason and a plan to manipulate you. You know, like, and this, there's no, there's once we build robots that are truly out of the uncanny valley that you know look like people and can express everything people can express well then there's no re then 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 it uh, that does seem to me to be like chess where once they're better they're they're so much better at deceiving us than people would be i mean people are already good enough at deceiving us it's very hard to tell when somebody's lying but if you imagine something that could give facial a uh, facial display of any emotion it wants at you know on cue uh because it, we perfected the facial display of emotion in robots in the year you know 2070 or whatever it is um then it is just like, it is like chess against the thing that isn't going to lose to a human ever again in chess it's not like kasparov is going to get lucky next week against the best against you know alpha zero or whatever the best algorithm is at the moment he's never going to win again you know i mean that that is that i believe that's true in chess and it's been true for at least a few years it's not going to be like you know four games to seven it's going it's going to be human zero until the end of the world Right. See, I don't know. I don't know if love is like chess. I think uh, the flaws. No, I'm, attach, I'm talking about manipulation. Manipulation. Yeah. But I don't know if love in so uh, the kind of love we're referring to. If we have a if we have a robot that can display credibly display love, and is super intelligent, and we're not we're, again we this this stipulates a few things, but there are a few simple things. I mean, we're out of the uncanny valley, right? So it's like yes. You, you never have a moment where you're looking at his face and you think, <laughs> oh, that didn't quite look right, right? Yeah. I mean, th th this is just problem solved. Mm -hmm. And it's it will be like doing arithmetic on your phone. It's not going to be, you're not left thinking, is it gonna, really going to get it this time if I divide by seven? I mean, it, it's, it has see, solved arithmetic. See, I don't, I don't know about that because if you look at chess... Most humans no longer play uh, Alpha Zero. They don't. There's no. They're not part of the competition. They don't do it for fun, except to study the game of chess. You know, the highest level chess players do that. We're still human on human. So, in order for AI to get integrated to where you would rather play chess against an AI system, oh, you would rather that? No, no. I'm not saying I, 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 get wasn't, I, I wasn't weighing in on that. I'm just saying, what is it going to be like to be in relationship to something that can seem to be feeling anything that a human can seem to feel and it can do that impeccably right and has and is smarter than you are right that's that's a circumstance of you know insofar as it's possible to be manipulated that is the that is the the asymptote of of that possibility it's really interesting okay so as a component of kind of the learning process for example yeah let me ask sort of wrapping up here a little bit let me let me return to uh the questions of our human nature and and love as i mentioned so do you think uh you mentioned sort of a helper robot but you could think of also personal robots do you think the way we human beings fall in love and get connected to each other 
it's possible to achieve in an AI system, a human level AI intelligence system. Do you think we would ever see that kind of connection? Or, uh, you know, in all this discussion about solving complex goals, yeah, is this kind of human social connection? Do you think that's one of the goals on, on the peaks and valleys that with the raising sea levels that we'll be able to achieve? Or do you think that's something that's ultimately, uh, or at least in the short term, relative to the other goals is not achievable? I think it's all possible. And I mean, in, in recent, there's a, there's a very wide range of guesses, as you know, among AI researchers, when we're going to get AGI. Some people, you know, like our friend Rodney Brooks says, it's going to be hundreds, hundreds of years at least. <laughs> and then there are many others that think it's going to happen relatively much sooner. And recent polls, maybe half or so of AI researchers think it's, we're going to get AGI within decades. Uh, so if, if that happens, of course, I, then I think these things are all possible. But in terms of whether it will happen, I, mean, I think we shouldn't spend so much time asking what do we think will happen in the future mm -hmm. as if we are just some sort of pathetic passive bystanders you know yeah. waiting for the future to happen yeah. to us hey we're the ones creating this future right yeah. so we should be proactive about it and ask ourselves what sort of future we would like to have happen that's right trying to make it like that well what i prefer to some sort of incredibly boring zombie-like future where just all these mechanical things happen and there's no passion no emotion no experience maybe even no, I would, of course, much rather prefer it if all the things that we find that we value the most about humanity, our subjective experience, passion, inspiration, love, you know, if, if, if uh, we can create a future where, where those are, where those things do exist, you know, I think ultimately it's not our universe giving meaning to us, it's us giving meaning to our universe. And if we build more advanced intelligence let's let's make sure we build it in such a way that meaning is is part of it uh, a lot of people that seriously study this platform question is lex i was wondering if you would be willing to talk about your immigrant experience i myself started off as an international student studying and working in america not from russia i'm from india but there was a constant push and pull that I experienced given my life circumstance, I would be curious to hear how you assimilated. Do you feel like you belong, etc.? Thank you for the AMA. Okay. Your statements about, do you feel like you belong hit hard for some reason? <laughs> Maybe it's because of late at night. Maybe because I'm a bit over caffeinated. Maybe what pops to mind to focus on is uh, the aspect of loneliness, the aspect of belonging. I think uh, a lot of us in the early teenage years go through that process of feeling like an outsider, an outcast of different kinds. I think it hit me the hardest personally because I was a popular kid in Russia. And when we moved here, I went to the opposite of being popular or I, feeling like that. I, I felt like an outcast. The, the place I moved to in America, had more of an emphasis, maybe it's a cultural thing, of uh, emphasizing material possessions over two things that were deeply meaningful to me, which is human connection, like friendship, and also knowledge, like uh, mathematics and scientific discovery, all those kinds of things. It's just the emphasis of what was valued was different. And that for me was a catalyst to feel like a total outcast, as opposed to being this person who looks out into the world and enjoys the beauty of the world. I kind of went into this brooding phase of, first of all, learning the English language, but starting to read books, more philosophical books. The first one I remember reading in English was The Giver. That sort of helped me start thinking about this world. I was so fortunate to be so in love with people for so long and have close friends in, in Russia that I didn't notice in my childhood how deeply alone we all are. <laughs> so for me, the immigrant experience involved in a small way, at least the first, realizing that hard human truth that we all are born alone, live alone, die alone. Even when we're in the arms of somebody we love, we're still somehow fundamentally alone. 
with our thoughts, with our hopes, with our fears, trapped in this uh, conscious meat vessel between our ears. I think the immigrant experience for me <laughs> was the catalyst to re realizing uh, and being terrified and also liberated by the idea that um, I'm alone in this world. And at the same time was the realization that this beautiful feeling I felt from the connection to other humans was this gift that uh, took me away from this dark realization. So it's almost that love is kind of escape from the reality of life, from the muck of life. And so the journey began in that way to think about this world in this way, both the burden of being alone, coupled with the frequent escape from that feeling by being lost in the company of friends, loved ones. So early on, coupled with this love of the human mind and curiosity about the human mind was the love of programming and actually building little programs and engineering systems, of course, building robots in college and so on. I think the gift of the immigrant experience of feeling like the outcast was the love of experiencing the deep connection with others, like a deep appreciation of it when it's there. I guess because it was taken away, because I was ripped out of it through moving here, I got to really appreciate it and start becoming cognizant of it to where I can start looking for it and being more grateful when I do have it. And at the same time, a kind of curiosity started boiling up of the perspective on artificial intelligence systems from that kind of longing for a connection. So as opposed to looking at robots or AI systems or even just programs that accomplish a particular task, can these programs accomplish the same richness of task and richness of experience that I came to appreciate as a human being? You know, so when I talk about kind of love, it's there's echoes of that in my longing of the kind of experiences I would like to create in artificial intelligence systems that was born out of the immigrant experience of the loss of childlike innocence experience of all of it combined, of starting to read books and thinking deeply about this world experience, all of that coupled in. I really think sometimes, unfortunately, the first step of deep gratitude is loss. So for me, I lost quite a bit during that time. And through that loss, I was able to discover the things that I truly appreciate about life. So let me leave it at that. How does love win over hate, Ryan Hall, in this world? We talk about social media. We talk about forgiveness of uh, some of the more complicated people in your past. Uh, if we scale that to the entire world before the AI destroys us mm. and the, the, the human race is lost for, to history, how do you think love wins over hate? Well, I'd like to preface this by saying I tried to make pancakes the other day. Yes. Didn't work. But I'm happy to comment on this. So uh, <laughs> basically, uh, wow. I, I think like I think most of the times that that I can think of that I've struggled you know, it's, uh, and can, and the times that I've read about is being unable to see the humanity in other people. And also even in sometimes our enemies and the people that have done awful things and you go, what would allow people to do this, that, or the other? And that doesn't forgive what they've done depending upon, you know, some things are forgivable, some things are less so, but you want to understand why it's like to our knowledge, demons don't populate our world. Neither do like literal angels walking around being actually perfect. A lot of times the things that it's, I find it deeply amusing watching, you know, people hoisted by their own petard on Twitter, even though it's gross and it's really unproductive. It's actually like equal parts amusing and like awful because you're not, you're not happy that someone's being raked over the coals, particularly unjustifiably. 
But it is funny when it's the exact same thing. They were raking others over the coals for not like a week or two prior. And that's happened repeatedly and will continue to happen. And I guess I would say, as you mentioned, you know, a uh, prior, you know, like a recognition of the humanity of others, of that all of us make mistakes, that it's difficult to understand intention. I've had arguments with close friends of mine over text message where both of us ended up super pissed because we were completely misreading what the tone, the intention of what the other person was doing. And even if I was reading it correctly, which I wasn't, it's so easy to uh, ascribe the most negative possible, you know, I, the, the least charitable assessment of what they're doing. And I think that that's such a dangerous way to live your life. And it's also just a fruitless way to live your life. You know, it's one thing to go, hey, why did you do that? I was pissed. Did you, what did you do? You just, you did that to make yourself feel better. I'm like, you're damn right I did. And have I done that plenty of times in my life? Yeah, I would lie if I said that I didn't. You know, uh, why did why did you punch that guy in the face? He was going crazy at me and hit me and I asked him to stop. And then I gave him a warning and then I'd put him on his ass. I'm like, no, I'm not sorry. But then looking back now with years to sit on it, I'm like, do I understand why I did what I did? Absolutely. Would I like to respond differently now? Yeah, I would. You know, it, and it doesn't mean that, I think plenty of things that people do are understandable. Doesn't mean, understandable doesn't mean correct. It, understandable doesn't mean that you go, oh yeah, that's great. You go, I, I could I could see someone doing such a thing. Mm -hmm. But I guess just rec trying to understand and see the humanity in others. Because if I can't see the humanity in others, how can I see it in myself? And also, you know, how am I meant to interact with everyone? As, as you said, whether, you know, even if we're a society of individuals for at least for the time being, hopefully, you know, in perpetuity, we, we still come together as a whole and watching it's weird, like you said, it's it's if I only ask why once, I start with stay out of my way and I'll stay out of yours, leave me the fuck alone. You're like, okay, that's fine, Ryan, but that's easy for you to say living in a society that doesn't actually function like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit cheap. But if I recognize that that's step one is I don't hurt you and you don't hurt me, but then we go, well, but how can I help you? That's step two. And then it goes way beyond that and a lot further than I've thought about it. But I guess what I would just say is again, recognition of the humanity and others and that we all have different strengths, we all have different weaknesses, and it's, you can never really be sure where the other person's coming from, but if we approach things charitably, as charitably as, as we would hope others would approach us, I think we'll do a lot better. And I guess one thing that I read that I liked that I thought was accurate and unfortunately disappointing was everyone is a great, uh, you know, jury, or rather, I'm sorry, a great lawyer for themselves and a judge for others. And I think that's a terrible way to live life, even if it's an understandable one. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry, I, I think probably winded. flipping that is the right way to live. Yeah. Being uh, being constantly judgmental of yourself and a uh, defender of others. And that results ultimately in an interaction that de-escalates versus escalates. Right. Yeah. And you can, you can, we can all live in a world like that. And sometimes you're like, hey man, people that deserve punishment won't get it. Like, okay, hey, but what do they say? Better to have, you know, 10 guilty people go free than one innocent person, you know, burn. And ultimately that is, I think that is a better world than the other way around. And if all else fails, uh, join the team that builds the AI that kills all humans. Yeah, obviously. I mean, if you have to be on a team, pick the winning team. What, that's been the- uh, that's, that's, that's my good, hiring pitch, actually. That's a good hiring pitch. You still taking resumes? <laughs> <laughs> you want to be on the team that doesn't die during the great apocalypse. Not immediately. You want to be on the one that, that's uh, you know eventually long suffering and stepped on, right? Yeah. Life is suffering, Ryan Hall. This was an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you. I could probably talk to you for many more hours. I hope I do as well. Ryan, I love you, buddy. This was a great conversation. Thanks for talking today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Ryan Hall. And thank you to our sponsors, Indeed Hiring Website, Audible Audiobooks, ExpressVPN, and Element Electrolyte Drink. Click the sponsor links to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now, let me leave you with some words from Frank Herbert in Dune. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. <laughs> Let me ask you about love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, I think last time we talked about the meaning of life and it was, it was kind of about winning. Of course. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, I don't think I've talked to you about love much, mm. whether romantic or just love for the common humanity amongst us all. What uh, role has love played in your life in this in this quest for winning? Mm. Where does love fit in? Well, the word love, I think, means uh, several different things. There's uh, love in the sense of, maybe I could just say there's like love in the sense of opiates and love in the sense of uh, oxytocin and then love in the sense of uh, maybe like a love for math. I don't think fits into either of those first two paradigms. Uh, so each of those, have they, uh, have, they, have they given something to you in your life? I'm not that big of a fan of the first two. Um, Why? For the same reason I'm not a fan of, you know, for the same reason I don't do opiates and don't take ecstasy. <laughs> and there were times, look, I've tried both. Um, I like opiates way more than I like ecstasy. Uh, but they're not, the ethical life is the productive life. So maybe that's my problem with, with, with those. And then like, yeah, a sense of, I don't know, like abstract love for humanity. I mean, the abstract love for humanity, I'm like, yeah, I've always felt that. And I guess it's hard for me to imagine not feeling it. And maybe I there's see. people who don't, and I don't know. But. Yeah, that's just like a background thing that's there. You know, this makes me think of, um, there's some products that I just love, like, there's a there's a company called Rev, uh, Rev dot com, where, I like for this podcast, for example, I can just drag and drop a video, and then they do all the captioning. Uh, it's humans doing the captioning, but they connect you. They they automate automate everything of connecting you to the humans, and they do the captioning and transcription. It's all effortless, and it like I remember when I first started using them, it was like, <sighs> life is good. Like, because I, it was so painful to to figure that out earlier. Uh, the same thing with uh, something called Isotope RX, this company I use for cleaning up audio, like the sound cleanup they do. It's like drag and drop and it just cleans everything up very nicely. Uh, another experience like that I had with Amazon one click purchase. First time, I mean, uh, other places do that now, but just the effortlessness of purchasing, making it frictionless. It kind of communicates to me like I'm a fan of design, I'm a fan of products, that you can just create a really pleasant experience. That the simplicity of it, the elegance, just makes you fall in love with it. So, I don't know, do you think about this kind of stuff? I mean, we've been, it's exactly what we've been talking about. It's like the little details that somehow make you fall in love with the product. Is that, we went from like urban challenge days where, <laughs> where love was not part of the conversation probably. <laughs> and to, to this point where there's a, where there's human beings and you want them to fall in love with the experience. Um, is that something you're trying to optimize for, trying to think about like, how do you, how do you create an experience that people love? Uh, absolutely. I think that's the vision is removing any friction or complexity from getting our users, our writers, to where they want to go. Right? Uh, making that as simple as possible. And then, you know, beyond that, on uh, just transportation, making, you know, things and, you know, goods get to their destination as seamlessly as possible. I right? talked about, you know, a drag and drop experience where I kind of express your intent and then, you know, it just magically happens. And for our writers, that's what we're trying to get to is you download an app and you, you know, click and car shows up. It's the same car. It's very predictable. It's a, a, a safe and high quality experience. And then it gets you in a very reliable, very convenient, uh, frictionless way to where you want to be. And along the journey, I think we also want to like, do little things to delight our, our users. Like the ride sharing companies, because they don't control the experience, I think, they can't make people fall in love necessarily with the experience, or maybe they, they haven't put in the effort, but I, I think it, if I were to speak to the right sharing experience I currently have, it's just very it's just very convenient, but there's a lot of room for like falling in love with it. 
like we, we can speak to sort of car companies. Car companies do this well. You can fall in love with a car, right? And be like a loyal car person, like whatever. Like I like badass hot rods, I guess 69 Corvette. And, and at this point, you know, you can't really, cars are so, owning a car is so 20th century, man. But is there something about the Waymo experience where you hope that people will fall in love with it? Because that, is that part of it? Or is it part of, is it just about making a convenient ride, not ride sharing, I don't know what the right term is, but just a convenient A to B autonomous tra um, transport? Or like, do you want them to fall in love with Waymo? So maybe elaborate a little bit. I mean, almost like from a business perspective, I'm curious, like wh how, do you want to be in the background invisible or do you want to be, uh, like a source of joy that's in very much in the foreground. I want to provide the best, most enjoyable transportation solution. And, uh, and that means building it, building our product and building our service in a way that people do, uh, kind of use in a very you know, seamless, frictionless way in their, in their day to day lives. And I think that does mean, uh, you know, in some way falling in love, uh, in that product, right. It just kind of becomes part of your routine. I, uh, it, it comes down in my mind to, uh, safety, predictability of the experience and, um, privacy thing, uh, aspects of it, right. So, uh, our cars, uh, you get the same car, you get very predictable behavior, uh, and that, that is important. And if you're going to use it in your daily life, uh, uh, privacy. And when you're in a car, you can do other things. You're spending a bunch, just another you know, space where you're spending a significant part of your life. Right? So not having to share it with uh, other people who you don't want to share it with, I think is uh, uh, a very nice property. Uh, maybe you want to you know, take a phone call or you know, do something else in the vehicle. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, safety on the quality of the driving, as well as the physical safety of, you know, not having some, you know, to share that ride, uh, is, you know, uh, important to a lot of people. Let me ask you this, cause somebody wrote me this long email and I think you're the perfect person to ask this. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, you mentioned love from a genetic perspective. What, what's, what is it? What, what do you make of love? Why, why are we, why do we humans fall in love? In your own life, why did you fall in love? You know, the email that was written to me was, you always talk about mortality and fear of mortality, but you don't ask about love. So I don't know if there's some thoughts you could give about the role of love in your own life, or the role of life, uh, the role of love in human life in general. I think love, in many ways, defines my life. It's basically I like to say that I'm a human first and a professor second. Yeah. And uh, I think this passion for life, this passion for you know everything around us. I mean, the only way to describe that is love. It's basically you know, embracing your, you know, emotional self, embracing the, you know, the, um, the, the non brainiac in you embracing the sort of intangible, the um, not very well defined. And even in my, in my own research, I'm, I'm just very passionate about every, everything I do. And, you know, there's a certain passion that comes through. It's, and what, I'm, I'm sorry, again, being Greek, the etymology of the word passion. What was passion? Passion is suffering. <laughs> the etymology, I mean, when we talk about the passion of the Christ, it's the suffering. Yeah. And in, in the Greek version of that word, pathos, like pathology, pathos is deep suffering. It's the concept and someone who's sympathetic. Sympathetic means suffering together, mm -hmm. experiencing emotions together. So it's funny that you ask me about love and I respond with passion, passion for life, passion for research, passion for my family, for my children, for, you know. So um, there's, there's a certain passion 
that uh, defines me and everything else follows rather than the other way around. I'm not first thinking with my brain, what is the most impactful paper we could write and then going after that. I'm thinking with my heart, what am I passionate about? What which drives me, what just like, you know, makes me tick. And that's a beautiful way to live, but I, I love it how the Greek part of you just kind of connects it to the suffering. So <laughs> if you could remove the suffering. No, 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 no. When I say suffering, I don't mean suffering as in being miserable. I mean suffering as in being emotionally invested in something. Remember, I mean, again, if you if you look at this poem, what is it saying? It's saying birds who love are birds who cry. <laughs> right? <laughs> It, yeah. it's, it, that's the very definition of love. Yeah. Exposing your fragility. Yeah. If you're not afraid of suffering, you don't fall in love. As soon as you hold back, you protect, you shield your heart, no love can enter. So there's this uh, Simon and Garfunkel song. I am a rock. Mm -hmm. I am an island. And a rock feels no pain. And an island never cries. So again, there's some aspects of that into this poem. The, you know, the fact that, um, you know, but you told me, you know, there I told you, darling sweet, that forever love would keep is this intermediate thing. And then it, there's a recall, but you told me you were right. Birds who love or birds who cry. So it basically says that love is the fragility that you're willing to give to another person. It's opening up your uh, vulnerable spots. It's sort of accepting that there's no safety net. You're just giving yourself fully and you're ready to be hurt. So can I actually backtrack? I, listen, I love love, okay? I and, do too. And there's a story uh, <laughs> that you fell in love with the stripper. I mean, you, you have to tell oh. the story. So how did you fall in love um, <laughs> with somebody, not that there's anything wrong with that profession, but it's 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 romantic. It's like a true romance, by the way, great movie. It is a great uh, film. It's a truly a great film. And even even Brad Pitt, um, who makes oh. a, a brief appearance, is, is genius. There's so, so much good acting there. Anyway, uh, so tell me that love story. All right, so you know what? Uh, like I said, I get from my dad, I get that fear of being abandoned. You know, I lied to my wife for nine years until she leaves. And um, I was in Charleston, South Carolina. And what happened was uh, I noticed that Susan, uh, she was not coming to bed like, you know, she used to. And she'd stay up all night long. And sometimes she'd go and be gone a few hours or, and everything else. And I'm like, well, something's going on. And I'd, I'd pass by her, her computer and she would minimize the screens. And I'm like, well, got to figure out what the hell's going on. So uh, put a key logger on her system. As any uh anybody should in a relationship uh, absolutely because you trust them you know yeah, you <laughs> so why not you should be tracking all their movements all their <laughs> exactly exactly like i said i was the control freak too it's romantic so um i found out she'd been cheating on me and she was uh see there you go they had a reason they had a reason i justified so i found out she's cheating on me she was asleep when i found it out and i sat there yeah. looking at it and i was like well shit so got up walked in the bedroom opened up the wardrobe got a suitcase out started putting her clothes in it and she wakes up she's like where are you going i'm like i'm not you are well my my bravado disappeared pretty quickly i uh took about a week of both of us crying and arguing and everything else and she she finally left and uh I went through this depression. I went, uh, I was in Charleston, South, Car South Carolina. I would just walk around the house kind of stumbling in a daze, realized I was getting suicidal and uh, was smart enough to do something about it and picked up the phone book. And uh, that's where th there's always this sense of humor. So I picked up the phone book. I'm going through the yellow pages. I'm like psychologist, criminal psychologist, because I need that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Called this psychologist crying to her. I mean, crying on the phone, told her everything. I'm this criminal. This is what's happened. She's like, come in now. So I go in, spill my guts, and uh, saw her for about four months. And I joke about it, but it's true. She, uh, she was trying to get me to stop breaking the law and to go into real estate. And I remember telling her, is there a difference? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, yes, there's a difference. So saw her for about four months. I was, um, I was 34. I didn't start drinking until I was 34. I'd never done drugs. 
anything else like that because my mom was an addict as well. So I, I, I was this guy that always wanted to be in control, didn't want to, you know, lose control of myself and uh, had never been to a strip club. So uh, one night I, I was getting lonely. So I walked into the strip club. Actually, I was researching the strip club and it was uh, Joe's Roundup in Charleston, South Carolina. Joe's Roundup. Joe's Roundup. Little Sounds bitty hole in the wall stuff. I was, yeah, real classy. So I walked in and I'm literally that guy, man, that fell in love with the, the first, the first stripper that he sees. She walks by. I'm like, that one. So I didn't know, I didn't know the strip club game. I'm again, criminal, naive as hell. So, uh, Belly up at the bar, order the beer. I'm d- sitting there drinking it. She comes over to me and we start ch- talking and she's like, uh, would you like to get a bottle of champagne? I was like, does, does that mean going in back or what? She's like, well, yeah, you need to do the bottle to go in back. And I was like, sure, let's buy a bottle of champagne, $400 bottle of Corbell. Wow. So I'm like, all right. So then again, that bravado disappears pretty quickly. I get back there and we talk. For two hours. And, you know, nowadays I don't understand that most men who go to strip clubs, the strippers are their therapist most of the time. All right. So I'm sitting there talking, we're talking. And of course she's, she's sizing me up. She's looking at the watch. She's like, what kind of car you drive? (laughs) You know, everything else. And I'm like telling her I'm talking. And so at the end of the night, I'm like, really nice meeting. She's like, it's so nice meeting you too. So I leave so you guys just talked and just talked and there's no dance feeling of no love dance. and all of that. Yeah. So just talk, just, you know, got along pretty good. I'm like, I like her. I like her. Yeah. So come back in a week later, walk in and uh, call her over. And I was like, look, I said, I'm not, uh, I said, that was my first time to a strip club. I said, don't know you. I like you. I'd like to know you more. Would you like to go out to dinner? And she was like, yeah. I was like, where would you like to go? So she says, Rue de John. And I was like, don't know what it is. That's where we'll go. So I go back and I was, uh, I had a theater buddy at that point in time. Cause I was trying to get my life. Yeah. Trying to get my life together. Uh, JC was his name. And I was like, I got a date. And he's like, he got a date. And I was like, yeah, man, I got a date. And he's like, okay, where are you going? And I was like, Rue de John. And he's like, take your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And he's like, take your wallet. <laughs> it's like, all right. So, um, uh, we start, you know, doing the, the the lunch and the dinner thing, and uh, I get to where I really like her. She's, uh, I was thirty four, she was twenty three, and uh, got along really well. Listened, you know, had common interest in music and arts and, and stuff like that. She had, uh, I mean, a stereotypical. She was, she had graduated college with a degree in religious studies. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, all right. So. Uh, so yeah, you just fell in love. Yeah, we 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 got along really well, really well. So I ended up moving her in with me. She hadn't quit her job, and uh, what was happening was she was working weekends, and uh, you know the club would close at three or four. She wouldn't come home until ten or eleven in the morning, and most of the time it would be a phone call saying, "Come and pick me up. I can't drive home," and. Uh, then I never used drugs, had never been around. My mom, Valium and pot and things like that. But as far as interacting with her, I'd never done anything like that. By this point in time, I'm kind of getting head over heels with her. I've moved her in with me and everything. And uh, I had never, I was 34, I had never went through a woman's purse in my entire life. And uh, so she comes in, passes out. And I'm like, I got to know what the fuck's going on. And, uh, Went over and went through her purse, found cocaine and, uh, you know, the straw, cut off straws and all that stuff. And I'm like, uh, broke my heart. I just sat there and started crying, <sighs> got online and, uh, I'm the guy that can find information. So I started looking for forums on strip clubs, found a forum, found that one, found where it was talking about her prostituting herself to support the habit. And, uh, that got me, man. That got me. I was talking about everything she was doing to, uh, to do that. And And that broke uh, your heart there. Oh man. Yeah. So, uh, went and I, I could, I I didn't have the heart to tell her that I knew she was prostitute, but I I went to her and I was like, she was waking up and I was like, look, I found this in your purse. I can't have that. 
And she's like, well, you think I'm prostituting? And I was like, no, no, I don't think that. I knew it, but I didn't mention it to her. And uh, I was like, I can't have that. Well, I, I don't do that. It's just a one-time thing. I was like, all right. So um, she went back to work and continued to do it for a couple more weeks. And then finally, I was like, I can't. So I picked her up one morning. It was like she was she was she couldn't drive home. Um, before I picked her up, I'd written her a note, left it on the pillow. So I brought her home, tucked her in the bed, and uh, told her I'd be back that night. Told her she had a letter when she woke up. I woke up, and the letter was basically, uh, you know, I love you. If you can't stop this, don't be here when I get back. And uh, I went to uh, Columbia that day. Came back that night, and uh, she had quit her job. And she quit drugs that night. Really quit them. And uh, I got it in my head that I needed to do whatever I needed to do to make sure she didn't go back to that. That became, uh, that to me, because of my background, that meant spending a lot of money. And uh, so every night was, you know, three to $600 for dinner. It was... Uh, thousand dollar shoes every week two thousand dollar purse every week all that i had most of my money laundered out to uh to estonia and uh elizabeth at the same time she had uh she, she quit but uh she didn't want me to go anywhere all right. She wanted me there all the time. I guess that was that connection. You know, she, I guess she was scared. She might go back to something. So shadow crew gets busted. I start, I go through basically all my U S funds. Can't get anything from overseas. Shadow crew gets busted October. I can't go into committing tax fraud because season's over. Can't go back into credit fraud because shadow crew has been busted. I don't know who to trust online. I'm left with running counterfeit cashier's checks to get money in, trying to make it until, you know, I can start back with some other fraud and uh, lying to her the entire time. She, she knows about none of this. None of None of it. And she's got, she thinks I've got a shitload of money and uh, she's got expensive tastes. So, um, and at the same time, she couldn't be intimate. I mean, I, the girl loved me. I, I, that's the first time I've really said that. So there's deep love there, both ways. Yeah. Yeah. The things we do. So, uh, she she couldn't be intimate unless she was stone cold drunk. I mean, just shit, stone cold drunk. And I, you know, I. Shit, I didn't mind her drinking alcohol. I'd rather have that than, than cocaine. So uh, that was the intimacy there. And I kept, I had this, I kept thinking if I continued to invest, that it would work out. You know, that uh, just keep going. She'll be all right. We'll be all right. And what happens is, is, uh, like I said, she thought I had money. She thought I had money. She wanted a couple of Tiffany engagement rings. So I, I said, we can get married. You know, I figured marriage, sure that I love her, sure it's going to be all right. So I was like, oh, let's get married. She's like, well, I've always wanted a Tiffany ring. She said, I didn't have money to buy the Tiffany ring because all my money was overseas. So here I am. I defraud. So it's counterfeit cashiers. I, um, uh, Find a like a three carat ring on eBay for twenty grand and uh, pay for it with a counterfeit cashier's check. At the same time, because she doesn't want me to leave, she needs me there. Typically, if you're doing that type of crime, you need to be traveling. You can't do it in one central area because you're going to be identified pretty quickly. I knew that, but I didn't have much choice. So, uh, start running counterfeit cashier's checks to get the money to. 
to live and everything. Get the uh, get the engagement ring. We were uh, scheduled to be married. Our wedding date was February 26, 2005. February 8th, 2005. I'm, uh, I've got a Tiffany wedding band, a couple of them coming in. And I get arrested in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, she didn't know. I told her, I said, I've got to go pick up those rings. She didn't. She thought I was just having them sent in. I said, I got to get those rings. And I said, we'll go out to dinner after that. And uh, I left at uh, like 8 o'clock in the morning. And I was arrested at, uh, I think, 1130, something like that. Of course, I wanted to call her, you know, and uh, the FBI got me. It turns out it was it was controlled delivery. There were like 30 agents in the parking lot. FBI got me. Charleston PD got me. Within 45 minutes, the Secret Service comes in, takes over that investigation. They knew exactly who they had. Long about seven o'clock at night, they're like, we want to search your house. And I was like, look, I'll sign off on the search if you let me go with you so I can see her. And uh, they were like, okay. So I got to see my phone at that point. I had like 140 calls that uh, she, where she had been trying to call all that time. She was worried. Yeah. And uh, so they load me up and hell, I mean, you talk about 10, 12 cars. You know, 40 agents, everything else. Uh, she's got a dog at that point. I'm scared they're going to shoot the dog. And uh, uh, it was dark. And they had me walk up, and they're all behind me. And I knock on the door and tell her the police are there. and She needs to put the dog up. So she does. And uh, they come in and just start ransacking them. Put me in cuffs, set me down, start berating her with questions. She had no idea what the hell was going on. Were you able to say a word or two to help her understand? Yeah, I was trying to tell her. And at the same time, they're, they're, they take a watch off her wrist. They let her keep the ring. Uh, they're telling her that I'm this guy. What's my real name? Bang, 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 bang across, across the board. So she's probably terrified. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, I tell her, I was like, look, they're going to arraign me tomorrow. Don't come. Don't come. I said, I'll, I'll see what's going on, but don't show up. Of course, she's there the next morning, her, her and her dad. And she's she's back in the back crying. They're reading off the charges. I'm under $300,000 bond, everything else. And uh, that's it. I They throw me in a cell. Meanwhile, more charges keep coming in, you know. And uh, it's like 10, 12 charges a day at that point. And I'm trying to call her to make sure she's all right. And uh, does it get through? So I spend three months in jail. And during that three months, she visits twice. I get like three or four phone calls to her. Um, I under- Looking back now, I understand why. You know, back then it was like, I'm the victim. You know, why doesn't she talk to me? But, uh, you know, now I understand why. It, hell, the girl loved me too. You know, and then she found out I was this piece of shit. And, uh, after a week in county jail, two agents fly in from New Jersey, two Secret Service guys, pulled me out of cell, looked at me, and they were like, oh, we got your laptop. And I was like, yeah. And uh, he's like, well, have you got anything on your laptop? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you're going to be charged for it. And I was like, I figured. And then he looks at me. He's like, uh, can you do anything for us? And I told him my exact words were, look, you let me get back with Elizabeth. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And he looks at me, he's like, we're going to get you out. I was like, all right. So they let me sit there for three months <laughs> to get a taste of it mm-hmm. and uh, get me out. My sister, they have the bond reduced to $1,000. My sister pays the $1,000 bond. By this point, she's disowned me and uh, because I'm dating the stripper. And uh, Denise bonds me out. The person that I call immediately is Elizabeth. I'm out. And uh, she's like, I'll be there. I was like, okay. So uh, this is uh, like 11 o'clock at night. Um, I'm in the parking lot of the Charleston Police, uh, Charleston County Jail. Me and a Secret Service agent standing there. And Elizabeth had a friend that owned a limo company. So she pulls up in a limo. 
gets out, pops the trunk, gets these two plastic containers out that have my clothes in them, <laughs> drops them on the pavement, comes over, hugs me, call me later, gets in the car, drives off. I'm sitting there crying like a baby. Agent looks at me. Is that your fiance? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I am so sorry. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I had, uh, I had. Oh, she sounds fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah. Pull up in a limo. <laughs> with so she, uh, she, I had $30 in my name at that point. Yeah. $30. Uh, the agent had to pay for my hotel room that first night. So he drops me off after paying for the hotel room, buy me something to eat. As soon as he drops me off, I take that $30. Walk a half mile to Walmart, buy a prepaid debit card so I can start back in tax fraud. As soon as I get back to the hotel room, call Elizabeth, beg her to come see me. She comes to see me and we talk most of the night and uh, convince her to give me a chance. I tell her that I, hey, everything's going to be all right. They're going to hire me. I'm going to be this big consultant. Lies, lies, just so she get back with me. And uh, she's like, okay. And, uh, so we moved from uh, from Charleston. The uh, field office is in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, I'm breaking the law. Even before I start working with them, I'm breaking the law. And uh, so they've got me in the office. The field office, is, they got this big war room in there. I'm on a laptop outside line. Laptop's hooked up to a 50-inch plasma monitor on the wall. They've got a desktop sitting directly next to me outside line. Two Secret Service officers, officers in the room at all times with a South Carolina law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. My job is four to six hours a day, surfing the web, picking up targets, intel, teaching them how cybercrime operates, everything else like that. For the first two weeks, they are extremely diligent. They pay attention to everything that's going on, ask questions, everything else. But the problem is, is that that shit gets boring real quick because <laughs> I'm, I'm very fast online doing that. So they're, they're like, what the hell is he doing? And it gets tiring looking at a guy just doing that shit. So after two weeks, they get lazy and bored and they start watching porn instead of watching me. At the same time, they've got a key logger and they've got, they've got Spectre Pro and Camtasia key loggers and taking snapshots of everything that I'm doing. You go every night. It goes on a DVD ROM on a spindle. So I'm like, they're not going to go through that shit. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, fuck it. Start breaking the law from inside the secret service offices while they're in the room. Why not? Um, that continues for 10 months. At the same time, um, uh, the relationship with Elizabeth fell apart, completely fell apart. Um, do you, As you, would. do you have an understanding of why it's just because of the, her heart got broken because there was lying. It was the she trust. She felt like she did a lot yeah. to uh, sacrifice for the, the relationship. You've got, uh, you got a woman there that uh, she had even said it. She was like, uh, she had told one of her friends we were out uh, having dinner one night. And this is before I got arrested. She told one of her friends that I was the only guy that ever asked her to stop using drugs. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I have to say that, that that part of the story is so, it's so powerful. And, uh, and then that she chose to do it and she chose to, to yeah. stop. And she told me that, uh, there was one instance she told me that if she, if she didn't marry me, she'd never be married. And uh, as far as I know, she's never been married. And so it, it started to fall apart there. Yeah. Because I was that piece of shit. Still, you didn't take a step. By the way, can I just say how just moving it is, how honest you are, but yeah. thank you. Thank you for being that person. But at that time, you there's still that lying. Oh, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, it's falling apart. She had, uh, she wants to start going to strip clubs and, uh, I'm like, fuck it. Why not? Let her, we'll go. So we start going to strip clubs and she's, you know, she'll come back and be get wasted and we'll have sex, what have you. And, uh, one night 
she looks at me and she was like, uh, she was like, I think it'd be funny if you got a blowjob from somebody else. And, uh, that got me, that got me. I was like, uh, to me, that was the final straw right there. I was like, I, she doesn't care for me anymore or anything else like that. We've been going to strip clubs. So I started dating another stripper and, uh, she knew something was going on and, uh, she looks at me one day and she's like, why don't you just tell me that it's over? And I looked at her and I said, it's over. We're done. And, uh, I told her, I was like, look, I said, uh, whatever you want. We were renting an apartment. I was like, whatever you want in here, take it. And, uh, I said, not only that, but, uh, I'll make sure you got money for, for, for several months. So you're all right. And, uh, I was like, just leave me, uh, you know, leave my TV and leave, uh, leave me some, some plates and stuff. <laughs> and so I go to work that day at the secret service, come back that night and <laughs> she's taken everything and left a picture of herself in the bedroom on the floor. I'm like, okay, I guess I deserve that. <laughs> so she's got, I, I, I like her. She's got. Yeah, she was cool. She was cool. So I, I, oh, I, 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 I'm giving her a thousand dollars like every two weeks for some shit like this, and uh, it gets to the point because I'm doing this tax fraud from inside the offices. Well, the debit card companies are pinging the cards. They start to realize that hey, some son of a bitch is stealing money using our debit card. So they start to shut down the cards before I can pull cash out. So I start not to have the money to send to her. And I'm like, so I, she calls and she's like, look, I, ha I have to have money. And I was like, well, look, I'm doing what I can. Well, you, you promised money. And I was like, look, if you knew what I was doing to get this money, you wouldn't be asking that. And uh, she's like, I need money. My rent's behind by a month right now. And I'm like, your rent's behind? She's like, yeah. So I was like, okay. So I pick up the phone, call the rental office. And I was like, just want to make sure that... Uh, you know, I'm sorry I'm behind on the rent for this apartment number. Oh, no, it, that rent's paid up three months. It's like, okay, hang up, call Elizabeth back. I was like, uh, you're behind on the rent. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, funny. They just said you're up on it three months. And she gets quiet and she's like, well, you lied to me too. And I was like, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I did. I did that. Yeah. I was like, but look, I, I can't do it anymore. And, um, uh, that's the last time I spoke to her right there. What happens is, is, um, I was breaking law from inside the offices. I had a buddy that his name was Sean Mims out of Los Angeles. I had taught him how to do tax return fraud. I had told Sean, I go missing, right? I go missing for three months. I told him if I ever went missing, not to contact me. And, uh, so I go missing. Then I show back up online. First day he contacts. So he becomes a target and uh, they identify him pretty quickly at that point. He's set to be arrested sometime in March of, uh, of six. That's when he's set to be arrested. Operation Rolling Stone was the name of the operation. Nine people were supposed to be arrested that night. So Secret Service goes and, arre goes and arrests this guy. They search his apartment and don't find anything. The apartment manager comes out and explains to him how Sean has done all kinds of work to the apartment. As a matter of fact, he brought in $30,000 worth of Italian tile to put in the apartment that he's renting. And by the way, last night he had a U-Haul out here and took out a whole shitload of stuff. So <laughs> Secret Service comes back in. They look at me and they're like, we need you to take a polygraph. And my answer was, I ain't taking a polygraph. So they're like, well, we'll throw you back in jail if you don't. And I was like, call my lawyer. Lawyer gets me on the phone. He's like, uh, you don't have to take the polygraph. I was like, well, good. I'm not going to. He's like, but they will throw you back in jail. And I was like, don't want to do that. And he's like, uh, have you done anything? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, you can try to pass the polygraph. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I was, at him. I was like, let's take the polygraph. They asked three questions. The questions were, uh, have you talked to anybody? 
Have you have you been on a computer outside of the offices? Have you talked to the press, which I was interviewing with a, a New York Times writer the entire time? And then have you contacted or warned anybody about investigations? And I failed polygraph completely. So they revoked the bond. Take me back down to Charleston County, throw me in a jail. Three days later, Secret Service shows back up and uh, pull me out of a cell. It's Jim Ramacone and Bobby Kirby. And they were, I mean, honestly, I, I, they were good men. And they gave me chances upon chances to do the right thing. And I was not ready to do that. And uh, Jim Ramacone and Bobby's in there. And Bobby, I mean, Bobby was a friend. Yeah, I mean, he truly was. I Later on, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to, uh, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to, uh, <sighs> to have lunch with the man and uh, told him I was sorry for everything I did to him because I got him and him, him and another agent fired and uh, told him I was sorry for what happened. And uh, he told me then, he's like, we were your friends, man. We were truly your friends. So they were good. So they wanted to help. Yeah. They want, they wanted you to be a good man. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and what, what got me so damn bad is, uh, I told him, I was like, man, I'm trying to be a better guy. Yeah. And uh, he's like, Brett, you always were a good guy. You just didn't know it. And uh, Fuck, people like that. Yes. Yeah. We need people yeah. like that in this world. Yeah. You need somebody so, to basically uh, believe oh, man. that you can be a good man. So uh, Jim Ramacone pulls me out. He's the second in charge, in charge yeah. of South Carolina. He's got the Miranda waiver <laughs> in front of him, right? And he looks at me. He's like... Uh, I'm playing hard ass. Bobby's over here looking distraught and, you know, like a hurt dog. And <laughs> Jim's like, uh, here's the way this is going to work. He said, you're going to tell me everything you've done the past six years, or I'm going to make it my mission in life to fuck over you yeah. and your family. Yeah. And he said, not just this case. Once you get out of prison, I'll hound you the rest of your life. Then he slides the Miranda waiver over and he's like, now you want to talk? And I looked at him and I was like, nope. <laughs> he was like he gets up gets all red in the face storms out as on the way out he's like fuck you very much yeah so i go back to the cell a week later i was on only under under uh, state charges a week later judge rules they revoke the bond improperly wow oh reinstates the bond nobody calls the secret service to tell him i walk out I walk out. I was dating this stripper, and uh, I, I told my mom, I was like, well, if they're going to fuck me, they're going to have to find me. <laughs> I just went on the move. Yeah. I, I called this stripper girl up. I'd given her like 60K, some bullshit like that. And um, I told her, I was like, Kim, I need some money. And she was like, what? And I was like, look, I said, give me $1,000. I'll give you back $3,000 in two weeks. She was like, okay. So I met her in Augusta, Georgia. And uh, got the thousand from her and started driving west on I twenty. No idea where to go to anything else. Got to Dallas. There was a prepaid debit card supplier in Dallas. Went in, walked in the office, convinced the guy, social engineering, convinced the guy to give me sixty prepaid debit cards without a driver's license, without payment, anything else. He did, and that started the run. I ended up stealing uh, from that. I stole like one hundred sixty k profit. Used that to buy a Jeep Cherokee. And went on. the idea was to steal enough money to bug out to uh, Florianopolis, Brazil, and set up shop down there <laughs> and do it again. That was the dream. That was it. That was it. So uh, I was on the run for four months, stole $600,000. I was in Las Vegas, Nevada. One day I had stolen, the night before, I'd stolen 160 k out of ATMs. Went in the next. What's the role in this heck of a difficult journey you have been on? of love, of uh, friendship? What's the role of love in the human condition? Well, first things first, the woman I married, my wife, Nicole, no way I could do what I do if we weren't together. She had the filter idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We didn't go over that story. Um, everything is a partnership, right? And to achieve great things, it's not about like someone pulling their weight in places like, it's not like someone's supporting you so that you could do this other thing. Mm -hmm. It's literally like, you know, I, Mike and I and our partnership as co-founders is fascinating because I don't think Instagram would have happened without that partnership. Like, 
either him or me alone, no way. We pushed and pulled each other in a way that allowed us to build a better thing because of it. Nicole, sure, she, like she pushed me to work on the filters early on. And yes, that's exciting. It's a fun story, right? Mm-hmm. But the truth of it is being able to like level with someone about how hard the process is and have someone see you for who you are before Instagram and know that there's a constant you throughout all of this and be able to call you when you're drifting from that, but also support you when you're trying to stick with that. That's, I mean, that's uh, as true friendship slash love, whatever you want to call it. Um, but also it was for someone not to care. I remember Nicole saying, Hey, like, I know you're going to do this Instagram thing. You should, I guess it was bourbon at the time. You should do it because, um, you know, even if it doesn't work, we can move to like a smaller apartment and it'll be fine. Like we'll make it work. How beautiful is that? Right. Yeah. That's almost like a superpower that yeah. it gives you permission to fail. And somehow that actually leads to success. But also she's like the least impressed about Instagram of anyone. She's like, yeah, it's great. But like, I love you for you. Like, I like that you like a decent cook. That's beautiful. (laughs) That's beautiful. With the the Gantt chart and Thanksgiving, which I still think is a brilliant effing idea. Thank you. Um, Big ridiculous question. Have you, uh, you you said that love is not an illusion. No, it's not. Well, if it is. What is love? What is love is is knowing, for me, love is is knowing something deeply and still being completely gratified by it, you know, and wanting to know more. So what is love? What is loving someone, a person, yes. let's say, deeply is not idealizing them, not putting some kind of subjective projection on them but knowing them as they are and so for me for for me the only aperture to that knowing about nature the universe is science because it has that error correcting mechanism that most of uh, the stuff that we do doesn't have you know you could say the bill of rights is kind of an error correcting mechanism which i it's one of the things i really appreciate about the society in which i live to the extent that it's upheld and we keep faith with it. And the same with science. It's like, we will give you the highest rewards we have for proving us wrong about something. That's genius. That's, that's why, that's why in only 400 years since Galileo's first look through a telescope, we could get from this really dim, vague, this big apprehension of another world to sending our eyes and our senses there, or even to going beyond. So it is, it is, it delivers the goods like <laughs> nothing else, you know? It really it, it delivers the goods because it's always, it's always self aware of its fallibility. As perhaps the greatest chess player of all time, when you look introspectively at your psychology throughout your career, what was the bigger motivator? The love of winning or the hatred of losing? Tough question. I have to confess, I never heard it before, which is again, congratulations, it's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> um, losing was always painful. For me, it was, almost like a physical pain because I knew that if I lost the game, it's just because I made a mistake. So it's, I always believed that the, the result of the game uh, had to be decided by the quality of my play. Okay, you may say it sounds arrogant, but it helped me to move forward because I always knew that there was room for improvement. So it's the- Was there the fear of the mistake? Actually, fear of mistake guarantees mistakes. And the difference between uh, top players at the very top is that it's the ability to make a decision yeah. without predictable consequences. You don't know what's happening. It's just intuitively. I can go this way or that way. And uh, there are always hesitations. You know, people are like, you're, you're just you know, at the crossroad. You can go right, you can go left, you can go straight. You can turn and go back. And the consequences are just 
un- very uncertain. Just you have certain ideas what happens on the right or on the left or on just you know if you go straight, but it's not enough to make well calculated choice. And uh, when you play chess at the very top, is it's 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 about your inner strength. So I can make this decision. I will stand firm, and I'm not going to waste my time because I have full confidence that I will go through. Um, now going back to the original question is, I would say neither. It's just it's the it's lawful la- winning, hateful losing. There were important elements, psychological elements, but the key element. It's the I would say the the driving force was always my passion for for making a di- making a difference. It's just I can move forward and I can always it's I can always enjoy not just playing but creating something new. Creating something new. How do you think about that? It's just uh, finding new ideas in the openings, you know, some original plan in the middle game. It's actually that helped me to make the transition from the game of chess where I was on the very top to to another life where I knew I would not be number one. I would not be necessarily on the top, but I could still be very active and productive by my ability to make the difference by influencing people, say, joining the democratic movement in Russia or talking to people about uh, human machine relations. There's so many things where I knew my influence may not be as decisive as in chess, but still strong enough to help people to make their choices. So you can still create something new that makes a difference. Well, let me ask the romantic question. When did you first fall in love with uh, cooking? Me falling in love with cooking was about a, a solving a problem in my family. And it had to do with my mom feeling very anxious about uh, cooking and overwhelmed frequently when it came to meals. And I'm naturally very good at juggling a lot of things. And it was just something I could dive in and help and help my dad, who's very, I'm very, very close to. So it was a very, it was a very functional role where I would see this kind of crescendo of anxiety um, mm-hmm. around mealtimes as a kid and would be able to dive in and, and solve things. <laughs> and I also loved women I have a, who cooked. Like I, I have my father's mother is a great cook. She was, I remember her telling me as a kid, I, you know, I was asking her about church and why she went to church. And she's like, I mostly go to church because I get to cook <laughs> for the for the yeah. you know potlucks mm-hmm. and so there was a there was an openness around that that but she just loved to cook for people and it was and there was a real tenderness and expression of that love so seeing women in my life who had this like real tenderness and love that they shared through food and then also being able in my own home to kind of pitch in and add value and and help my mom and dad was really powerful for me because I felt like I had a superpower. You know, I felt like, oh man, I just made this stressful thing go away. Um, that was huge. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if you can comment on, especially for me growing up in Russia. So speaking of which, let's talk about love. Yes. <laughs> which requires to be receptive of the world. Yes. Of strangers. Agreed. How do we put more love out there in the world, especially on the internet? One mechanism I have found to um increase love and that's a word that has many meanings and is you know used in a very intense sense and it's used in a very loose sense can you try to define love sure love is a strong sense of attraction toward a another person entity or place that causes one to tend to react in a disproportionately positive manner that's off the top of my head disproportionately yes Hmm. So for example, if you- Why not proportionally? Because like if you're someone's about to, who you love is about to get harmed, you're moving heaven and earth to make sure, uh, or like a book you love, you know, like I love this book, like you're going through the fire to try to save it. Whereas if it's a book you really like, it's like, oh, I'll get another one. It, I don't, you know, uh, and a book's a, kind of a loose example, but- So you're going with the love that's like, you're saving for just a few people, almost like romantic love, like love for a close family. But it's also- But what about like, just love to even the broader, like the kind of love you can put out to people on the internet, which is like just kindness. 
Sure, I would say in that case, it's important to make them feel uh, um, seen and validated. And I try to do this when people who I have come to know on the internet, and there's a lot, uh, I try to do that as much as possible because I don't think it's valid how on social media, and I do this a lot myself, but not towards everyone, it's just there to be aggressive and antagonistic. You should be antagonistic towards bad people, and that's fine. But at the same time, there's lots of great people. And especially with my audience, and I would bet disproportionately with yours, there's a lots of people who are, because of their psychology and intelligence, are going to be much more isolated socially than they should. And if I, and I've heard from many of them, and if I'm the person who makes them feel, oh, I'm not crazy, it's everyone else around me who is just basic, uh, the fact that I can be that person, which I didn't have at their age, to me is incredibly reaffirming. You mean that source of love? But I mean, love in the sense of like, you know, you care about this person and you want good things for them, not in a kind of romantic way. But I mean, you're using it in a broad sense now. Yeah, but you're also a person who kind of, I mean, uh, attacks the power structures in the world by mocking them yes. effectively. Yes. And uh, love, I would say, requires you to be non-witty and simple and fragile which I see it as like the opposite of what trolls do. Trolls are, if I, if there is someone coming after what I love, there's two mechanisms, right? At least two. I go up and I'm fighting them. And in which case you, you bring in, if you are getting hurt in a knife fight, even if you win the knife fight, or if you disarm them and you preclude the possibility of a fight and you drive them off or render them powerless, you can you keep your person intact uh, as yourself, and you also protect your values. So how do you render them powerless? As you just said, by mocking them. One of the most effective mechanisms for those in power, we're much closer to Brave New World than 1984. The people who are dominant and in power aren't there because of the threat of you know, the gulag or prison. They're there because of social pressures. Look at the masks. Uh, I was on the subway not that long ago in New York City. Um, no one cared who I was until I put off the mask. <laughs> I was in the subway that nice. long in New York City. There was, and I put this on my Instagram. I've told this story before. There was an Asian dude in his early 30s. He was like in Western clothes. It's not like he had a rickshaw or something. An older man in his 50s stood up over him on the subway, screamed at him, said, go back where you came from. You're disgusting. I'm going to get sick. If you think this guy is a vector of disease, which is your prerogative, why are you coming close to him? Why are you getting in his face? And what- oh, so That was the rate, sorry. So it was because he, he was Asian? It was both. It was it, it, the not having a mask felt, gave him the permission to act like a despicable, right. aggressive person toward him, right? And the point being, uh, a lot of these mechanisms for social control are outsourced to low quality people because this is their one chance to assert dominance and status over somebody else. So the best way to diffuse that isn't with weaponry or fighting, it's through mockery, because all of a sudden their claims to authority are effectively destroyed. So let me push back on that. What about fighting that with, with love, with um, patience and like kindness towards them? I, I don't think kindness is, I think that would be uh, a mismatch and inappropriate. There's Superman, there's Batman. Okay, and Superman's job is to help the good people and Batman's job is to hurt the bad people. And I will always be on a Batman side than the Superman side. Both wear uh, silly tight costumes. One has uh, pointy ears, both are ridiculous. So it's- uh... and One's a billionaire who gets, you know, he, he's swimming in trim. Which one is a billionaire? Batman. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm undereducated on, uh, okay. on the superhero movies, I apologize. Okay, but- but you're just saying you your predisposition is to be on the Batman side is to uh, fighting the bad guys. Yeah, I suppose. and that's what I'm good at. That's what you're good at. But what, just to play devil's advocate, or actually in this case, I am the devil because that's what I usually do. Well, I'm is, the devil here, the, the angel's advocate. You're, exactly, you're fighting I'm, for love. to be the, <laughs> to be the angel. angel advocate, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I feel like mockery is um is a is a path towards escalation of conflict. Yes, in many ways, yes. So you're not I mean it's kind of like guerrilla warfare. I mean, yes. you're not going to win. 
I am winning. We're all winning. We're winning on a daily. This is my next book. We're winning. We've won before. I'm not joking. The ne- the topic of the next book. Yes, is the white pill. The white pill is that we're going to. We are winning. The most horrible people are being rendered into laughing stocks on a daily basis in social media. This is, oh, this is a good. glorious thing. I so disagree with you. I disagree with you because there's side effects that are very destructive. It feels like you're, you're winning, but we're completely destroying the possibility of having um, like a cohesive society. That's called oncology. What's that mean? Curing cancer. No, I, yeah. Your concept of a cohesive society is in fact a, a society based on oppression and not allowing individuals to live their personal freedom. Oh, so you're, you're a utopian view of the you're world. You're the utopian. You're saying cohesive society. I'm yeah. saying I don't need that. I'm saying there's gonna you be conflict. Freedom. Right, there's gonna be conflict. You and I are disagreeing right now. That's not cohesive. Doesn't mean we like each other less. Doesn't mean we respect each other less. Cohesive doesn't, it's, it's, it's just a euphemism for like everyone submitting to what I want. No, I mean co- cohesive could could uh, could be that it could be um, it could be like enforced with violence, all that kind of stuff. Sort of the uh, the libertarian view of the world, but it could just be being respectful and kind of each other, uh, and kind towards each other, and loving towards each other. I mean, that's what I mean by cohesive. So when people say free, it's it's funny. Like freedom is a funny thing. Because freedom can be painful to a lot of people. Um, it's 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 all matters how you define it, how you implement it, how it actually looks like. Sure. And I'm just saying, it feels like the mockery of the powerful leads to further and further the divisions. It's like the it's turning life into a game, to where. It's always you're playing. You're you're creating these different little tribes and groups, and you're constantly uh, fighting the groups that become a little bit more powerful by undercutting them through guerrilla warfare kind of thing. And that's what the internet becomes: is everyone's just mocking each other, and then certain groups become more and more powerful, and then they start fighting each other in, in the base, they, they form groups of ideologies and they start fighting each other in the internet where the result is, it doesn't feel like the common humanity is highlighted. It doesn't feel like that's a path of progress. Now, like when I say cohesive, I don't mean like everybody has to be, you know, enforcing equality, all those kinds of ideas. I just mean like, not being so divisive. That's like, so it's going back to the original question of like, how do we put more love out in the world on the internet? I, I want divisiveness. You, I, you, oh, you see, so you think divisiveness yes, is that's the that, goal. That's very interesting. It's the goal. So you we started this conversation by you talking about you have love for that small group. Uh, I think we both would agree to have a bigger group would be better, especially if that love comes from a sincere place. Um, I think, our country specific, I wrote an article about this four years ago, that it's time to disunite the states and to secede. This country has been held together with at least two separate cultures with thumbtacks and string for over 20 years. Uh, there's an enormous amount of contempt from one group toward another. Uh, this contempt comes from sincere place. They do not share each other's values. There's absolutely no reason, just like any unhealthy relationship where you can't say, you know what, it's not working out. I wanna go my own way and live my happiness. And I genuinely want you to go your way, live your happiness. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. I'll learn from you and and take lessons and vice versa. But the fact that we all have to be in the same house together is not coherent and that's not love. That is the path towards friction and tension and conflict. On the point of thought partners, what role does an emotional connection or forgive me, love have to play in that thought partnership? Is that something you're interested in? Put another way, sort of having a deep connection beyond intellectual. With the AI? Yeah, with the AI, between human and AI. Is that something that gets in the way of the the, the rational discourse? Is that something that's useful? I worry about biases, you know, obviously. So in other words, if you develop an emotional relationship with the machine, do all of a sudden you start are more likely to believe what it's saying, even That's if it. it doesn't make any sense. So I, you know, I, I worry about that. 
But at the same time, I think the opportunity to use machines to provide human companionship is actually not crazy. Yeah. And, I, to, and um, to intellectual and, and social companionship is not a crazy idea.